how good they did get copy. Here's my thing. Yeah, I, I read it. I know it's like. Oh, hi. I'd like to call to order the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board here on Wednesday, November 1st. The secretary, pl please call the roll. Commissioner Thompson. Here. Commissioner Schaefer. Here. Commissioner Olson. Here. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Menz. Here. Commissioner Alper. Present. Commissioner Benny. Present. President Forney. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I will take um, a motion to approve the agenda with a couple of additions I just want people to know is that uh, staff has requested that 20 uh, resolution 2023-189 to be dropped from the agenda. Um, also to add um, a resolution uh, regarding um, uh, the process for replacements um, of our uh, at-large commissioner um, to be added into new business. And then um, also uh, from admin and finance, if it passes, uh, to bring to the full board uh, resolution 2023-201. So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify this, by saying aye. Is this where I ask for a, a item to be pulled? No, it's later. It's when we go to consent. Sorry. Yes. Oh, I also need to announce the fact that um, at our next board meeting, all board members will be, um, I will be appointing them to the admin and finance because that is when we will be reviewing our budget. So um, on to that. So like I say, got vote. the approval. Did we vote? Uh, did we vote? No. <laughs> Didn't we vote? No. No. <laughs> Point of order, we need to take a vote on this motion. <laughs> Thank you. Too many things going on. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That action carries. Okay, so a significant um, uh, action we will be need, needing to do now, and that is the election um, of officers uh, for vice president due to our vacancy. So um, I would like to move that, and at this point in time, we will take um, nominations for those to be um, um, our next vice president, um, Commissioner Musich. I would like to nominate uh, Commissioner Benny from District 6. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Menz. Oh, sorry. He's waiting for the consent. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Thompson. Um, I just wanted to say that I applaud Commissioner Benny for stepping forward, um, but I do want to say that um, procedurally, I, although I support this tonight, when it comes to January, I think we need to have a long discussion about um, all of our placements. Uh, due to the conglomeration of power in Ward or District 6 that would come about this election. So um, although I cannot state how eminently qualified commissioner, I cannot state that enough. I, I just want the record to state as a North Sider that that's something that I want to make clear for January. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, Commissioner Alpert. Thanks, President Forney. And I would just like to... Um, also say how great it is working with um, Commissioner Benny, and um, certainly you have the skill set to do this. Um, I have, have thought a, a bit about this. It's you know everything has come about very abruptly, um, and so I, I think my plan tonight, no matter who is put forward, is to vote vote no because I think it's a short time period before um, the next board meeting at which we'll have a we'll we'll fill the vacant chair um, and that would give that person an opportunity to also vote on VP. Um, I know it's a short time period, but I just I just want to say that um, I unequivocally that you're highly qualified, but I'm going to be voting no for whoever is put forward for VP tonight. Okay. Did we have a second? Second. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. So, oh, yes, uh, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, Olson. just to kind of reiterate, I'm, I'm going to uh, follow uh, Commissioner Alper's lead on this as well, just so we could have a full folks, and I, and I think we can go at <laughs> a meeting or whatever, but I think, yeah, I think you are certainly qualified. Thank you. Commissioner Music. parliamentary inquiry. Uh, parliamentarian Rice, my understanding is that the board has to, at its first meeting of the year, elect its officers, 
And since we now have a vacancy, are we not required to immediately upon that vacancy fill it? Um, Madam President, um, that's a very good question. I've not researched it. Um, it I, my general advice to the support is always when there is a vacancy to fill it as at, at your earliest opportunity. Uh, you are right that annually the board elects its officers in January each year. That's a requirement of the rules. Um, I, I don't believe there's a specific rule in terms of vacancies, but I'll just let you know I have advised the president. We do have vacancies now in committees, and even if she can fill those on a temporary basis, it's important to do that. So I, I'll research the question if I but I, I don't. I can't speak authoritatively at this very moment. Okay. Thank you for that information. I appreciate it. Commissioner Menz. Um, so, if we, what is the rule? We have need six votes to for the vice president for a new vice president. So simple majority. Simple majority. Simple majority. And then, if we don't select, a pre, if we don't select a president, or if we have, if we've only got one candidate then we have to have that, that amount of votes to get it passed. But if we don't have a pre vice president, what does that do? And this is for, for you, uh, President Forney. What does that do to the board's functionality or logistical pieces over the next two months? Uh, I guess I'll speak personally, OK? I have no intention of not me meeting any of the um, upcoming meetings, but at the same time, who knows? Uh, I think that legally uh, it would be prudent for you to have a vice president. M Madam President, to that point, and I don't want to be morbid, but let's say President Forney leaves the room and falls through the ice. <laughs> we don't have a vice president. We don't have the, we'd have to get a special board meeting you have to elect the president. I mean, it's, um, we, the, the park board is a municipal corporation. It's an ongoing corporation. There's duties and officers, and we have protocols in to step up if the president isn't here. For example, two weeks ago, I believe uh, President Forney was not here. Uh, uh, Commissioner Vice President Crudup filled in, acted as president, had to sign the legal documents. I had to countersign with those. I mean, the it's it's an important operation, and these offices are important, and any temporary whatever it just will would relieve and that's one of the reasons to fill the vacancy at your earliest opportunity is that it just you, there's things that we couldn't even think of that might come up Once again uh, one last time so after hearing that that's what I thought and I had mentioned that to another commissioner today that leaving that seat vacant for two weeks we don't know if President Forney will we do know we, we anticipate that but that is it feels irresponsible to me to go into this time period without a vice president. I think that I commend Commissioner Benny for stepping up and uh, offering her services. I know that Commissioner Thompson may have been a um, person as well that would be interested. All of us could serve this role for, for two months. So I think that we should vote on it today. And I think that we should, and hopefully it will go forward because then we can focus on the duty to fill the significantly vacant seat, the void. So thanks. I'll be supportive. Not seeing any lights, um, I'll ask the secretary to call the roll on, I just want to make sure that we're voting on um, uh, Commissioner um, Abene to be our, vice, to fill the vacancy of our vice presidency. President Forney, I know there are no other nominations. That's <laughs> true, but still, that's right. <laughs> okay, just confirming. All right, Commissioner Thompson. Yes. Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Menz. Aye. Commissioner Elper. Aye. Commissioner Benny. Aye. President Forney. Aye. You have eight ayes. Congratulations. Thank you um, all. We have a vice president, and that is greatly appreciated. I will also announce that um, as um, uh, Council Rice indicated that with the vacancy, there are openings as far as our committees. And so um, for the remainder of the year, I would like to appoint um, Commissioner uh, Musich to be Chair of Standards and Conduct. I would like to appoint um, Commissioner uh, Thompson uh, to, excuse me, Olson, excuse me, to the uh, Rec Committee. 
and I will commit, um, I will appoint uh, Commissioner Elper to the um, Intergovernmental Relations Committee. So um, with that. Um, Point of order, I believe there's also a vacancy in admin finance. Did, did I miss that one? Is there one? Yes, there is. Uh, former Commissioner Crudup was uh, one of the Thank members. Thank you. Okay. And is, as far as I know, uh, Commissioner Olson is not on that committee. No. Yeah, I'm already on uh, rec. I'm not on admin and finance, so I think that might have been where, where I got crossed. So okay. I can be on admin and finance. That's okay. Fine. All right. We will put then uh, Commissioner Olson on. But then Olson we might have a vacancy on, on rec. It's what? But then we do have a vacancy on, on the rec. rec okay. Um, is there anybody who would like to step forward to be on rec at this point in time? I'm not aware that we're going to have any committees, but it's good to have somebody on there. Can I appoint somebody? I, I just had a question. What happens when we have a new commissioner? Will this shuffle again uh, before the before January? Um, that's for us to decide if you wish to. Okay. But um, being. I'm just following the protocol of when we vote for a vice president. We usually follow with the appointments to committees. So is there anybody who would like to be on rec? I'm happy to volunteer to be on rec. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Schaefer, then I am appointing then to our recreation committee. Thank you all so much for stepping forward. And so on then to the next. <laughs> I have no idea where we are. Uh, Oh, yes, thank you. Reports from outside boards and committees is what our next item of business is. And does anybody have any to report? Commissioner Benny, please. <clears throat> thank you, President Forney. On the 25th of October, there was a BET meeting, and um, there was a, a presentation done. So there, the BET last year hired a consultant in, in lieu of having a staff person at the city to kind of um, work on behalf of that body. And the consultant presented some data about spending by ward in certain categories and things like that, also looking at pop population and demographics by ward. So um, the only follow-up I have on that or a point of interest for the park board is that some of the park data looked a little bit um, different than what I would have expected it to look like. And the source of that data was the city. So I've been working with um, Director Wiseman and uh, Pamela Gokemeyer to see about how we can correct that or make sure that the city or this consultant is pulling the right information about our parks. So that's it. Thank you for that report. Yep, Commissioner Thompson. Thank you, President Forney. I, so much has happened this week. Um, last Thursday was a Parks Foundation board retreat, and uh, it was really lovely. Uh, President Forney was there, Commissioner Schaefer was there, um, as the, trying to expand the conversation about just partnerships and what the needs are in between and um, some good work being done there. Um, I guess that's all I have to report. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I will also report, I was not at the meeting, but I understand the Council Rice was at a meeting last night with the City Council regarding potential charter changes, and I just want to um, cue people up that um, that's something that we should be also addressing in the next um, uh, few months, um, because I know that the Charter Commission is looking at, at changes potentially. I know that the Board of Estimate and Taxation is something of great concern to all of us. So. Um, if there's other things that you would like to bring forward in regards to that, you know, please um, let's uh, get that on our agenda to um, to be considering that. So, um, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, Council Rice? Um, just thank you, Madam President. I know we're really busy, but yeah, I, this is this will be a topic for this board to consider. There are some pretty significant structural changes, including creating an ethics department that would oversee uh, all park board activities. Uh, when it was passed about 20 years ago, the park board is outside of the city's ethics process. And it's a good process, but um, it, it's very time consuming uh, on the city side. And I, it, the points I've made is city council members have full-time jobs, full-time staff, and run into these issues. I personally have represented some council <laughs> members who have had to gone through that process. And I would not, it, it, I mean, we have a system that works now, and uh, it could become quite onerous. Any citizen could make a complaint against any commissioner, and it automatically triggers a pretty extensive uh, process. And I think it also uh, goes to kind of the fundamental nature of how the, this board is to govern the park system, and we've not had that. There are a number of other things that I think, too, in that uh, 
ordinance that needs to careful reflection uh, and um, um, it, it's more than technical and it's more than just conforming with the uh, part of it was we created the new government structure and they all knew we're heard the mayor say we're flying building the plane while we're flying it well they might be building that plane but they're also want to build a helicopter and a landing pad and a few other things so stay tuned please great analogies thank you okay so um on from here we will go to our consent business um we have a motion to move the consent agenda so moved with the removal of the item that we already pulled. <laughs> so Thank you. just to clarify for our viewing audience, the items that I'm moving as a slate are 2023-198 and 2023-193. Thank you. Oh. Second. I actually want to pull 2023-198. For discussion? 198 yes, for discussion? Okay, yes. okay we're pulling then. Um, uh, 198 and we're voting then on 2023 193 all the are you finished Commissioner Mance? Okay. all those in favor uh, please signify by saying uh, aye. Aye. aye opposed that action carries okay then back to um, resolution 2023 198 I'd like to read that I'll move 2023-198 resolution that the Board of Commissioners authorizes the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board staff to apply for grants through the 2023 Hennepin Youth Activities Grants Program in the amount of $300,000 for park improvements at Audubon Park and $250,000 for park improvements at uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Park. Second. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so would you like uh, discussion on this with a presentation? What are you looking for? I'm just, I, I would love, can staff re-update the board on how much funding has come through this program and how um, these grants are administered throughout the city? <coughs> Welcome, Director Swanson. Swanson. President Forney, Commissioner Menz, I have a little presentation here. It's just better to go through those slides. So uh, let's see. Uh, President Forney, Commissioner Menz, you were asking about how, what we received and how they're administered. Is that, did I get the question right? Yeah, yes. Just like what? Um, President Forney, Commissioner Menz and commissioners. So uh, this program is the, is the uh, Hennepin County's um, answer to putting, um, sales tax revenue back into the county uh, for youth programs. It began in 2009, and since 2009, we've been awarded $5.9 million in, um, in grant funds. We matched that with about $10 million, and so we've made about $16 um, uh, million worth of improvements to our parks. There are a couple of years, uh, excuse me, three years where outside agencies applied through us and the total grant award to those three separate agencies or three separate groups was about 900,000. Um, again, there are three commissioner districts that are within Hennepin County commissioner districts that are within uh, the city of Minneapolis. Um, a number of years ago, uh, Hennepin County staff as well as um, Minnesota Amateur Sports Commission asked us to really concentrate on having just one application per commissioner district. We have a five-year agreement with NPS, uh, Minneapolis Public Schools, and so we try to trade off between uh, districts. They allow us to apply in two districts and then they uh, apply in one district. So again, in this year we're applying for grant applications in uh, Commissioner Fernando's district and Commissioner Green, and they have a project that they're applying for in Commissioner Connolly's district. 
again this is where the three projects approximately are again um, within Commissioner uh, Connolly's district I don't remember exactly which school the uh, uh, school board is applying for but we're applying for parks at Audubon and um, uh, at Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Park. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to pull this agenda item for the board, and, and I wasn't sure where our um, knowledge was on this, but it does seem like a really great place where we do coordinate capital funding with the school board. Uh, but I, I do, I did have an issue with this request because it, it's for playgrounds. It, and the, the playground is going to be an amazing playground that is going to have a lot of uh, inclusive features. But being that the project is in my district, I, I don't know if the board or how we can utilize these funds, but it doesn't, it seems like we have money for playgrounds a lot of times, and that maybe this isn't an appropriate use in, in our organization for these funds. Um, I'm going to be supporting the, the item, but I just wanted to make sure that in the future that maybe we have a little bit more understanding of like, if I'd like to know where the third um, item is and like how we're coordinating this funding together to meet the needs of our fields. I think that there's a lot of opportunity with, uh, especially with the softball issues that we've had coming up. So I was just taking a little back. Um, thank you for the staff for um, walking through that a little bit with me. And uh, just wanted to make sure that the board knows these are really important funds. And one last question. There's a rumor that this program will go away. Is that true, Director Swenson? President Forney, Commissioner Menz, uh, I have not heard that. Okay. I will just say really um, that the county has really um, doubled down on their staff involvement. We used to have a very difficult time reaching out to any county staff to work through grant agreements, grant extensions, but they have a dedicated staff person. And um, uh, so we work through a lot of details. So it could go away, but they do have a staff person that they've dedicated to this grant grant funding. Last question, Commissioner, um, Director Swenson, when is the agreement with the school board, Ron? You said it's a five-year agreement. When did that start? Um, I, uh, President Forney, Commissioner Menz, I believe three years ago. So we have a couple years left on that. Okay. And I'll, I'll submit to the board kind of a summary okay. of, of what they've applied for, where they've been successful. One thing that I'll point out, and this is a little bit beyond your question, but last year they wanted to apply with, with, within Commissioner Connolly's district for grant funds. And um, um, the board, and they did. And the county board chose another project, uh, a very worthy project that we sponsored, uh, the Minneapolis American Indian Center. And so that precluded any other funds coming to the school. So 300,000 was awarded to uh, uh, the, the renovation that's going on at that, at that facility. And again, it's a, long, it's, a, it's a long answer here, but there's a reason why the county requires us as the LGU to be the sponsor of those grants that we would give to outside organizations. And so there's no guarantee that we get these funds uh, Commissioner, uh, President Forney, Commissioner Mann is correct. There is there is no guarantee. And you're saying that last year the school district's application for their county fund, their their space did not, um, it was not awarded, but both of ours were. Uh, President Forney, Commissioner Mann, that, that's my understanding, yes. Thank you. Deputy Secretary Ringel. Thank you, President Forney. Um, and Commissioner Menz, I wanted to just provide a historical context is when the Minneapolis Park Board first began engaging with these funds, we only spent them on fields. And we did that for, I want to say, probably seven to 10 years, somewhere in that range. I was going to try to catch Cliff's eye. And it was board pressure that pushed us into using these funds for other types of amenities within the system. So I, I, I want you to have that context as you think about that. Thank and, you. And understand that staff are moving into other projects based on board pre previous board pressure. Thank you. I had one thing. Yes. Go ahead, um, Thank you, Secretary Ringgold and um, President Forney and Commissioner Menz. I just wanted to add, I, when I watched the Hennepin County discussion around this this year, the county commissioners were very excited about this project and this funding. And it used to be called sports, and they changed it to activities because they wanted to expand it to arts and other things. But I didn't hear any criticism 
from, from them on the project, and on the, the fund and the grant. Any, any indication that they're Okay, with that, um, all those in favor of the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That action carries. Okay, moving right along, we are into unfinished business. Um, just also for people to know is that we have a public hearing at uh, 545 and, of course, open time at uh, 530. So if somebody would like to um, read Resolution 2023. I'll move One. Resolution 2023-197. It's a resolution approving the Parkland Development and Easement Agreement with Exeter Management and the City of Minneapolis for application of the private land maintained for public use parkland dedication option to propose development at 1500, 1516 and part of 1600 Marshall Street Northeast in the Sheridan neighborhood of Minneapolis in order to provide a connection between streets and the East Bank Trail within above the Falls Regional Park. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on this item? Any discussion? Not seeing any lights, I'm going to ask the secretary to please call, call a roll. Commissioner Thompson. Sorry. Um, aye. Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Menz. Aye. Commissioner Elper. Aye. Vice President Abene. Aye. President Forney. Aye. You have eight ayes. Thank you. Um, I think maybe I'll just go into open time unless people would like to begin in four minutes. No. The presentation. Okay. So I'm going to read the open time rules if people, if that's okay. All right. So um, thanks to all of you who want to share your thoughts and ideas with us during open time. Before we start, I want to provide an abbreviated version of the open time board rules. All individuals wishing to speak may call in before noon the day of the meeting to be placed on the agenda or sign up at the board meeting prior to the start of open time. I will be calling on people on the sign up list only. Open time for the public input shall not exceed a total of 15 minutes with the time limit to be allocated by me, the president. Please watch the timer up here to be considered of others here to speak and stay within your allotted time. During open time, public testimony will be given without debate and only clarifying questions from the board will be allowed. Two types of items not appropriate for open time in order to protect the privacy of all individuals are pending litigation and personnel issues. So please refrain from con uh, commenting on specific personnel issues. We will not tolerate discriminatory and or harassing words directed at anyone. So please ensure that all comments you make tonight comply with the policy. This board made the decision many years ago to um, operate under Robert's Rules of Order. Under Robert's Rules of Order, the ceding of time to another person is not allowed. So only those signed up to speak may only speak for their own allotted amount of time. We also request that each speaker provide his or her name and address. And we have two more minutes to know if we have anybody signed up. Drum roll, okay. Um, sorry, everyone. <laughs> Could we start? You have a special announcement? Yes. A, a special announcement, okay? Yes, I have a very special announcement that will take less than two minutes. Um, there's a momentous occasion happening on Friday, and it is our dear President Meg Forney's birthday. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and I'm going to do this one thing here. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't quite ready right now, but oh. um, but I just would like to say thank you for honoring us on all important occasions. It's you know you're incredibly thoughtful, um, uh, and uh, of all of us. And I think it's time that we think about you as well. So I wish you, on behalf of all of us, a very wonderful, um, momentous birthday. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> are too sweet but I'm sorry but you're advancing it just a little bit too early no, okay. two more days after that <laughs> <laughs> that pushes I, age I believe I, I believe I thought it was um, I was told uh, Friday was the, the big day <laughs> it's actually Guy Fox day so yes. if anybody knows what that means <laughs> anyway uh, <laughs> Good. Uh, we do have six speakers, so I'm going to give each one uh, three minutes uh, each. Thank you all. <laughs> you really moved. 
Anyway, uh, Jennifer Olson is the first person, and then after that is Maureen Wells. Welcome. Thank you, commissioners. I'm, I'm Jennifer Olson. I'm a volunteer at Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden, and I'm also president of the Friends of the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden. And I'm very pleased that in the budget there is a 0.75 year-round position for program administrator for the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden. And I'm here to advocate that it should be full-time. Presently, we have one full-time staff person at the garden, um, Susan Wilkins, the curator. She manages the garden, and she also hires, trains, and supports her part-time seasonal staff. This program administrator, who will be year-round, will be responsible for developing programs, continuing programs, hiring the staff, training the staff, and um, maybe doing some of the programs. She'll also manage the volunteers. In, in partnership with the Low Pit, she will also be developing a winter adult children nature program at War Chalet. And this will be most of the responsibility for the winter season. Over the last 20 years, the Eloise Butler Wildfire Garden has expanded their programs. In 2023, they had 49 special tours. The majority of them were for youth programs, from the Minneapolis Public School Summer Program, from Scouts, and from the Wheatley um, Center. There were 312 public programs that were um, presented. 3,300 people attended those. More than 50% were families and youth. And this is a 300% increase in the last 20 years. There were almost 50,000 engagements between the volunteers or the naturalists and the public. And this is a 360,000% increase in the last two decades. 190 volunteers lo logged in 2,000 hours. In total, 54,351 people participated in programs at the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden. There could have been 700 more. The Minneapolis Public Schools were late in putting in a request, and by that time there was no staff that had scheduling opportunities and no time to plan for a curriculum for first and second graders. As a retired physician, I am very concerned about the data that our youth age 8 to 18 spend 7.5 hours on average on screen for entertainment. This excludes any kind of academic um, programming. The American Academy of Pediatrics endorses kids' physical outdoor time because it improves their physical, mental health, and development. Mm -hmm. Outdoor activity promotes curiosity, creativity, and critical thinking. I think that this should be a high priority that we continue this high power programming in a site that's already performing program. And I really encourage that you think about endorsing a 1.0 full-time staff person for this. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen Wells. And then after that is Sally Gullett. Maureen, are we here? Not seeing Maureen, is Sally here? Goodness, okay, so we're on to Jordan um, Blacksley. Blakesley, excuse me. <laughs> it's okay, I've gotten all kinds of pronunciations for that. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Jordan Blakesley. I'm a resident of Whittier and a gardener at the Sioux Line Community Garden, located just off the Greenway between Garfield Avenue and Harriet Avenue. The topic I wanted to raise today is that of the proposal to build a concrete access ramp that would run through the community garden space eliminate up to half of the existing garden plots. I wholeheartedly agree with the need for an ADA accessible ramp to the greenway for the neighborhood, but there's no reason why we can't do so in a way that preserves the outdoor community green space that is the Sioux Line Garden. I suggest, as other members of the community have suggested before, that this ramp instead be built at the alternative proposed location two blocks to the east on the southern side of the greenway with connecting access to Grand Avenue. This would not only preserve the Sioux Line Garden, but would improve accessibility and safety. Neither Garfield nor Harriet Avenue have crosswalks on Lake Street, while Grand has both a crosswalk and bus stops along Lake Street to allow for easy access. The Sioux Line Community Garden provides so much to the neighborhood. 
which would be so much greatly reduced by this proposed project. It serves as an outdoor gathering space. It provides community education, both to adults and to children, through its partnership with the nearby Whittier Elementary School. It serves as a source of food security for some, a source of recreation and physical activity for others, and a source of community for all those who pass through it. Members of the board, I ask you to renew your commitment to protecting the Sioux Line Community Garden. Doing so means supporting the proposed alternative ADA accessible <coughs> path to the Greenway, connecting to Grand Avenue, and leaving the Sioux Line Community Garden intact, so that it may continue to be a pillar of the community that has been for the last 30 years. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Mike Tate, and then after that, I think this is Roxanne O'Brien. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Andrew, good evening, Andrew. Mike Tate, Minneapolis. Um, so how are the children? Um, I want to just uh, give it a moment of thought for me and, and my community about Alicia stepping down. I'm here to speak to her um, for the voiceless. It won't, won't speak for her and the work that she did for the parks uh, of Minneapolis. Um, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. We're losing a, a woman who was sincere about her job sincere about the community of which she served, her constituents all over the city who voted for her. And uh, I don't know if anything was said before I got here, but I definitely want to thank her for her service. Um, Alicia didn't look at her power. She looked at her principal. I wish some of us could look in our heart and not worry about the power and look at the principal of what we should be doing in our Minneapolis parks, especially our rec centers. Uh, I have a great concern that this budget does not speak to intentional programming that my kids so need, especially on this north side. Um, and it needs to be a daily basis thing, like you have in some of your other parks and other neighborhoods and centers. Um, I know Alicia probably would want to fight for that if she was still sitting here. And I would hope that many of you others would want to fight for that intentional purpose of programming every day for whatever age you're going to do it, hour to hour, until that rec center closes. Please look in your hearts. Find something in that budget that holds people accountable to that. Not storytelling, but real programming that people can sign up for, attend, and be part of. Alicia, I think you'd be proud of me, and I just thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, Roxanne? Yeah, I wasn't going to speak today either, but Coach T also um, made a good point when he said he, we should give Alicia her flowers. Um, so I'm sad that she's not here to be able to get them, but I'm sure she'll be able to watch this. Um, I didn't know Alicia that well. But what I do know of her and what I have seen of her and the things that she did um, with and for our community, I have a lot of respect for her. And so I'm, I want to say thank you to Alicia publicly as well as, um, you know, I'm kind of sad that she's gone. She was the only black woman um, on this whole board. And so it says a lot when the only black person steps away, whether or whether it was for a reason that she moved or whether it was for other reasons as well. And I think that you guys should look into that of why maybe black people are not feeling like this space is welcoming or that you know our, our needs are being met in our communities. We're in here a lot and we say some of the same things a lot and but we're not noticing many changes in the process or the procedures or in the behavior and the actions of the park board. And so, I don't know, I don't know how many, how many times people who are already overburdened and overwhelmed gotta come down here during their time that we're supposed to be feeding our families and just uh, making time for just regular living and we have to come down here and like actually pay attention to things like this incredible large park board budget that you know community is concerned that it's not reaching the needs um, even though there's the ability to pay for the needs of our people and the programs and our parks I'm hearing a lot of that you know just staff aren't being invested in 
so we don't have enough staff in the parks. So again, just like, are our people getting their needs met through this budget? Are you listening to the people's needs or are you just kind of doing this parental thing where you think you know what's best for our community and continue to do the same things that harm our communities as we've been done for decades and centuries. So I just hope you guys are actually thinking about us up here. And um, yeah, thank you to Alicia for serving as long as she could. Thank you. So Maureen um, Wells, are you here? Good, yeah, good, sorry. come forward. And then after that, if Sally Gallette is here, um, Sally will be next. Okay, good. I apologize, I didn't know what the order was. So my name is Maureen Wells and I live in Stevens Square. And we recently got told that our funding to redo work in the park was put off to 2027 from 2026. Last time we had any work done was 2015. So like lots of my neighbors, they came to live in Stevens Square because it was affordable. <laughs> I stayed because I was able to buy a condo cheap. I'm a social worker. I've lived there for almost 50 years now. So I really care about the neighborhood, as you can tell. So I'm here because our funding improvements have been moved another year, and here are my issues. And I have a bunch of photos. Can I, how can I get those to people or just show you? Um, we, Dawn uh, Summers is coming forward with her hand up, so if you can just give to her, okay? That's right mouth now after all this. <laughs> I had to take a lift because I don't drive after dark. So recently the tabletops were removed on the four tops. The microphone. Oh, sorry. We had the tabletops removed on four tops. They were wood. And instead of replacing them at the time they were taken off, we have crime scene tape. And that, in a neighborhood full of crime, that's not very nice. Um, the benches are bent and they're falling over. Last year, we have a porta potty that has had graffiti on it for months now. And park board staff come every day and clean up the park. Biffs come several times a week and services the porta potty. Last year, the same thing happened. And when I requested it get cleaned, it went back and forth between the park board and Biffs, and they just took it out. Mm -hmm. And so I asked Commissioner Schaefer, why did that happen? They didn't think the community wanted it. No, we just wanted it. no graffiti. We cleaned up graffiti all over the neighborhood all the time. So that could have been done. Um, I walk my dog in the park every day. I'm 74 years old. And on a good day, I'm lucky to be able to walk when it's lit. But the paths are, are broken up. They haven't been had any work done on maintaining them. When I did ask to have maintenance done, they did one little stretch of one little picture when I showed it to them. Again, staff are there every day. This shouldn't be a difficult thing to get. We're the densest neighborhood in the city and one of the least affluent. And most of our neighbors, we're like 50-50 white and non-white. We're all different age groups. But a lot of people don't know they have a chance to have a voice. So anyhow. So at minimum, we would like to have some work done in the park to at least do maintenance in the park. And please just take time to think about that and not put us back that long. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Sally Collette, and we just have a few minutes before our public hearing. So Sally, come forward. Thank you, Maureen. Hi. Uh, my name is Sally Gillette, and I appreciate the opportunity to address the board. Um, I've done this before, and I'm really happy this time to be able to be talking about some really positive developments that I see in the budget. Uh, things like increasing the natural areas management and also increasing the staff to 2.5 for next year. Um, we have, uh, if we don't preserve the park and the natural areas, um, you know, what's, what's the Minneapolis parks? <laughs> we need to do that. Um, the other point I'd like to make is that the, um, the idea of increasing volunteer um, help is being addressed 
by the by the budget by adding some staff volunteers do thirty one thousand hours of work for the park that's a lot and many of these folks are experts we'd like to be able to utilize those experts in a way that maximizes their value and we some some of the part of the policies of volunteers actually turn people away and an instance is at the rose garden where it was reduced from every week volunteers coming to every other week i think that is a real shame you know we have we have master gardeners we have really well educated and skilled people that can help the park so what we need to do is to provide the support for those people so that they can um, do the help that they want to do um, and i'm just really pleased about things of the um, the increase or the, the idea that uh, the budget for asset management also says that we want to maintain what we're building um, there are a few things as the last speaker talked about some things falling apart and i think we need to look at that one instance in um, south minneapolis is a little fishing dock that is on morgan avenue that was designed to um, help handicap people so accessibility it has been closed for two years because it's falling into the lake mm -hmm. so we need to protect our assets and I'm I'm pleased to see that the board is um, paying better attention to that thank you thank you I will now close the um, open time and I will then open up our public hearing and so I will read the rules so thanks to all of you who want to share your thoughts and ideas with us during tonight's uh, public hearing before we start the committee board excuse me would like to provide an abbreviated version of the public hearing rules um, all individuals wishing to speak can sign up prior to the start of the public hearing today November 1st at 545 if you have not signed up to testify yet please um, do so um, at the entrance uh, to the boardroom this public hearing will be time allowed by myself um, and I see that we've got seven people so I'm going to give each person two minutes each um, so please watch this uh, timer up above uh, for consider of others and then during the public hearing and public testimony will be given without debate and only clarifying questions from the board will be allowed we will not um, tolerate discriminatory or harassing words directed at anyone so please ensure that all comments you make tonight comply with the policy this board made the decision many years ago to operate under Robert's rules of order under Robert's rules of order the seating a time to another person is not allowed we also request that each speaker provide his or her name and address as the president of the board I will um, call for additional testifiers at the end of the hearing three times before the public hearing is um, closed so to present what the public hearing is about um, welcome deputy um, superintendent Ringel um, share with us Thank you, President Forney. And I will also note that this public hearing might be interrupted to go to admin finance to have the open or the public comment on uh, the budget. So just to Thank be you. aware of that. Um, this is the second time you've had a first public hearing on the Rick Ricker Trail in front of this board. Uh, the first nomination was actually February 6, 2023. It's been renominated because we didn't have all of the seated at large commissioners and the district commissioner at that meeting so it was resubmitted on the on june 12 2023 same nominator stephanie zebar correct this is the is the right pronunciation um all the correct communications have occurred on this in terms of making sure per policy per procedure that neighborhoods um the assistant superintendent of planning commissioners etc have have been sent an email on on this nomination um, again this is a trail um, naming nomination and it's between uh, it's on the east bank and it's between 8th avenue northeast and almost up to the bnsf bridge just shy of that uh, 
At the last uh, hearing, we articulated some of the um, details of Rick Recker. I also have, and it's on your desk there today, a proclamation that was made by Mayor Fry that provides a little bit more detail in terms of who um, Rick Recker is. And I pulled off of that in particular that he was a Roosevelt High School grad um, that wasn't included in the previous piece. And he, this was an astonishing number for me to see, raced at least 2,846 races. I'm not even certain how you do that exactly, but that is a good number of, of races. Um, the second public hearing is proposed for April 16th, 2025, and a proposed final vote date of June 18th, 2025. Um, while we are, we do not have a full complement of at-large uh, commissioners um, on the board currently, the ones you do have are here, as is the district commissioner. So in talking with Council Rice, this is a valid public hearing. Um, we show this on many of these public, uh, um, are these naming action items, just a current list of namings that are in progress, as well as those have been complete. You'll see Horace. W.S. Cleveland moved over to the recently named category um, since the last time we saw this. So with that, we will move on to the speakers. Thank you. We do have seven speakers. So I'm going to allow um, two, uh, two minutes each on uh, one. And the first person is Steve Highland. And after that is Joe Kirky, I think is the name. So Steve, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, my name is Steve Highland. And thank you, and thank you to the family for the chance to talk for less than two minutes. And it's going to be hard to do to talk for less than two minutes about this great friend of mine. Um, if we all think just for a moment about being this sports uh, town that we live in, it wouldn't take long for me to talk about Kirby Puckett or Joe Maurer or Bud Grant, and we could associate certain sports connected directly to those uh, legends. Rick Recker is the same way. Think about the term running or the sport. He has that kind of a um, notoriety in our town, in my opinion. I've known the guy. I was a little surprised over again, to hear over again, that he had been involved with over 2,000 different events. The guy's an icon. He was a wonderful man. We lost him a couple of years ago to cancer. So what I know about him is, is, is a long time, and I won't get into all that in less than a minute and a half now, but what I would like to propose is for all of you and the public to think very seriously about uh, him and just because of what he has done for the community and certainly to include the running community with the trail I guess it's been called the Rick already before it's been called the Rick the Rick record trail uh, he gave a lot to the community certainly to the running community he is he, he's just notorious in that way and I mean that in the most complimentary way great guy great friend um, so when I heard about this and was invited to be a participant in this I couldn't jump at the <coughs> opportunity faster again I would just urge you sincerely uh, with all the important things that you're talking about doing tonight and before and after. This would be such a notable and such a very important and I think worthy opportunity to recognize this great guy. I think he had been on this trail that we're talking about, I've learned, for almost 40 years every single day. So he wasn't looking for the notoriety, he was just looking for the opportunity to be a leader in that sport in our community. So. I'd, I'd love to at least have you think about this very seriously. I'm coming to you as a friend. I've also been a, a, a runner for a long time, and a lot of those activities I learned directly, along with my family, from Rick Rick. <coughs> Wonderful guy, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Joe. And then after that is Sarah McFerney. I'm sorry, I I'm not pronouncing it right, but Joe first. Well, thank you very much for giving me a couple of minutes here. Um, Rick Recker is, was my cousin, and Rick Recker was very influential in my son and daughter in their running career. They started running when they were in elementary school, um, through middle school, high school, and into college. Um, Rick Recker was show up at almost every one of their races, either as a supporter or working in the race. Um, a lot of the courses that they ran, Rick was instrumental in, in certifying the courses. Um, he had a huge effect on my family. Um, and you talked about the number of races. Um, there's probably uh, more individuals that he's affected than the number of races. Um, he played such a, such a big role in this community. Anybody who's done any running at all it knows, have met, or is friends with Rick Recker. And what he's done is, is, is so positive and uplifting 
with in the running world and just in this community that i think it's such a great thing that this trail is being looked at to be renamed you know or be named in rick's memory we saw that a couple of years ago when rick passed away at the celebration of life the hundreds and hundreds of people that had showed up to pay respect to rick including the mayor was there and it was so cool to see that it was it was in and listen to all the stories that everybody talked about with rick showing up at the races rick running in the races and i was fortunate enough to run in a couple of races with rick um even though he was uh, a number of years older than me i was not able to keep up with him and i believe rick ran his final race or went out for his final run probably about a week before he passed away so um that was his thing that's what he loved to do um, and he, he affected he affected and touched so many lives that i think this is really a cool thing that this is being considered so thank you for your time thank you sarah and then after that is alicia um kirk kirky Hello, my name is Sarah Ehlers McInerney. I'm the executive director of Run Minnesota, formerly known as the Minnesota Distance Running Association. We're a membership organization, a membership based nonprofit established in 1961. We're the largest and oldest running organization in Minnesota. Rick Wecker is a Minnesota running legend. His accolades and accomplishments are many, which you've heard of. His legacy is indisputable, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about my friend, Rick Recker. Rick lived downtown and ran a route around the river nearly every day for 40 years. <clears throat> for the record, the days that he wasn't running around the river, he was running a race. <laughs> I think he has 100,000 lifetime miles. Um, I was his running partner from 2010 to 2012. Weekly, Rick and I would start out by the Federal Reserve and then we'd end with coffee and breakfast at Cuzzy's. Our 40 year age difference made us an unlikely pair, but our <laughs> experience and age difference put us around the same running pace. Our run plan was as follows. <clears throat> year round, rain or shine, be ready for adventure. You could end up bowling, you could find an apple tree, you could see all kinds of wildlife, Run as close to the river as possible, preferably on dirt, and somewhere around Boom Island, Rick would take off and beat me in a sprint. <laughs> you could blindfold Rick, and he would be able to narrate the whole route as you ran alongside every street, any route that was on the trail to watch out for, the timing of the trains, the height of the river, the people who would cross our paths. He loved this route, he loved this city, and he loved running and naming the trail after Rick would be an incredibly fitting tribute to somebody whose footsteps literally started that route. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I am going to recess the full board to go into admin and finance since there is a public uh, comment about the superintendent's recommended budget. So I'm not sure who is chairing. Be me. Thank oh, you, great. President uh, Forney. Chair Thompson. The time being, 558. Eight fifty-eight. Um, I will now call the Administration and Finance Committee to order. Can the Secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Menz. Present. Commissioner Olson. Here. Co-Chair Schaefer. Here. Co-Chair Thompson. Here. You have a quorum. Excellent. Um, can someone? Would I would move that we adopt the agenda. Uh, all those in favor of the agenda? Is, oh, so I apologize, Commissioner Schaefer, yes. Yes, I, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to add the resolution around 3701 Why is that a Boulevard. Uh, do we have a number on that yet, it, just for clarification? Don't. No. No. Okay, um, all those in favor of amending the agenda to add that resolution, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Um, uh, now, can we take a vote on the am agenda as amended, unless there are no other lights? Um, all those in favor of the amended agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Um, we have some minutes that we need to get through. Um, I would move the minutes from, from September 20th and October 4th as a slate. Thank you. All those in favor of the minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Those carry. And now it is time for the reason we paused, the 
public comment. Am right I a minute? Right I'm, right I know, that's really impressive. Now, Secretary Ringgold, I apologize. Are there are there a list of people that are that have signed up to comment or are we just it's whoever can steamroll the mic. No, I'm I'm joking. Co-chair Thompson, I'm getting a message that tells me there is no list. So I think you should open it up to the room to see if anybody wanted to comment on, um, on the budget. Fantastic. Is there anyone here who would like to comment on our 2024 recommended superintendent's recommended budget? Oh, we see. Come on down. Can you state your name for the record? Yeah, Maureen Wells, back again, under control now, not nearly so upset or surprised or the dry mouth. So I just want to say that people in wheelchairs cannot use the paths in Stevens Square Park. They're really difficult, they're hard for me, and I, I can walk and I walk my dog there every day. We have dedicated park fees that have not been used, um, over $200,000. We were promised to get water in the park for both just for drinking and for the dogs, and that didn't come through yet, and we don't know where that is. Most of our people live in three-story walk-ups. They don't have yards. This is where the kids play. This is where <coughs> I take my great niece and nephew to play, where I took my nephew and his sister to play before that. And it's just like not a pleasant or happy place to be. We try to do events, but we don't get much park board support for doing any kinds of events in the park either. So I'm just asking to please at the minimum, fix it. <laughs> Don't make me live with crime scene tape. And please just t um, take the time to at least get us the water, get things repaired. And please let, don't make us wait another 10 years, 12 years to get our work done from 2015. So that's what I really had to say. And I apologize and I appreciate the extra time. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm glad it worked out that you were able I to speak again. I am together. too. <laughs> now I'll go call the lift. Would anyone else like to speak toward our 2024 superintendent's recommended budget at this time? Anybody? It doesn't look like it. So it does not look like it. So I will I will close then the public comment on the superintendent's recommended budget and move along. Or we should go back to the no. Do you want us to reset? I will, I will pause the Admin and Finance Committee and bring it back to you, President Forney. Thank you. Recess. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Thank you. Recess. Thank you so much. I'll reconvene then the, uh, the full board and move back into our um, public hearing. And I believe that we see now. Alicia has spoken. Okay, right? Alyssa. Alyssa, sorry. Okay, and then the next person is Mary uh, Zepete. Hello, sorry for not pronouncing that very well. Okay, Alicia, welcome. Thank you. My name is Alyssa Kirk. I now live in Maple Grove, Minnesota, but for over 30 years now, I've been a part of the Twin Cities and greater Minnesota running community. As my father spoke, Rick was really influential to both my brother and I um, becoming who we were both in sports and just as people. The relationship that we formed with Rick through our running fam or through our running really brought our families back together. He was my dad's cousin, and as generations go on, we kind of drift. And then little children, my brother and I decided to join the running world, and there was Rick, and slowly our families came back together. It was instrumental to us, but bigger than that was the role that Rick played in the greater running community. The running community in Minnesota is so large but feels so small. I've never met anyone who's been a long time runner in Minnesota who didn't know my cousin Rick. And that's very heartwarming for me. But I think about what a positive and healthy <coughs> community the running world is and it's due to the legacy of people like Rick. Eventually, those of us who know Rick and who ran with Rick won't be here anymore. But the legacy with having a trail that he formed, named after him, will, in, will ensure that the positive impact that he made on the running community really lasts. People will always be able to say the Rick is named after Rick Recker because of the positive impact he had. Not just the number of races he ran, but the number of runners that he helped, the number of runners that he cheered on, helped coach. It would be really great if 60 years from now, my grandkids were running on a trail named after a running legacy named Rick and can speak to that. Um, 
I would be very happy one day to be able to run on that trail again. As someone who hasn't been able to run for a while due to an injury, if the second that trail is renamed after the Rick, I will be what, the first person on that trail running miles again. Um, thank you for your time and hearing us out. And I want to publicly say thank you to Rick for the, the influence he had on my life. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And then Lisa uh, McIntyre, I believe. Is Mary here? Oh, good, good. Um, my name is Mary Rucker Zapatello. I'm the youngest of Rick's three siblings. Uh, my older sister is here as well. The four of us were born and raised here in South Minneapolis, and each of us have participated in Minneapolis Park Board and Recreation um, activities throughout our, our lives. Um, each of us actually ended up working for the Park and Recreation System at some point in time along the way. Our father ran cross country and track in high school. And while at Roosevelt High School in South Minneapolis, my brother developed his passion for running and never stopped over the next 60 years. He served the running community in many capacities over the years which others have spoken to. Rick spent the majority of his life, uh, adult life living in downtown Minneapolis. I'm not sure when he began running the trail. I was probably just a kid because he is much older than I am. <laughs> um, but it has been many, many years. He cut this trail with his two feet and with the feet who he brought along to share the trail with. A few years ago, Rick shared with me his dream to have this trail named for him. I'm not sure how long um, any of you have been on the board, but he may have broached the subject with you before he became sick. I'm here to ask you to make his dream come true. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, and then after that is Mike um, Gordon. Lisa? Oh, good. Hi, I'm Lisa McIntyre, resident of South Minneapolis in the Potterhorn neighborhood. I met Rick Recker through group runs at Mill City Running. I really enjoyed hearing his stories of running along the riverbanks long before there was even a paved trail. Um, while I only knew him for a few years, it was obvious that he had a lifelong commitment to supporting safe and accessible paths for running and biking along the river. He has had a butterfly effect on the whole running community and all of Minneapolis. Because of these paths that were forged by Rick, I personally have found best friends while running and have been connected to a nonprofit called Mile in My Shoes. This is a group that provides running resources and an inclusive community to folks experiencing homelessness or recent release from incarceration. Naming this section of the trail the Rick Recker Trail would be a compliment and the highest honor to Rick. Thank you. Mike? Is Mike here? Oh. Good. Good evening. My name is Mike Warden. I'm actually from Hayward, Wisconsin, but I lived here in the Twin Cities for over 40 years, and I knew Rick Recker for more than 40 years. He got me to volunteer for the Metrodome running program back in 1981 when it first started. And he also got me involved in a lot of other running events. He mentored me as a race management person. Um, ultimately, I ended up taking care of the Twin Cities Marathon finish area for over 10 years and many other races. But what I want to talk about is Rick was really a people person. You couldn't go anywhere, and there wasn't somebody that Rick <coughs> didn't, that Rick, there was somebody that Rick know, knew. And I wanna, it, for him, it was kind of all about relationships. And he wanted everyone to succeed, not just the elite athletes, but even middle of the pack people like me and others. That was what he was all about. And in addition to road racing and racing on the trails, he did a lot of work in track and field as a judge for various track and field events and in the Special Olympics track and field program. So I really can't think of anybody, I mean, as everyone else has mentioned, Rick was just a phenomenal person and a great impact to running in Minnesota and particularly in Minneapolis. So I think it would be a great honor for you to name the trail 
after Rick Rucker. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any more uh, people on the list. I need to call out to see if there's anybody else before I close on uh, the public hearing. Anybody else who uh, didn't sign up that would like to speak uh, regarding uh, this action? Oh, please come forward. Good evening. I was here earlier in the year. I'm Rick's daughter. I'm one of the people who nominated, uh, got this process going. Um, I think I had a misunderstanding. I thought I was going to be part of something earlier. So I'll try to shorten my, um, my comments. But I, I was raised by Rick Recker. I mean, running was part of our lives from birth. And also the parks were part of our lives from birth, most notably Minnehaha and Longfellow. We have memories from those parks that for, for, for my whole life. I mean, all the, all the races we went to, we helped, we cheered people on, we participated when kids could participate. One fun, fun memory I have is when my dad, I mean, it was embarrassing at the time, but got the best legs award, you know? <laughs> there's the silly, there's the serious, there's the intense. He was just, running was his life. And Minneapolis was his life. He was just diehard committed to Minneapolis. And he started running this path before people were really running. I mean, he was one of those people that they used to throw stuff at because people didn't run back then. You know, it was weird for people to be out there on the streets or on the trails, barely dressed. And uh, so he got the harassment and all that. But he was one of those that pioneered this in the community. Uh, road racing, track and field, all of that. And a big part of that was that um, he knew how healthy it was. He had his own demons that he faced, just like all of us do. And running was a huge part of him um, succeeding in life. And so that's part of what motivated him in helping so many others, including he was involved in things like Boulder Options. He was involved with that organization from the beginning. And they do wellness-based mentoring for middle school students who need extra support. So. His life was about giving back. When he had the terminal cancer diagnosis, he told me, the way I'm going to spend my last months, and they gave him four, every day I'm going to give back. Every day I'm going to give back. And that was every day through the running community to the very end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else that, um, before I close out the um, public hearing? Anybody else who would like to speak on behalf? Anybody else? On that, I will then uh, close the public hearing. Um, and I would like to just um, thank you all for your your um, insights to Rick. I did meet him. Yes, I, I, I knew him. And yes, he did approach me about naming. So um, I did know this. Um, the majority of cases of our trails and uh, are named, uh, actually patterned off of um, parks and parkways. Um, there are some exceptions, um, and I believe that we should be looking at those, reviewing those, and and um, have staff look at um, what additional work um, is might be needed as far as precedent, and what those logistics might um, look like as far as uh, displaying um, Rick's name on the trail. Um, I really appreciate all of you, but I, I would think that it is something because this is unique um, that I would like to have staff look into this and, and making sure that we do the appropriate thing, but also um, uh, that we are not setting um, um, a path that maybe is unrealistic for us. So I just want to make sure that you know we want to do a thorough job to make sure we do the a proper honoring. So I thank you. With that, then I am going to move back to uh, the agenda, and uh, we are at unfinished business, and we are going to have resolution uh, 2023 197. Somebody would like to read. It's okay. It's okay. I've I believe we've done that and we're on to new business. I'm so sorry. I'm no, really it's okay. okay. I'm yeah. lost so too, we are but now I got that one at, right. Um, a discussion item. That's right. <laughs> okay, a wonderful discussion item on Indigenous Acknowledgement and Reconciliation Plan overview discussion item. And I uh, looking forward to our presentation from um, a multiple of carries. Oh, excuse me, and another C, too. Colleen. <laughs> Good 
Good evening, President Forney, commissioners. Um, we're excited to be here tonight to share an update on um, some work that has been long, been long underway and to introduce a new uh, team member for this work. Um, so we'll, we're here to provide an update on the Indigenous Acknowledgement and Reconciliation um, Plan. This is strange formatting, sorry about that. Um, and just a recap of where this work has been. So in, <laughs> it's really strange, sorry. Really? There seems to be. <laughs> Um, well, that's <laughs> so in spring 2020, uh, during our comprehensive planning process, there was recommendations made um, around, around establishing acknowledgement and reconcil reconciliation practices. Um, Parks for All was adopted in fall of 2021, um, and that included several strategies related to this work. Um, in spring of 2022, commissioners directed staff to develop um, an indigenous acknowledgement statement, and then also a budget action um, to, to continue this work through action. Um, so in fall of 2021, we did, um, we did bring forward a budget request that was approved by the board um, for funding to continue reconciliation planning, um, to do training, to work on the acknowledgement statement, at this time, this work was also incorporated into our racial equity action plan. In winter 2023, um, as part of the sort of soft launch of this work, we formed an interdepartmental staff work group. So staff that's working across the agency on, inter on sort of indigenous related projects and initiatives. Um, we also posted a job, po a job position. We had a, several sort of iterations of RFQs and RFPs trying to find um, someone to work with us as a consultant to help guide the indigenous acknowledgement and reconciliation work. Um, and finally, with our, I think it was our third attempt, we're so excited, we're able to, to bring Carrie Day Aspinwall in. Um, and so over the last few months and continuing up until the new year, we're really doing research and here tonight to just share an update with you on that research and to introduce Carrie to talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned in some of our projects to launch us into this and to see if you have any suggestions for priorities as we enter into this work. Ooh, this is much better, sorry. So it is <laughs> my pleasure <laughs> to introduce Carrie Day Aspinwall. Um, good thing I knew that timeline, so. Here, I'm so excited to introduce Carrie, uh, our first ever Indigenous Parks liaison, who is a consultant with us for the next year um, of our work. Thank you, Carrie. Sure. Welcome, Carrie. Delighted you're here. Good evening. President Forney, members of the commission, um, I am just overwhelmed with excitement. Uh, I want to say good evening. Buju in my native language. I'm Anishinaabe. Uh, I grew up in our city's park system. Stewart Park was my home park and served many of my indigenous peoples. The park pr always provided a uh, safe, welcoming place for me, my community, after schools, weekends, holidays, and in the summer. I've served my community for a lifetime and I'm, I'm excited and extremely honored to serve as the first Indigenous Parks Liaison for the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. I will do my best to serve, represent my people, our parks, and our cities in this position. I look forward to sharing the history, knowledge, and stories of our city and of our Indigenous people. Oh, okay. Um, before you, you have uh, uh, an acknowledgement that you all uh, have already seen through the comprehensive plan. Tonight, I brought in our sacred medicines, cedar, sage, tobacco, and sweetgrass, to acknowledge the commitment of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board as stated in this acknowledgement and to start us off in a good way. This acknowledgement speaks to the commitment of this board to, to our community and to our city that we are on native land and that we acknowledge the rich history and tragedies that took place here. That this land represents deep spiritual and personal significance for our people 
and it is with great expectation that this relationship will provide an understanding of who we are and that we learn from this relationship and that we will grow and change with time. Please do not hesitate to reach out. I'm here for you. I'm here for our leadership, our staff, and for our city. What guides this work? What guides this plan? As we move into the future, while always acknowledging and honoring our past, I will share with you the goals and strategies which will guide our work. This work is fluid and will change and grow as our relationship with each other grows. It is my full intention to bring our peoples together, to listen, to learn, to share, and offer recommendations on how we can contribute to building relationships, making our parks as important, as honored as they were to the Dakota people and all of the indigenous people of this territory. By fostering a sense of belonging and equity, we will connect and reconnect, cultivating a sense of appreciation for our direction and the important spaces that the parks hold across our city. More importantly, the potential, the opportunity to create space for generations to come, recognizing seven generations before us and seven generations after us. That's what honor is. We will significantly impact our indigenous residents, our neighborhoods, community, and our city with this work. Before you, you will see the ongoing projects that we are currently involved in. The park has always had a strong sense of stewardship to these spaces and have worked diligently to involve our indigenous community, our urban Indian leadership, and our tribal communities through these 18 current projects. It will be through these projects and your support that we acknowledge with certainty and action each and every effort that is made through these projects for each represents a significant part of our history and our future. It is because of your commitment to strengthen our relationship that, we will, that will move us into the future with a better understanding of the past for the benefit of the entire uh, city and our future. With that, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to serve, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you're up. What? We can leave. This is for you, Meg. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Commissioners. Uh, President Forney, Commissioners Colleen O'Dell in planning. And um, thank you, Carrie Squared, for everything that you've shared so far. <laughs> I want to share with you a little bit of an update on a project on that list that Carrie Day just shared. Um, and this is the uh, future public art at the waterworks site on the downtown Mississippi River, called Awamni Omni or Turbulent Water by the Dakota people. In 2018, park staff applied for and received a funding allocation from the city's Art and Public Places program to install permanent art here. And starting in 2020, we partner with city staff and native artists on community discussions, visioning, and artist selection. Last summer, that artist resigned and our project team then paused to focus on gaining a more thorough understanding of what is needed, um, including a series of conversations with Native community members that were done this year. These conversations were facilitated by Lakota Elder Lemoyne Lapointe and included people from several Dakota and other tribal affiliations. And 23 respected artists and Native community leaders shared their recommendations for healing and growth with the city and the park board. We're re really grateful to them for their time and their wise advice on this endeavor. I'm gonna present you with a few of the key outcomes from those conversations and I'll email you the full report afterwards so you can uh, review it. Native participants in these conversations asked that these priorities and outcomes be shared with decision makers. So we have already presented them in August to Mayor Frey, Fry, sorry, and his staff. Um, to park staff working on native theme projects this September and to our executive team in October. So he, here's the six priorities that came out of those discussions. The first three really address the Awamni Omni artwork at the Waterworks site specifically. 
Be a good relative and reflect Dakota values. Acknowledge the site's story and the land's history and base the artist's selection on Dakota values. While the last three really address um, working more generally with the city and the park board and the relationship we have with native people in the city. Demonstrate the commitment of the city and the park board. Be grounded in native leadership and decisions and establish a new way of working with the native community. And this last priority of establishing a new relationship is a very important one. There are several goals for this to redefine and strengthen these relationships, paying special attention to land control, to address and break down silos between agencies working on native projects, primarily by changing mindsets about what place is, and to work holistically with native people to achieve their big picture desires rather than implementing isolated individual projects. This group also identified action steps, including centering this process of reconciliation on the native community, working collaboratively, identifying sacred homelands and sacred sites in the metro area that should be honored, developing real allyship, and especially dedicating funding for these endeavors, including for native staff positions and advisors. And lastly, designating the water as a living being with its own rights. In the course of these discussions, several questions arose that we're all gonna need to grapple with in the coming months. How will we identify the partners who are already doing this work? What steps will we take to develop this new relationship with genuine conversations? What's the process for identifying native sacred sites? This one's an important and a big discussion point. How is land back possible? What best to recognize, how do we best recognize indigenous wisdom without also causing erasure? What is needed for real truth and reconciliation? And how might this work relate to the city's existing MOU with the Metropolitan Urban Indian Directors Group? Thank you for listening to these outcomes. I'll turn it back to Carrie. Carrie. C or Carrie C. B or D? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Um, so this, this plan, just to define it, uh, we do have a website up now and there's a community engagement plan and assessment that have been filed as a PNC this evening if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the project scope. But based on the budget allocation for 2023, we are embarking on um, this reconciliation action plan, which is part of the evolution that I'll share a little bit about tonight, to provide guidance for staff and commissioners to take action on systems, processes, relationships, and sites related to acknowledgement, truth, and reconciliation of historical and contemporary indigenous land, people, and nations. This work will include a range of approaches, including but not limited to policy development, partnerships, trainings, land acknowledgement, and sites of significance mapping. So this is mirroring a lot of the language from the budget request last year. Um, and part of the question for you tonight, and I think on an ongoing basis, is what should be the priorities for this work? We have a lot of projects, a lot of momentum already that have been happening for years and really trying to pay attention and amplify what's working um, and identify gaps and room to grow is, is the intention of this next year and to start working on, on processes and maybe policy or partnerships and really take an action-oriented approach to this as we've done research you know, uh, communities in Australia, New Zealand, Canada have, there's actually reconciliation action plan templates that municipalities use. Um, sort of building off that body of work is where we're starting to, to move toward. Um, so some of the potential topic areas for this action plan um, would include, you can see acknowledgement and training in the, in the center buckets there. Um, those are things that we've discussed to fair amount with this board and anticipate putting into action this year with the help of Carrie Day Aspinwall. Um, we also intend to do some sort of mapping process, a high level sites of significance mapping to understand. So for example, as we embark on capital improvement projects in parks, we've got some pre-existing understanding of sites of significance. Um, and just building off the success, the fourth bucket here of projects and how do we learn from the projects that are currently underway, um, like the East Phillips Open Space Plan that's just adjacent and actually working in collaboration with Little Earth, which is a really uh, vibrant urban native population or community here. Um, then there's other sort of questions of where to take this work, including 
learning about different models for agreements with tribal governments, sort of what, what are the possibilities and uh, avenues for the park board potentially, um, looking at land stewardship opportunities and ways of sort of building that into our work more deeply, um, including things like park access for cultural uses. So something uh, really kind of examining across our system, whether it's policies or procedures, um, how, do we, how do we think about that in a creative way and build space and capacity for that. Interpretation is another one. We've you know, lots of interest in signage, maybe updating kiosks along the grand rounds, um, including also renaming and reclaiming of names. We've got lots of examples of a great example of naming tonight. Um, but how do we, you know, Bidet Makoska, of course, is, is a recent story for us um, in terms of a name reclaiming that is a great example of a type of interpretation or storytelling of sites of significance. Um, a convert, there's been lots of conversations about workforce. Um, how do we think creatively about workforce development and potential partnerships for everything from environmental stewardship staff to police? Um, what are some opportunities with other agencies for partnership on that? And then policies. So this may al also lead us to doing some policy updates or collaborating on existing policy updates, including um, co developing a consultation policy p potentially, um, working on the naming policy update, thinking about the vegetation molestation ordinance. Um, this work may also take on financial um, sort of embodiment. So we currently have allocated funding to this work as part of the budget um, in 2023. And there also could be more park user fee kind of financial um, avenues explored that would then be presented to the board, of course, so, but uh, as part of our planning process. And then finally, that this work is values-based and how do we name the sort of why and the importance, um, what are the goals, what are the values of this work, I think will be an ongoing important thing to keep centered. So as I mentioned, it's been somewhat of an evolution over the last year plus, as I mentioned, that, you know, it's really been actively building blocks since 2021, um, starting with, and then ending with this indigenous land, people and nations acknowledgement statement in action. I know this board showed interest in that. Um, and then as we've done research, sort of understanding what an indigenous reconciliation and acknowledgement plan might look like, um, and then starting to, as we look at examples, we've started to call it the Indigenous Reconciliation Action Plan, um, but maybe it's also about truth telling. And that's something I think as an agency, and as we do this work, we'll sort of hold on to the possibilities of, of what this looks like and learn from other communities. So next steps in closing is that we're launching this tonight with you. Um, we'll be launching it publicly. We've got a website up. The community engagement plan is up. We are providing all the 11 tribes uh, located in Minnesota, federally recognized tribes located in Minnesota with updates as we do on an annual basis, but we'll be reaching out to them to schedule meetings to provide a similar sort of launch of this work to them. And we'd love to invite uh, commissioners and or the superintendent to attend those meetings as part of this launch campaign over the next couple of months. I will be following up by email to see if folks are interested in plugging in. Um, we will hopefully be traveling to, to those uh, tribal councils or to you know, committee meetings of tribal councils so that we can have government to government conversations about this work. We'll continue to meet with our work group of staff uh, we will be forming a Dakota Advisory Committee over the next couple of months, um, and as needed, we'll develop policy advisory teams. So that's, that's it for us. Thank you so much for your time. I know it's a packed agenda tonight. We really appreciate being able to come before you. Before we start, would you um, please send that um, slideshow to um, all of us? Really good stuff in there, uh, particularly you, the fact that we have a bucket list there. Uh, Commissioner Music. Thank you, President Forney. I appreciate the invitation to all of us and the superintendent to join you in meeting with tribal councils. Um, we've encountered in the past some problems around quorum uh, when we've extended invitations like that. So I would just ask that um, 
any opportunity where we will have more than a few commissioners attending that we follow our public meeting noticing practices to ensure that we are not in violation of open meeting law um, while trying to do this important work. Thank you. President Forney, Commissioner Musich, thanks for that reminder. And um, if you're not able to also attend a meeting this fall, we do anticipate going back next summer to share results. Um, so there'll be plenty of opportunity and I think spreading, spreading commissioners out would make a lot of sense. So thank you. Commissioner Olson. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, thank you for this, um, you know, great progress and great work so far. I really appreciate um, the looking into how land back is possible. I think for me, that seems to be, um, although I didn't see in the reconcili reconciliation bucket, so maybe that's later. Um, but to me, I think I, I, that is, a, you know, an end goal that we should be working towards and not uh, uh, actually, very recently, there's an example in Minnesota of of land back, uh, the Upper Sioux community, the state giving back land over there. So um, it's still going to be a complicated process. Uh, you know, it's going to take kind of years to for that to um, you know reach its completion, but it, it happened. And so I think that's amazing. And I think that's something that we can do as well. Um, and I think it's something we should observe and kind of see how they go about it. So um, I just think that's very exciting. And um, um, so I just kind of hope we're, we're focusing on that as we're doing this. Sorry, I don't know who was first, but I'm gonna go with Commissioner Benny. Thank you, President Forney. Um, um, this work has evolved, so I'm glad we've had a chance to hear the update. Um, I'm glad you've gone in a particular direction, and I was hoping that we, that would be explored. And, and it's the notion of the, I think the, maybe the way to phrase it is the mindset of relatives, of water ha having rights. I get very excited by that kind, of, um, that kind of approach, because I think there's things that we, we could, especially maybe in our, our urban cities, that we could do better. Um, I'd also, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I also want to manage expectations for the, what the board is able to do or what maybe might be possible, because I also want to be very clear and, and I, nothing, I, you know, I, I get to sit next to Commissioner Olson. I am so lucky. What a guy. But we want to be clear about that. And I also would like to possibly weave in the, um, the value of some things that we have, I think, come, that are part of our model here already in, in the city, which is the notion of the commons. The commons is about as close as you can get to some of, some of the sentiment, although I do think what, what we hear from, the, you know, what you're, what you're talking about and exploring is even better in some ways. Um, but the commons are a big deal. And for the commons to occur anywhere in this country in the way that they occur in Minneapolis, I think is kind of remarkable. So that's important as well. But anyway, um, I, and, and so I just wanna be sure that we don't perform but that we, what we, that we work toward the edge of where we realistically are gonna work. So uh, let me, thank you for letting me say that. Thank you very much. Thanks for your work, Carrie, Carrie, <laughs> Colleen. <laughs> thank you, Vice President. Um, Commissioner Menz. Thank you, President Forney. Uh, th this, this work is kind of, it, it's really emotional. I mean, it feels really, I mean, I'm so thrilled. I mean, I don't think that there's anything that's come across this board. I feel like this is probably one of the biggest things that we can do. Um, and having an, an indigenous liaison, like taking that step and the work that Carrie Christensen has done behind the scenes to make this possible is really encouraging. Um, I have a lot of students in my school uh, who have indigenous backgrounds. And I've noticed over the past few years, like the, a change, a shift in that mindset around what, what does it mean to be indigenous? What does it mean to be white in a, in a space that is, is indigenous? Because this land did not always exist for us. Um, we exist with the land and the water. And, and I'm really, really encouraged, and I really appreciate everybody uh, being supportive of this uh, work. I think that the plan is, is working towards that reconciliation and, and being active. So I know that when this first came up, there was that, that mantra of performative. And I think that the original resolution was 
it is it is acknowledging it could be performative but the staff and the work that has been done behind the scenes and the budget allocation of this board has made it so that it's not just performative at least at this point and i think that that is really important and i hope that and i'm so thankful for carrie and your presentation was was wonderful and your spirit obviously um lives in this space now so thank you all and i'm just really happy to have this happening it's just really exciting so i will go to a few of the council meetings and i don't and the commissioner musich that comment did come up at the equity group that we didn't want to we wanted to make sure to not have uh you know quorum uh debated but uh thank you so much uh, Commissioner Schaefer. Yeah, I had one quick question about some of the presentation. You had mentioned that you were developing land disposition guidelines. Is this different than our current land policy? Thank you, um, President Forney, Commissioner Schaefer. So the land disposition guidelines are actually already ex in existence and um, they're in the comprehensive plan. And so it's it's just build, building a deeper understanding of what that means and what land disposition guidelines mean and sort of overlaying with existing policy. So it's not a new tool, but really sort of an exploration of topics like Commissioner Olson mentioned through our existing uh, frameworks. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And you mentioned what would be our priorities. And I, I, and I guess since I have two minutes, I guess I'll share that. Um, to me, I'm all about practical impact for our youth. Um, I think of Red Lake Nation College right sitting on top of the commons. I, I think of our neighborhoods where, you know, is our programming really fostered and geared for the community? Can it be, can be more representative and actually led by the community? Um, because this is where I think we're going to have impact. I appreciate the murals, I appreciate the renamings and all that because it sets a visibility for the greater public. But I want to make a difference in youth in, the, in a way that's supporting them. And not just about us checking our boxes in our programming layout or our project planning layout. And so I'm going to push back when I feel like, when I look at this first list, it seems like a lot of things. And things are important, but um, I want to know wh how is that thing going to make a practical goal? And how are you going to measure that practical goal? Because if you don't have it, that's got to drop down to the lower tier. And, and, I, and I'm, I appreciate your work, but that's my priority. Commissioner Alper? Thanks. I, I just want to say um, that your presentation has, has broadened my perspective, and I also want to sit with the, the fact that I'm um, not indigenous, and, and uh, I have to say, I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh how, do I, how do I feel about these things? Um, and I think I have to sit with some of that discomfort. Um, and I, I also feel like I need to um, be authentic to to myself. And so when I think about what we can do, I sort of echoing what Commissioner Schaefer says, I want, I want to make sure that we're taking meaningful action. Um, and I, I feel like part of that means looking internally first, looking at um, within the park board, you know, it, how many indigenous staff members do we have? How many uh, place names do we have that are indigenous place names? Um, I really appreciate the naming policy being brought up. Um, does this mean we're going to put extra investments in parks and neighborhoods with high Native American populations? I, I would hope we would take really meaningful, meaningful action. Are we going to start, you know, have a piece of our team teamworks that's directed towards indigenous youth? I, I just, I want to be cautious with that. And then um, that we're not just putting up signs. That, that feels really disingenuous to me. Um, and not at all getting at this greater idea. And then last but not least, when we talk reconcil reconciliation, I, I think we would be remiss not to talk about the descendants of slavery. And I just, I think we're, we're really, uh, to single out one group for reconciliation. I just want us to be really cautious there. As a, as currently like 
a fully whiteboard. So are we, are we ready to embark on this work? I just, that's where I'm at. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. <clears throat> Thank you, President Forney. I, I just want to, I, I appreciate what my colleagues have said. I appreciate what Commissioner Schaefer said and what Commissioner Alper just said. Um, I was in a conversation yesterday about how, you know, sometimes we as people, we, we want to do right, but we also really, you know, it's the Minnesota nice. We really shy away from actually getting into hard spaces. So we do the things like signs and arts and conversations that are still, cult, you know, curated and, and the idea of bringing in youth and the impact, like what are the nuts and bolts impact on our neighbors? And I, most people know this, that I teach at South High. Um, some people don't know that South High actually is sort of a school within a school with all nations. Um, it is a, it is its own, it, it is within South High School, but it is also sort of its own space. Um, and every time I, the integration of, of the all nation students into sports teams, into activities, it becomes more and more of, a, of an integrated school. And I see us playing a role in, in kind of bridging that stuff. I mean, you guys probably know we've, we've, we've lost uh, former VP Cruda, but like, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, of that sports and youth sports bring people together in ways that other things can't. And so I'm just, Thinking about that, that I really appreciate what Commissioner Schaefer was saying and Commissioner Alper as well along that being impactful and being like practical, what can we achieve um, that is in that space. So I'm probably rambling, but those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, share, which is going to be in P's and C's, but um, I had the pleasure of <clears throat> honing my way into uh, one of the field tours um, from the American Society of American Landscape Architects, anyway, um, uh, convention this past weekend. And it was, um, it was called the, the Falls Initiative Tour. Um, also, um, Colleen O'Dell was able to be there. And it was a very powerful discussion um, that I, I feel this is what we're, we're talking about. Um, the naming of it was Connecting Process and Place. And um, I'm very excited about this particular initiative. Uh, for those of you um, who aren't aware of it, this is about the lock and dam um, at St. Anthony Falls and what that quote unquote disposition is going to be looking like. So uh, it's very exciting how that is moving. And I think the most powerful thing that I heard, which just seems in some ways trite, but it's so true, is just listening. That's what was repeated to us over and over again. And how important it is to be listening to um, those who have not been heard is really what it comes down to. So um, uh, how that all evolves is going to be um, very, very powerful and hopefully um, the same thing. It won't be performative, it will be action. Um, totally with that and I, I hope that we can resonate that throughout the system. So on that, um, I believe we can move on to our next uh, resolution to be proposed um, and I believe that Commissioner Musage might be moving that. <laughs> um, I would like to move the resolution that is not yet numbered. Uh, which is titled Resolution Establishing the Process and Timelines to Fill the Vacancy crea Created by Commissioner Crudup's Resignation as an At-Large Park Commissioner. Thank you. I'll, I'll second that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, did you have something? Oh, excuse I, me. Okay, oh, Commissioner Thompson. Yes, I would also like to move what I guess I would call an amendment to that unnumbered resolution to give guidance on our conversation. Uh, Point of order. Was this submitted Sorry. in advance? It, uh, I tried to. Did I do it the wrong way? Correct. OK, uh, then I won't move that. I will not say anything yet, but I might have to sub what suspend the rules. What you could do is make a motion to suspend the rules to consider an amendment. I would like to move to suspend the rules to consider an amendment. Thank you Second. so much. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 This oh, requires oh. a roll call vote. Oh, because thank it, you. It again. needs to be right. two thirds. Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Thompson. Yes. Commissioner Schaefer. Yes. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Menz. Aye. Commissioner Alper. Aye. Vice President Abene. Aye. President Forney. Aye. 
You have a court, or you have um, eight eyes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go right ahead then. Thank you. I, I hopefully everybody has this in front of them. I don't know if you'd like me to read the structure I had put forward. It really was just got to give guidance around our conversation of this task that I believe all of us want to accomplish in a thoughtful and also timely manner. Um, President Forney, I would I would ask for your guidance on if I should read it or not. You should read it. Okay. Yeah, I have it. No, no. No. Uh, this is what uh, Commissioner Thompson has. It looks like this, everyone. It looks. It's a three-page. Okay. Um, yeah. And are we talking about the resolution or are we talking about process? The, the, the resolution is, is to bring forth the process. The resolution itself is not really any different than um, what you would put forward uh, except for my uh, Exhibit A using that as, as uh, that we would use this rubric to uh, vet and find our replacement. Okay. So if everybody understood that as far as the resolution that was um, uh, submitted, um, that would stay intact. This first page, though, would not be. It is the Exhibit A, which has um, four steps So that we are discussing. Yes. Okay? All right. You want to um, speak to if, anyone? If, if, if you're looking at it, I would just like in, to put into the record by saying that we would have essentially four steps. We would start an application for, um, for members of the community. It would be open for one week, um, Friday to Friday with some questions that I'm sure we can discuss. Um, and then that we would then have from Friday to Monday where each of us would flag our, um, our top choices or those people that we would like to see interviewed. Um, and that if any applicant reaches a threshold of at least four concurring commissioners around their interview, then they will be selected to be interviewed. Um, so that we already sort of are in a conversation space of they have a, the support of four people. And then the interview would be pretty basic um, as President Forney had drawn out and then the, the step four of electing would be also the same. It's a lot to consume everyone, but as um, we know, um, uh, Vice President uh, Crudup has resigned. Um, and so I wanted to say it's big shoes to uh, fill Although in a lot of ways she <clears throat> had only a children's size shoe of a variety of sneakers. But it's really, really essential for her. Um, she represented the entire city um, as well as Commissioner um, Olson and myself and that we need to have that. Particularly we are um, involved in the most significant thing that we, well, besides um, appointing or hiring the um, superintendent our budget, and I think that it's very critical that this, we get this position filled as soon as possible. Um, and um, one thing I would add is if whether or not there are other questions people would like to have um, a part of this um, uh, application, whether or not we should have those submitted or not uh, would be one thing that I would consider because I really appreciate you know this format that um, this rubrics that um, Commissioner Thompson has put together. So, um, Commissioner, um, first of all, go to Commissioner Olson. Um, yeah, perhaps it would be an amendment to amendment or a separate amendment after we make it. Uh, but so as you know, one thing we all have in common here is we're all white <laughs> and on the questions we don't have any demographic uh, questions and so I really think having age race and sex would be important for determining who can fill this at large position um, it won't be the sole thing obviously but I really don't think we as a board could say that we are truly representing the city if we put up someone another white at large commissioner particularly if they're also I mean we have where they live here but um so maybe, I don't know the process, if we would do that later, how other folks feel about that. Um, but I, for me, that's going to be very important for my decision of who we should look into. I'll uh, we'll turn to Council Rice first, please. Uh, yes, and uh, thank you, uh, Madam President and uh, Commissioner Thompson, for bringing this forward. I know the board is under... Um, th this is an unexpected event, something that's all basically hitting us in the last uh, 72 hours, and it's a great loss to lose uh, Commissioner Crudup. 
Um, the board has had to fill this uh, or been a situation like this uh, four times that I can recall um, in the last 25 years. Um, and so it is important to fill it. I, I would urge uh, all deliberate speed um, because as we've indicated, you know, there's a vacancy. The president's talked about we got a budget coming up and we have holidays. We have a number of other things. I think that what uh, Commissioner Thompson brought forward is very good. I looked in the past times there has been kind of a uniform set of questions or at one time they let each commissioner ask a question or they submitted a question and each one would go around the table and ask there's some it's, it's kind of like a civil service interview if you all ask the, all the candidates the same question you get a chance to measure them up by some standard thing as opposed to well I asked you about this but not that so I think that what Commissioner Thompson's saying is very good about which would be kind of follow one I I looked at a resolution I think largely all of the resolved or whereas clauses have already been addressed in the resolution I think the timing on step one has been addressed on I'm looking at exhibit a I do think there's merit in trying to come to a, a group of uniform questions um, if the not eight people here can see if there's anything they either object to or missing that would be a good discussion to have um, as to the pre-selection this is very difficult. Any time the commission votes, any time you vote on anything publicly, it has to be a public vote. Um, and there has to be a record of those votes. So in essence, kind of a pre-screening or trying to say there's a minimum threshold of candidates to get there. I, I'm not quite sure how we could uh, accomplish that. It isn't a, it isn't a, I don't wanna say it's not a bad idea. I just think it's a practical thing about how you could uh, do it. I think certainly on an interview uh, basis or on a, on a voting basis, you could th set thresholds that much of you have seen in convention. You know, if nobody gets any votes, they're eliminated. Or you could do a drop rule at some point, um, or however you want to do it. I mean, l let me roll this back a bit. I, I think I did, uh, maybe I did or didn't send out a memo on this. The, the, this authority is, is somewhat, you, it, it's, it's unique in the city. The city council has a very clear charter process that's set out about when they can do it, when there's election, when there's an appointment. All our charter says is that when there is a vacancy, and there's a vacancy, the remaining uh, commissioners with six votes can reach a replacement. So of the eight remaining commissioners, it's not two thirds, it's really uh, seven, six or 75%. So it, it's going to take a high degree of unanimity to make an appointment. Um, and um, that's about it. We do have some past guidelines. I think the uh, resolution talks about notice that would get published by this Friday. It would leave it open for a period of over a week. You would get applications in. The uh, resolution also, as I read it, would allow the staff to make sure that that application maybe can answer some of the questions that Commissioner Olson said about asking for certain demographic uh, features. Uh, you could also, um, ask the candidates to um, respond to a preset of questions if we could agree on those quickly so you'd have some written things and then as well as interview and ask them so you have more information uh, at the time you sit down to consider the appointments and those could be shared uh, uh, publicly or, or looking at it um, let me see what else yeah so I and I would uh, I would encourage you all tonight to see if you can come up with some I know it may take a while, but some time spent tonight might save you time in terms of trying to get it resolved uh, within the next two weeks, if, if at all possible. Okay. Thank you, Madam President, if there's any other questions. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, thank you, President Forney. Um, in the past, we've been cautioned by legal counsel not to indicate that race is the key and sole factor in any hiring or business making decision. So I would ask my colleagues to think long and thoughtfully about the way that they, they talk about what we're trying to achieve um, through our appointment process. Uh, we do have a very diverse city and um, I'm hopeful that the candidate pool will reflect that on a personal level. Um, Council Rice, you've indicated to us that that we can't have secret votes. 
However, in this case, I, I would I, I appreciate what, what's trying to be achieved here, which is that we wouldn't be forcing people to come in for an interview that aren't meeting a minimum threshold of support. Um, because we do have a short timeline in which to do this and uh, we're, we're being asked to do so on a night that is already going to be a very long meeting night potentially for us since it is the night that we will be making amendments mm -hmm. to our budget. So uh, is there a mechanism for us to be able to achieve what, what the written um, step two is attempting to achieve? Like are we able to advance the the people that were interested in seeing interviewed and as long as there's a certain, um, I like guess as long as there's four commissioners that have said, yep, I want to interview this individual, we then can narrow it down that way. It would be then part of the public record or can we not do that at all? Um, Madam President, um, what I, I think any application unless you wanted to delegate your authority to either another group of commissioners or an individual, and I would, I would hesitate to say any other individual other than a committee. The Carter says the board, the, the, you, you people, yeah. from Commissioner Mans to Commissioner Olson, make the appointment. Nobody else. Yep. Um, the board could, if it wanted, uh, maybe uh, uh, pick, uh, I'm just making this up on the fly, you could designate uh, three among you or four or five or all of you to say they'll hold a meeting on, and review the application, say on the day before, on uh, Tuesday the 14th, and then from that the committee could vote and say we're going to advance these certain people to the board for an interview. I mean, ba based on the, say, looking at the paper, report if you could if you think the application would be sufficient to go and you could look through the papers and and probably do that uh, publicly and say okay we're gonna here's who we think could do it um, okay so we can't we can't do something via email saying yep here's people I'm interested in interviewing that could be then made public and we invite those people in that doesn't work it, it's a very good question um, and sitting here knowing what I know about the law in this area, I don't believe you could. It could be that you wake up tomorrow and say that, you know what, lawyers should have known more. But I, okay, sitting okay. here now, I don't know how that could work. So understanding that there's not a way for us to control the number of interviews that would need to take place, I don't know that I'm super excited to try to do that at our meeting on the 14th. Mm -hmm. It may make more sense and it it seems to me at the moment to make more sense for us to talk about um, holding those interviews and holding the vote at our first meeting in December, which is our only meeting in December. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing from my colleagues what they think about that idea. 14th is Tuesday. Yeah. I'm sorry. Right. It, it. I mean, go to um, Secretary Ringel. Not really. That's okay. <laughs> Um, President Forney, um, oh, I just wanted to add a couple of things that were related to some of the questions that have been added or asked is that, it, for example, when we do our applicants for the various committees that the board appoints people to, we do include an optional um, demographic section on that. We don't post that, but it's information that we, we have and then we're able to also look at, well, how are we doing in terms of overall recruitment? So that is something that is a practice of ours that could be used in this case as well. And we typically leave it a, optional to the applicant so that they're not forced to provide that data in order to be eligible to be considered for the position. Um, the other piece in um, Council Rice, I feel like in the past when we've done things like surveys to get priorities from commissioners ahead of meetings. The way we've navigated the open meeting law and uh, aspects around that is we make it all public so that, so that you wouldn't be able to select people and move them forward in private. You would have to select people and move them forward with the full knowledge of the community who you selected. But that's, and I don't know if it would apply to this case, but that's how we've, we've navigated that in the past. The last thing I will offer is you can also call a special meeting. So if you wanted to call a special meeting, say for the 14th, to be able to interview candidates, then you'd be able to have a free and clear 
15th. So, or you could do that in any variety of ways, but you can, you can call special meetings to do these interviews if you so choose. Thank you. Did anything more? Okay. Okay, losing track of everybody. Okay, uh, Commissioner Benny. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, first. Uh, thanks. Uh, you must be really good at you know thinking through steps and strategies for <laughs> processes because I think this is actually really good work and a good inclusion. Um, I was actually going to also ask what um, the secretary said about our committee process that we could deploy our committee application style process for receiving input from the community. And then um, and then I was hoping we could each maybe nominate three and then bring only those people in. Um, if we can't do that and we just have it open on, on some, at some meeting, I think we have to really think about then limiting the amount of time per person. And I, it's not great, but you know, maybe we won't have 40 people. So, um, and then the last thing is I would really have a strong preference for calling a special meeting. It could be before on the 14th. It could be later. Um, I hope that we would all have, find some availability. But um, I think that this is too important to rush before the meeting start time. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Alper. Yeah, first of all, I would like to say um, a huge thank you to Commissioner Thompson for putting this together. This is, I think, you know, I read the resolution and I was like, what, but what about the application? So this is, this is really great. I really appreciate it. Um, I would ask that we could change the word in question number two in the application form to say challenge instead of threat, if that's a, where does it say that? In two, what is it? Two, point number two, question oh, number two, under step one. Um, <laughs> uh, so that would be one thing. Um, and then I just, um, it seems like we have the interview question, or excuse me, we have the application questions, but then with, I didn't quite understand what you were proposing for the interview questions, if you could speak to that. Did you have a thought? Or I, I just, my thinking was to find a way to give community members and all of us a thoughtful way that if someone had a, a very pressing question of like, if you were on the board, would you, you know how people do, like how would you have voted on blah? Yeah, I mean, just throwing that out there, right? You, you, people do this, right? That, that you would have an opportunity to if we had culled down the amount of people that might be coming in. Um, that was, that's completely up to whomever wanted to say whatever, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so then it, reading this, just, I'm, you know, just, just saw it, so <laughs> thanks for bearing with me, but it, it appears that in this closed door session proposed on okay. November 14th, which I, I agree, I think we should have it as a uh, noticed meeting whenever that is if you know perhaps November 14th just to make it doable for um, uh, so if I understand in, in what you put together Commissioner Thompson that the idea would be at this meeting to make our final selection there which would then make the meeting on the 15th go smoother right the the, the intent was that on our own time and independent of other people in the room, we would submit our top 10 candidates, right? Or five to 10, right? And I'm go, I mean, maybe we get two people who actually, we know this is the hottest job in town, so who knows? Um, we might not, it might not be an issue, but if you do get a lot of applicants or a lot of people, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna guess you have similar things where I've had a lot of different people banding around names, reaching out to me. Um, that it would already kind of vet that process and if it was like an independent ballot, like I like these 10, not knowing how you guys are all choosing to do it and then if there's overlap, we say, okay, good, this is where we all already overlap. Let's interview those people because I feel like it would be valuable to our time, staff time, and their time um, and honor that space and honor them. I didn't realize, of course, I should have thought it that it has to be public open. So if, if there's a way that we could do that, whether it's having a meeting on the, on, on the Monday 
or Tuesday or whatever where we list our 10 publicly and we just, you know, submit it and we figure out who has overlap. I don't know, but like that was the intent so that we are more mindful of the um, interviews and selection process. Okay. Okay. If, if I may just finish up. Um, so just to say, I like the idea of what's in the, the application form and the dates and then I, I agree with the, if we can do the committee selection style for rating the top uh, between five and ten candidates and then we bring them in for an interview and I think that's the part that needs a little more like f fleshing out for lack of a better word in, t in terms of what maybe how long each interview is going to be and how many questions we're going to ask them and maybe even I don't know what those questions are or um, but otherwise I'm I, I think this is great and I I like the idea of us trying to I guess I guess the only thing I'm on the fence about is if we would deliberate at headquarters at that closed door session okay, okay well okay so it, that's I guess that's a question can it be closed or no no mm -hmm. no. no okay Thank you. Um, uh, secretary Ringel I think um, I'll have her speak to something president Forney I was just going to I hadn't noticed that closed door session suggestion in this before, so I was just going to make note that that wouldn't be a possibility. And I think in general, commissioners should think about the f that this is going to be interesting to people and important to be able to see what your moves are, so not be thinking of any of it being able to be confidential would probably be the way to start. Commissioner Thompson for... I don't know how many times. <laughs> oh, thank you, President. Roy. I, I just wanted to I wanted to uh, clarify with um, with Council Rice and then be able to maybe respond to Commissioner Musich's idea. But um, just bl bluntly asking the question now that you've heard a little more of the intent: Is there a way to achieve a public a public and you know well? well played, I don't know, my words are not the best right now, um, uh, where we don't have to interview everybody, where we can sort of put in our, our top choices and have, you know, perhaps our, our secretary say, like just literally line them up and say, okay, this person got four, we're calling them, this person got four, we're calling them. Um, is there a way to do that publicly where <laughs> where we don't have to be in the, in the meeting or do we have to have yes. an extra meeting? Yeah. Madam President, I mean, I, I would like to hear um, her, Alper, I haven't heard the other commissioners, but it seems to me what I'm hearing is a possible suggestion is that if the board was to hold a special meeting, say on the 14th, by then you'd have all the applications in. Those, they could be all made public. The commissioners could be immediately provided. The board could convene either a committee if you wanted. The president could always appoint a you know, review committee or the, all the commissioners, since you all make the decision, all have that responsibility, you come in, basically review the applications. You don't have to interview them, but then you could, as a public process, say, we want to interview tomorrow. If we follow it on the 15th, the other part of the resolution, we're going to interview. We talked about a 10-minute interview. If you met at 3, that's 12 people, but you could pick a number. I mean, Four to ten, or whatever number you want, and say, okay, we, we we're going to recommend that these number of individuals move on and be interviewed the next day, and you you would have some level of if you could get a, a good application that would you, incorporate your questions or others, you know, that you come up with tonight and put out, ask people to fill it out. It would be a lot of work on that day, but <clears throat> it would give you a chance to begin thinking about it as a group to talk about the names. Um, you could, uh, I, I looked at the past one, one time all commissioners got to ask one question when they were eight, you know, but they were kind of like assigned and predetermined, but you could all ask one. Each commissioner could say, okay, we're each gonna nominate one person, or we're going to just all vote and have a consensus, and if any of the candidates get, say, three votes, they could be considered uh, to be moved on. You could literally take a poll. There was a, a thing when, um, <coughs> Uh, they filled the vacancy for uh, Commissioner Schaefer's seat when Patty Baker died. There was a process like that where there were about a dozen applications and there was a vote about how many could go on. And so you could have every commissioner, you could make the rules up, we could do it here tonight. 
every commissioner had three votes and if uh, any of the candidates had, you know, three or four votes, they were moved on. Or you could look at it then and say, okay, we've got eight people that have all have three or four votes, so they probably at least possible to get to six. Um, and, and that would certainly be appropriate. I don't think you would, if, if we include that in the process tonight, nobody's being, you know, kind of screened out. Uh, you don't have to interview everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, that, yeah, the answer is yes. And if you wanted to do it in the timeline, I, I think the tension would be the budget decision largely gets made on the 15th, mm -hmm. which of course is a short period of time. You could also say, okay, we're just gonna set up a separate meeting, we'll do it on the 16th, or we'll, we'll, we'll pick some other date where the board would kind of get together maybe and pre-interview people and then do it. But the answer is yes, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, and you have enough time to notice a special totally meeting um, <laughs> within reason. Okay, thank you. Thank Commissioner you. Thompson, more? Well, I just think then, what, I guess what the, the conversation then comes down to, thank you, Council Rice, is um, do, how, when do we want to bring this person on? I mean, I know the ideal time would be the budget, and but that, I mean, bluntly, I, I stand by that. I would like to have that happen. But if I were <laughs> brand new, what a trial by fire. Like, welcome to the board, <laughs> and now we have a budget amendments. <laughs> so, I, like, I'm just, I guess I'm just posing an open question, and I'll tinker with my notes. Commissioner Menz. Um, so, can I... Council Rice, I'd, I'd like to have a couple of questions. So in, in the past, this has worked. There's, there's never been special elections for park board commissioners. Um, Madam President, Commissioner Mance, yes, that's correct. Charter uh, 6-3-C. Okay, so and refresh me because I, I, for some reason, did not get through my email or figure out what, <laughs> what this process has entailed in the past um, briefly. But it seems to me to the board, I mean, this seems like a very, very complicated process. And for me personally, what is the, what is the um, penalty or the difficulty in not having the seat filled until maybe December 1st, maybe January 1st? I think that Commissioner Musich mentioned. What, what is the legal ramifications of that? Um, Madam President, that's an excellent question. Um, and I'll just quickly review. We had in 1996, uh, uh, Commissioner Skip Gilbert died in office, uh, was filled at that time by Commissioner Ed Solomon. In 1997, Patricia Baker died and was filled by Vivian Mason. In 2021, Ernie Belton was appointed a federal mediator <clears throat> and it was an election year and he was filled and Tom Baker, a former commissioner from the North Side, filled the spot. And then in 2003, Commissioner Solomon, who was or pointed to fill the spot of uh, um, 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 Skip Gilbert died and uh, the board appointed Carol Kummer. Um, this now would be the fifth time. Um, there's been varying periods. I don't recall any that happened so close to the budget cycle because um, this literally is right on it. The other ones, there was maybe more space. They had it to happen earlier in the year. I, I think. Uh, Patty Baker's might have come late in the year, or it was or it was in January, and so there wasn't anything. There, not, there's not been none been right in this circumstance with the board. Um, the periods of time have varied. They've generally been a little bit more lengthened out. I do think this budget presents an issue. I mean, one thing we all know: Wash Washington, right? What's the consequence of not filling the Speaker of the House? I don't want to equate this spot, but but. This is a $156 million budget. This is not an insignificant decision that you're making uh, in, in terms of setting up a budget. And um, I wish I knew all the consequences. I've, I've been doing this job for about 40 years now and I've seen a lot, but there's always something new. And uh, you just don't know if, if it's, you want an odd number so that somebody has to make a decision. The charter actually says you have to vote. I mean, commissioners, an, an abstention is counted as a no vote, so that you know you need to have a, a tally that says something passed or something failed. Um, and it is possible. I don't wish ill to anyone, but if what if something happens to somebody else? I mean, then you all of a sudden it, it gets less functional. And I think I'm not kidding you about Congress. We've seen 
government dysfunction on a massive level there and, and delaying is yeah, I understand you also though as a group it's your right to decide what you think is prudent and reasonable and what you can handle at this time of year I'm just going to quote Council Rice um, there is a legal term that applies the law abhors a vacancy um, so as we're talking about this it, it does make me pause to think that we could be putting a commissioner on this board to vote on a budget that they have been very little a part of and they could be the deciding vote um, so in my opinion I'm more comfortable with a 4-4 and we have to work that out instead of somebody who we've just appointed making that and I, I don't think it might it might not come to that I don't think it's gonna come to that with the budget but it does feel rushed this is a really important process and I don't want to um, make the process I, I don't want to leave a vacancy obviously but in my opinion nobody is going to be able to fill our vice president's role in the next two months nobody nobody in nobody in this city probably on this planet will be able to step in and be vice president crudup and I think that pausing while we work through this budget might not be a bad idea and it might not be a bad idea to even go to have a either maybe a special election or because the voters are not very involved in this process at all and also thinking about we're going to make an election of officers I don't know if I want to put a commissioner in this spot trial by fire unless there may be a former commissioner who understands this process so Madam President, could I please make about the special election I've heard you mention that Commissioner Mintz. that question has been asked in the past when the last time there was a filling vacancy and again this would be the thing it would take about 90 days to get a special election for at large you'd be asking the entire city of Minneapolis to go out and vote likely in February at the earliest point at a cost of one hundred thousand dollars and that one hundred thousand dollars would be borne by the city clerk's office it, it for and, f and first off that's even if it's practicable to do it the second point is the law is the law the charter is the child we don't have a choice the, you, you have a you I'll, you know you have the re this board has the responsibility now to fill that vacancy <laughs> to change the charter you would have to get a unanimous vote of the city council 13 votes or you'd have to have an election to have a change to the charter so you would put the decision out for a long time and it, it it's a fair question it's been asked before and I'd be happy to share the opinion with you but it's the circumstance you find yourself in. it's, it's not a reality for now okay but I, I would implore us to think about those those things about putting a commissioner in November 14th they're putting budget that feels rushed unless we find possibly someone who has formerly served in this role and understands the process of the Minneapolis Park Board okay I think we're on Commissioner Fate Schaefer hi I'm really um, I think we can get this done I'd like to it's going to take some work I think for all of us in the next 10 days to two weeks um, I like this process what I would suggest is two meetings one very short that's public maybe zoom we probably can't do zoom but either Sunday night or Monday night and do them concurrently either Monday night Tuesday night or Sunday Monday have half an hour for the first one we've all read our applications we come cast our votes and then uh, we have a tally and it's announced publicly who will be making the next round and be participating in the interviews the next day on the next day I think these are great questions that Commissioner Thompson has laid out for the first um, for the first application process on the on the evening of the second day I would like to have a social time with all of the commissioners and the public that's there with the invited back interviewees mm -hmm. um, so that the public as well as us can have kind of a informal time of just chatting maybe 45 minutes may keep it short then whatever that number is we have a second set of questions and I think some of the questions that would be good to ask is what have been some recent um, decisions that we have made as a board that you've either agreed with or disagreed with mm -hmm. um, asking them some familiarity with our process and 
maybe even watching our meetings. Who knows? And then secondly, you know, how have you been engaged with our parks to date? Have you been a coach? Have you been a volunteer? Have you been serving in any capacity? Are you a runner, et cetera? Um, but have a separate list of questions that we all know ahead of time, and they have 24 hours to work on. Then we vote at that point. They're announced, and Commissioner, F I mean, President Forney can train them in on Tuesday to be ready for Wednesday. There you have it. Thank you. Commissioner Musich. Uh, oh, I had one other, I had one other question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I've got 57 seconds left. Um, if we have a tie, 4-4 for, for, for any of the commissioner, for, well, I guess we only have one position that's open. If we have a tie, 4-4, four, four, how does that happen amongst us as a group in a public setting? It fails because you need six. No. <laughs> Historian. Madam uh, uh, President, Commissioner Schaefer, it will take six votes to replace the, or to find, to appoint, uh, to fill the vacancy. Um, and I would say, and I've told this to other boards, this is a really great opportunity. You can look back at it. It's a very rare authority that you have as elected officials to replace yourself. It doesn't happen in the legislature. It doesn't happen in a city council. It is typical of many other elected bodies that are smaller that you make appointments at cities. It's a great opportunity. Um, I think back to when Carol Rollberg was governor and appointed uh, Walter Mondale as United States Senator. Mondale went on to be vice president and presidential candidate. I also know that uh, a, a good person I knew very well, Wendell Anderson, he appointed himself uh, to governor and it did not work out so well. So it's, a, it's an enormous responsibility that you all have to make kind of collectively what's the right decision for the city of Minneapolis. Um, and you're going to have to get um, I'm a lawyer. There's nine people on the Supreme Court. It would be, it would be nice if it, you're going to have to deliberate in public and figure out how you're going to pick somebody and you're going to probably disappoint some people who <laughs> are very good people and you're going to have to say, what's our best judgment? Um, there was a time when it did, uh, I've got it in the file here, there, there was a couple 4-4 votes in the past. Um, I'm thinking that if you do the process right and you get a lot of good ca candidates and S someone somewhere will step forward and, you know, uh, it'll work out. And you will all exercise your very best judgment and pick an extraordinary next new Minneapolis Park Commissioner. I still would like a question around the process. So if we all then have to cast a name versus a vote. So we all cast a name and then um, it's not determined by the six. What happens next? The, the Madam President, the board could adopt some rules and just like a drop rule, say, you know, that will the lowest person would be dropped and then you work your way up. Or um, it, what's happened before is a commissioner can nominate, I nominate uh, Miss Z, and then you see if there's eight votes for, or six votes for Miss Z, or Mr. Y. Um, or you could do, um, you know, that you, you okay, can do a, a voting system. That's helpful. That's maybe I, a I'm detail. I, I, but that's an important detail it that could we should be that all you could understand use ranked before choice voting, that evening. But that might get it more complicated. No, I, I really, I think that is a really important detail that we should all understand before we get to that point and however that is worked out amongst the leadership. Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Forney. Uh, so what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that the amendment, Exhibit A, is not going to work for us as written. Um, we're all, I'm hearing from us that we're all feeling pretty good about step one, but we would like additional questions added. Um, and I'm not seeing any objections at the board level from the few questions that uh, Commissioner Schaefer has suggested we add. I didn't hear any, any objections to us requesting demographic information as we have done with our committees. Um, if I'm wrong about that, I hope people turn on their lights and tell me. Um, I am hearing that step two, three, four, not working for us. Uh, so I would like to suggest, and I don't know about what everyone else's life is like, but I can't make three meetings in one week work with my life. I cannot do that. Um, I do have a, I have a day job. I work a lot of hours. I can't make three extra meeting, night meetings work. Um, I could probably make one extra meeting work 
and I think it might make sense for us to say um, the evening prior to our November 14th board meeting, if we feel, 15th. sorry, 15th meeting um, on November 14th, that we would potentially hold a open house where we invite the public, anyone who's applied, and also all the commissioners to attend, starting at 5 p.m. perhaps. For an hour, we will socialize with each other. Then at 6 p.m., we could all sit down together and have a discussion about who we want to interview formally. Uh, we then would advance a slate of people we want to interview that we could all agree upon and notify those people we need them to come back on the 15th for their interview. Um, that way we would understand what the time commitment would be. People would understand what we're asking of them um, and what the timeline would be. And it would also provide, a, provide us with that opportunity to ensure there's some consensus around the interviewees so we're not wasting people's time. Um, so I'm interested in hearing what people think about that potential change to what's in front of us now. And if there is some openness to it, I'm, I'm willing to um, make a friendly amendment, although I don't know that I can do that. I might need to <laughs> make an amendment to the amendment. I have to ask for some information. But first, I'd like to understand what people think of, of that potential idea. If it's OK, I'd like to interrupt and, and say, um, we need to go to other other committees, and one of them we need to then come back to the full board. My suggestion is that for each one of us is to craft, you know, what our thoughts are, and we come back and we conclude with those um, at the end of our full board meeting. Is is my thought? I think that we're. I, I feel like we're getting the consensus here. Um, and you know, small things like you know, instead of threat, putting challenge. You know, taking out in closed door. Everybody, please go and do their diligence on this. I think is what I would um, sense um, uh, might be the most productive. Um, Secretary uh, Ringel. I was just going to clarify. So then we would be leaving it open. We would be leaving this question open in the situation where the rules are suspended to consider this amendment. Right. That's where we. So we'll leave it open and we'll pick it right back up there. That's my feeling. If that's, um, I'm seeing nods from people. Great. Okay. So um, we will, um, I believe, yeah, we're at the point of just um, recessing and going back then now to admin and finance. Let's again, we're coming back to conclude this particular quote unquote resolution um, when we come back. Reports of officers. No, we're, we're not doing that I, I'm after. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay, so back to admin and finance. 731, I would like to reconvene the Administration and Finance Committee. How exciting. Um, we have several resol re resolutions before us tonight. Um, would anyone like to move them? Or I can certainly do that as well. We shift our brains. How about I will move resolution 2023-196 for consideration a resolution approving a lease from the city of Minneapolis and granting a sublease to the Minnesota Streetcar Museum relating to Minnesota Streetcar Museum's use of property within Bidet McCoska Park located in the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park. Would anyone like some sort of background on this? Seeing no, oh, Commissioner Benny. Uh, Vice President of any. <laughs> Sorry. They, oh, thank you, Co-Chair Thompson. I'm not on this committee, but I did want to just briefly say, I, I don't need a presentation, but um, <laughs> this has been a, a long time in the making and something that's been re uh, really important for the Streetcar Museum to have accomplished. And the city was uh, very much involved, as was as were Park Board uh, planning staff. So thank you very much. I think this is going to streamline their great uh, program for our, our city. So thanks. Oh, Commissioner Menz. I had a question about the um, the lease being zero. Is that do we do that with other many leases that we have out there with uh, different groups? Like that we don't charge any money for the lease; we just lease it to them. I haven't seen that. Um, let's see, Co Co Chair Benny. I'm, I'm sorry, and then Me. Chair um, Co uh, Commissioner. 
men's. Um, there are a number of leases in which we don't actually have charge for the, the lease. And this one has a historical value, as you can tell, and this has been a mm -hmm. long standing lease in which we've had with the Minnesota Streetcar Museum. So it has, as you can tell from the background, um, historical uh, use and interest. Uh, and then they, we've had a long term relationship with the Minnesota Streetcar Museum. And it's uh, also a use for our park users in terms of tr being transported from the Bay Macasca portion to Lake Harriet, and especially during the Memorial Day um, holiday. That's another purpose that I'm aware of. We also have the um, president, I believe, of the Minnesota Streetcar Museum, if you'd like to ask him questions regarding that. But that's my understanding. And as you can tell, it's a very long standing um, relationship we've had with the would, would the staff be able to provide a list of those places where we provide? I mean, I think it's a great benefit. I don't. Think that <laughs> it would some. be so. Oh, really? It's that it, long. I mean, there are many okay. different. Then forget it. Within the system that we have, those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Seeing no for the lights. Um, all those in favor of resolution 2023-196, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Would anyone like to move our next resolution of the evening? I can move it. Thank you. Resolution 2023-175, resolution accepting capital project grant award from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization in the amount of $419,960 for contaminated and or unregulated soil removal, native planting, soil stabilization, and vegetation establishment and maintenance along the Mississippi River Bank as part of the 26th Avenue Overlook and Ole Olson Park Trail Connection Project. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions on this or would like to see a presentation? Seeing no lights, I will uh, ask all in favor of resolution 2023-175, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. That motion carries. I'll move resolution 2023-194, resolution approving a new lease agreement with the Minneapolis Parks Foundation for office space on the second floor of the Longfellow House within Minnehaha Regional Park for the period of January 1st, 2024 through December 31st, 2024 with two one-year extensions at the rate of $1,070 per month for the first term. Seeing no lights, I will simply ask for a vote. All those in favor of resolution 2023-194, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. I'll move resolution 2023-199. Resolution approving a donation agreement between the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and the Minneapolis Parks Foundation for work related to the pool house at Lupient Water Park, part of Northeast Athletic Field Park. Uh, yes, Commissioner Menz. Um, I did want to speak to this amendment or this uh, resolution. So my question, I, I was, this is, thank you to the staff for getting this done. This, this is money that's coming from uh, Barbara Lupient and the Parks Foundation has housed some money and there's some repairs that are needed at the, at the in the women's bathhouse. Uh, I'd like to know what happens if once the study is done that the cost comes back over $450,000. What's our process at that point? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Menz, even in some of the initial work that we're doing, we're beginning to frame the costs and so we're, we're starting the process rec recognizing the dollars we have to work with and working toward that. If we come to the point where we actually bid a project out that's been approved by the board and can concept and we're over, we'll have to look at some strategies for reducing the cost of the project and bring it back in line or bring additional dollars into the project. But from what I understand, we anticipate that it will work within that budget? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Menz, um, I, I would say at this point that even in the very early work that we've been doing, uh, we would recognize that improvements can be made to the restroom itself within the project budget. But we've identified some other strategies that the park board itself would probably want to pursue and implement for the purposes of improving surveillability of the restrooms and just safety of the park users. So it's likely that the project that we ultimately uh, move forward with will be more than the dollars that um, we've talked about in this donation agreement, but I've already started working with Superintendent Bangora to identify a source of those funds because they really begin to identify ways that we can 
surveil people who are entering restrooms that are completely blind to staff today and begin monitoring uh, the uh, splash pad area, which is completely blind to staff uh, in the manager's office and the staff, uh, area, staff, uh, staff portions of the building today. Okay. And the last question, I saw that it seemed like the feasibility study was coming from the donations already at the Park Foundation. Am I correct with that? Uh, the chair design? Chair Mons, that's correct. And does the, is the donor aware of that process? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer. Yes, I just had a couple questions related to kind of the dynamics that are described in the contract itself. First of all, this is really exciting and um, I'm thankful for the Minneapolis Parks Foundation for, um, for this initiative. Um, it says that the foundation and the park board need to co-approve the design. Maybe you can just tell me, is that a formal process? I know it's a formal process for us, but is it a formal process for the Minneapolis Parks Foundation? And, and then what happens if, you know, there's a disagreement in the design and how is that worked out? Chair Thompson and Commissioner Schaefer, I'll, I'll let uh, Mr. Evers come forward and talk about it too, but um, the, the, the way that we've been working at it so far, and we have been working at this for quite a while, yeah. is to come to agreement all the way through. I think the, the main thing is to make certain that we are satisfying the goals of the donor and meeting the, the financial parameters of, do, of the donation. Um, th operationally, I think that the, the foundation will look at us as being the ones who are the determiners, but there are some parameters around their donation that they need to be able to satisfy. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer, uh, Chair Thompson. Uh, Chair, uh, think, uh, so yeah, really the, uh, our approval would be the approval of you all and the donor's agreement that yes, this fulfills it. We do have a meeting coming up in December in which we're gonna share the plans and get like, yep, this makes sense. And really what her uh, intent was, one is when the uh, water park was built, the, the pool house was never improved and so it's really aged over the years. And it's something that she really was hoping would have been done a long time ago. So um, this last pledged gift was if something can be done, she would make the pledge, but she didn't wanna make the pledge with uh, unending deadline. So it would be pretty straightforward. Great. Thank you. I had a couple other questions here. Um, just if you could just talk about the fee that the Minneapolis Parks Foundation received on this gift. Do you have, I mean, I'm assuming it was your regular yeah, process. Yeah. yeah. And it actually, this one was, this is, you know, the, the program fees are, are, uh, very, we take up, we, uh, reserve the right to take up to 15% of a gift of a donor designated, or if we do a campaign, we build in 15% <laughs> to pay for the campaign. In this case, um, she has been making gifts over the past many, many years of about a hundred thousand dollars each year that have really gone to, um, swim lessons, lifeguard training, and we've taken a, a modest fee on that. Um, the 300 that we're holding on to, we haven't taken a fee off of yet. And so um, we'll ultimately take less than 15, maybe 10% of the fee just for the work we've been doing over the time. But um, mm -hmm. at this point, we haven't taken any because we wanted to make sure there's a solution path before we did. Well, and I really appreciate that because, you know, as commissioners, we always love to see the maximum amount of dollars go directly to a project. But also, I really appreciate the work that your group does as well. But I would like to get an understanding of Eventually, not now, yeah. but and eventually of how you make that determination of what fee you charge or may not charge, and is there a sliding scale depending on you know the dollar amount? But that's something that maybe you're in process with, or I'm not sure. Good question. Well, I would say it's definitely, um, and as we're in a bigger conversation about the relationships yep. of the organizations, it's one that's been evolving over the years. So my answer three years ago would have been different than. 10, 10 years ago than it will be in the future, but it is definitely something we're trying to, to um, right size. Great. Um, and then this is just a curiosity question because I noticed in there, mm -hmm. why does the, why does Minneapolis Parks Foundation um, get sent some of the invoices and why does the park board place pay some of the, in, it looked like you guys paid the design consulting fees and then the rest of the project came back to the park board. And I'm, so I'm, I'm wondering why there's this yeah, yeah, that, invoicing. Yeah. Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Schaefer, uh, I wanted to make certain in the contract that um, the Parks Foundation was aware of how we're paying the, the consultant for the work and that we don't, um, we're managing the work, they're paying for it. So there should be some uh, balance in how we review the invoices. This is a consultant, uh, BTR Architects, that we've worked with before. We have confidence in them and how they uh, provide their invoicing. I don't think there's going to be an issue, but I didn't want to, there to be a question 
as we move forward in the project about what the what the architect's fees were covering. Okay, so this is a normal process that in a partnership with you guys, you might kind of maybe there's no Chair normal. Thompson, <laughs> Thompson, I don't, uh, Mr. Schaefer, I don't know if there's a normal process. Yeah. This is one that seemed fair as for someone who's giving us the dollars to make this work. Yeah, and I, w I would just add that since we are holding on to part of the funds already for this purpose, mm -hmm. it's just as easy for us to do. But we don't want to do it where it's just, it's really, this is a park board project. So this is such a big gift, such an important project that we wanted to make sure you all said yes before we went ahead. But we're, we're, we're able to just make that payment to them. Great. So, Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Evers. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Uh, seeing no, no other lights, I will just add, um, being a, an aquatics aficionado back in the day. Lupian is, is very, very similar to North Commons in terms of its aging infrastructure, in terms of how it kind of got a, you know, a little bit of lipstick put on it about 20 years ago, but it's basically the same place that it was when it was built, I think in 71, maybe somewhere around there. Um, so I really appreciate any TLC we can get to that place as we are looking for what goes on with our pools. So. Um, so, oh, yes, Commissioner Menz. Can I ask one more question? Um, maybe this is a, uh, a deputy, it's Secretary Ringgold. So with this large donation, I mean, I don't think that any naming rights have come up because it's already named Lupient, but it's named Jim Lupient, and this is another. W would this be, ever be able to be, like, would we ever be able to leverage more money for a naming, or is that something that we're going to be discussing over the next year? Um... Thank you, Chair Thompson and Commissioner Menz. Certainly at any point right now, commissioners can take an action to name something for any type of financial um, contribution. You've got several examples in the system where that has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, staff uh, recommendations to date would make sure would be to make sure that that financial threshold is significant. Yep. Um, like 50% or more of the actual asset. <laughs> and we would hope that you'll approve something to that effect in the future to make that make that easier. But right now, you would be doing it based on your own discretion within, you know, with likely with staff recommendation, but you don't have a policy to fall back on. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, seeing no other lights in the Secretary Ringgold was gonna add something more. No. Just, uh, just triple checking, thank you. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Um, on to our next resolution. Anybody want to read it off? Sure, yeah, go for it, men's. My computer anymore. 2020, resolution 2023-200. Uh, resolution approving amendment number two to access agreement with the Metropolitan Council for the placement of Pazometers. Pazometers on Parkland during the jurisdiction of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, extending such agreement until December 31st, 2025. I must admit, I felt like an English language learner, which I teach a lot when I was trying to pronounce that word. I will second that. <laughs> I didn't know how to pronounce it either. Yes, Commissioner Music. I need to second it. So I apologize for seconding <laughs> in committee. I forgot we were still in committee. It's um, my new favorite word. Pesometers. Pesometers, yes. Um, wow. I cool. got to know all about these <laughs> via the Hiawatha project as well as the groundwater study mm -hmm. in my district. Um, they help us to understand where groundwater levels are and what the flow rate is and how that changes over time. So it's cool sciencey stuff that we get to be involved in um, <laughs> here at the parks. And that was really all I wanted to do, was just play teacher for a second. Excellent. <laughs> OK, seeing no other lights about the piezometers. Did I say it correctly? Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Moving I'll, right I'll, give, uh, I'll give Commissioner Menz you a go break, for it, and I will Mewes. read <laughs> resolution 2023. I will move resolution 2023-2001. Wow. Almost. Two, two, oh, yeah. 201. Yeah. <laughs> it's a resolution extending construction permit PB 
2023, originally issued administratively to the Metropolitan Council for a period of less than 180 days for work related to the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project near West 21st Street and occupying parkland within the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park. With the extended construction permit being valid until December 15th, 2023 and waiving fees related to the temporary occupancy of parkland, recognizing the benefits of improvements to parkland occurring as part of the Metropolitan Council's work. I believe, yes, Commissioner Co-Chair Schaefer has an amendment. Yes, if there are no questions, I'd like to move an amendment, please. Um, just for those of you that do not know where West 21st Street is, it is the street that crosses the light rail and extends into the neighborhood between East Cedar Lake Beach and East. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole resolution. I'm going to just read the highlighted pieces that I added within the resolution. Whereas the early agreed upon improvements are significantly delayed and partly necessary due to project impact, whereas accessibility to East Cedar Lake Beach, the Cedar Lake Woods, and the nearby residents' home is significantly affected by this work. Whereas project work was inactive for many weeks within the original permit timeframe, demonstrating a lack of urgency to minimize impact for park users and residents. Whereas extending construction permit PB150-2023 requires additional staff time to investigate changes and write appropriate board resolutions. Whereas extending construction permit PB150-2023 requires additional consumer, oh, consumers, commissioners <laughs> and board time meeting for consideration. Mm -hmm. Then just striking the waves all fee um, phrase Resolved, Metropolitan Council pay temporary easement fees of $1,118.83 related to the occupancy of parkland for the duration of the construction permit PB150-2023 and direct fees to MPRB planning department in usual manner. Any questions about the amendment? As I'm, I'm, You're moving that amendment, I'm, I'm sorry, correct. I didn't put this, wasn't correct. okay, perfect. No question? No, commission, you do. Commissioner Olson does. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, I feel like we've had dis discussions on, on similar fees and charges on similar issues. I just don't agree with charging partners in this sort of situation. Uh, you know, we've had this disagreement in the past, <laughs> so I won't be supporting it. Um, yeah. Commissioner Menz. Um, I, thank you, uh, Chair Thompson. Um, Commissioner Schaefer, thank you for putting forward this amendment. I actually agree with this amendment. I think that there has been some, a little bit of negligence in not making it so that it's timely. And we did, from what I understand, we did waive the fees and now we're just trying to charge them for the extra. I think that that's, that's a completely appropriate way to act, um, even as jurisdictions. That we, we, we're on a timeline too. We have staff time that needs to be done, so I, I fully support this amendment. I think it's a nominal fee, and it's and it, but it also sends like this message that, hey, we're willing to work with you, but we've got some timeline issues that we got to work together on. Seeing no other lights, um, per the amendment, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion, that amendment carries. Now to the resolution as amended. Seeing no lights, uh, I will take that for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. You're doing such a good job, you guys. More. I will move resolution 2023-202. Mm -hmm. A resolution approving the first amendment to the cooperative agreement COM 0005394 between the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, Bassett Creek Watershed Management Commission, and the City of Minneapolis to better align reimbursable construction construction expenses with the time frame for construction completion of the water quality improvements <laughs> project at Brimmar Meadows Park. Any questions on this one? Seeing no lights, uh, all those in favor of resolution 2023-202, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries, and I believe we are to the added resolution, correct? Would yes. you like to read that, Commissioner Schaefer? Yes, I would like to move the resolution entitled, Resolution Directing Staff to Investigate the Potential for Acquisition of a Portion of 3701 Wyzetta Boulevard. 
Hennepin County parcel ID number 290-292-432-0004 for use as parkland within Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park. I'm going to read through this just for the record and then um, as you have questions, um, Assistant Superintendent is available to ask them, answer them. Whereas the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board was created by the Minnesota Legislature in April 1883 and has the authority to acquire parkland with six votes by the Board of Commissioners. Whereas in or around 1952, the Board of Park Commissioners entered into an agreement with the encouragement of the City Council to dispose of parkland in an effort to retain Prudential Life Insurance Company of America as an entity operating within the city's corporate limits. Whereas under such agreement, Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board sold 26 acres of parkland near Brownie <coughs> Lake for a little less than $200,000 for the purposes of constructing and operating offices supporting Prudential's operations. Whereas the property was conveyed properly to Prudential and is now addressed as 3701 Wyzetta Boulevard. Whereas Prudential built and operated in an office building, which today is a multi-tenant office building. Whereas Prudential's focus on the creation of office uses supporting its operations allowed for a portion of the property to remain undeveloped. Whereas the property was recently the subject of a subdivision pro proposal, which would have resulted in a second parcel containing undeveloped land. Whereas the, un the subdivided parcel should it have been approved by the city of Minneapolis, would have been proximate to Brownie Lakes as part of the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Parks. Whereas the undeveloped portion of the parkland conveyed to Prudential is desirable as parkland and would be considered a restoration of parkland through an amendment of long range plans for the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park. Whereas the resolution is supported by Parks for All MPRB Comprehensive Plan 2021 through 2036 under Goal 2. Steward a continuum of nature and recreation in Goal 3. Provide core services with care. Resolved that the Board of Commissioners direct staff to investigate the potential for an acquisition of a portion of 3701 Wyzetta Boulevard for USS Parkland within the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park and resolved that the President and Board and Secretary are authorized to take all administrative actions to implement this resolution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Co-Chair Schaefer. Um, we were talking about this earlier today. Would, does anyone have any questions? I know Assistant Superintendent Schroeder probably has some fun tidbits, but would you like to come up and, and share with us? Uh, Co-Chair Thompson, I don't have anything but except to share where this is if anybody's mm -hmm. wondering where it is. So right, on the on the diagram in front, you can see 394 running kind of uh, across the screen. Cedar Lake to the bottom and that little piece of water just to the northwest is Brownie Lake. So I don't know if you can see this, but I'll, I'll go to the... So this is where the Prudential office building is built on 394. You can see it better here. Here is the office building and it's this triangular piece of property which was proposed recently to be subdivided and developed with another use. So the total parcel is about 20, a little more than 26 acres or somewhere around 26 acres. Uh, this would be a fraction of that that was uh, disposed of by the Park Board in 1952. And I'll, I'll, I'll stand for if there are other questions. Commissioner Menz. What would the, how would this change any sort of Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. How would this change any sort of staff time allocated to this? What, what do you anticipate as, because I know planning staff is already really overwhelmed and takes a lot of time. Um, maybe I should save to Commissioner Musa your question. So how would the staff time be impacted by this resolution? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Menz, uh, this is a question that I've been asked a few times in the last couple of weeks. So uh, it will either have almost no impact on staff time if they say we're simply not interested in selling it after trying to subdivide it, or it could be a fairly significant impact on staff time, but we would look at it as framed in the resolution as a restoration of parkland that was once disposed of and not put toward its original purpose. And I think that's a worthy reason to be pursuing this. This, this was originally, just so, so folks will understand, this parcel was originally part of Glenwood Park before even uh, Highway 12 was there. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was part of parkland before. It was part of a, what became a Theater Worth Regional Park. Um, we're, we're proposing that it would become 
part of Browning Lake. We already own the land around Browning Lake, and it, it would prevent other development from happening around develop, around Browning Lake, which has some fairly unique and sensitive uh, water issues associated with it. So there, there would be good reason for directing staff time to an acquisition should a path become available to us. My other question would be, um, maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I've missed this, but I, have we, do we do land acquisition resolutions through admin and finance, or is that plan? I mean, I, I, the resolution seems a little out of place committee-wise. Tell you why I put it there. It basically because of the staff time. Right now, we're not planning to buy any property. We're not planning to submit anything other than allocating, which has dollar impact, um, some portion of staff time. So that is why I. That was my thought process as admin finance chair. Thanks. And chair, okay. chair, chair Thompson, and Commissioner Menz, I'll, I'll just note that if there is a path here then there would be a new resolution brought back to the board to consider <coughs> directing staff to pursue an acquisition. Um, President Forney. Thank you, Chair um, Thompson. Um, thank you for considering um, doing this or amending um, whatever. <laughs> but I need to uh, do a big shout out. Um, uh, Council member um, uh, Goodman alerted me of this uh, a few months ago and it was up um, potentially to be subdivided and, and brought forth um, to the Planning Commission. She was able to avert um, that and that is why we started looking into it. Um, if this would be something that we would be potentially acquiring, there are options. Uh, one of them is the developer could possibly even donate. So um, just realize that um, all things are being considered, but um, I, I just have to do a big shout out to Council Member um, Goodman for averting um, the subdivision. Thank you. Seeing no other lights, I'll just add this is a very <coughs> exciting thing to me, the prospect. Anytime we can reclaim parkland in decisions that were made long ago um, in a galaxy far, far away, or just the land. Um, so seeing no other lights, uh, all those in favor of resolution unnumbered, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries, which brings us to the discussion item. The superintendent's recommended budget. Director Wiseman, thank you. <clears throat> so, you demand that you have a line in hand, Thompson's questions, and any other questions. So, I have a really long presentation for you this yeah. evening. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good evening, uh, Chair Thompson and commissioners. Uh, we are all present this evening to um, answer any questions that you have, uh, provide any input uh, that you need, but also, most importantly, we are here to listen uh, to your uh, conversation and your suggestions for the 2024 budget. So before we get started, I do want to point out that you all received a hard copy of the commissioner questions and attachments. And unfortunately, I personally made a couple of mistakes in this document. Um, so for question 29, I forgot to add the attachments. Um, so those now have been added. And then uh, you have an attachment four, but I inadvertently left off item 58, which is directly related to attachment four. So those corrections have been made. We've um, updated the website. Uh, with this document, I've also emailed you a, an electronic version of this document. And then I will also say that item number 58 
um, since this was my error, I wanted to get it in front of you this evening, but I'm also going to include it again on the November 15th question and answer document to just make sure I'm following um, board policy on that. So for people in the audience, you have the superintendent, the executive team, all the directors of or representative from the departments. I'm going to leave this document at the podium in case you need to refer to it uh, when questions are asked. And with that, I'm going to open it up um, to the committee. I see uh, Commissioner Musa has her light on, but I will, as she's in another conversation, I will open it to Commissioner Elper. Thank you. I'm not on this committee, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I have a few um, comments or questions, and I guess I'd like to start off with uh, the fees associated with Phillips Aquatic Center. And I was there just the other day, and I wanted to note that um, there's a $5 daily fee, but I, I bought a pass, 10x pass for $25, which so discounted pass, but I'm not seeing that in the fee schedule. Could you speak to that? Thank you, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Alper. We'll, I will check on that and make sure that that fee schedule is updated properly. It could have been an omission. Great. And then while we're speaking of that, um, just to say, you know, I know there's a lot of talk in here about youth programming, free youth programming, and how we're going to pay for it. And I just, how are we uh, tracking when people visit the pool and use a pass? How are we? Are we? Chair Thompson, Commissioner Alperi, everyone that goes into Phillips Pool should be getting checked in at the front desk, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't think ActiveNet has a way to check people off with that 10 time pass. Um, good evening, uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Alper. ActiveNet does. Uh, <laughs> we've been working with staff when we re-implemented um, ActiveNet 2.0, as we've been calling it. Um, with uh, different membership packages. So we are still working through implementation of that across the board, um, and we are uncovering areas um, that have been doing um, things in one way, and we are trying to systematically um, provide solutions across the agency in another way. So um, the membership module of ActiveNet does have the functionality to sell a multi-punch pass, if you will, and that be validated and kind of tick off until those punches are have all been used. Um, we can do it at a discount. We can do you know the the pass that you mentioned. Um, that all of that functionality exists with an active net. Okay, cool. Um, I don't want to take up my time on this, so maybe maybe there could be like a secret shopper that goes in and checks on this because I haven't had that same experience uh, like as of this weekend. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks. And, um, you know, even like looking at the resident, non-resident fees, I guess I'd really like to request a, the, a review <coughs> between leadership staff and front desk staff at the pool to see which of these fees that we're seeing in our budget book are still applicable related to Phillips Aquatic Center and which ones simply um, don't exist. Um, I have a question about number 49, uh, East Phillips Master Plan. Could you just... Um, um, uh, uh, Director Arvidsson, could you clarify your response related to my question? Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> First thing I've said this evening, I have to clear my throat. Uh, Chair Thompson, <laughs> Commissioner Alper. Jennifer, sorry. Secretary <laughs> Ringgold. <laughs> Chair Thompson, Commissioner Alper. Um, Commissioner Alper, can, can you um, note the question number again? Oh, 49. 49. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I need to remind myself of what this question was and how I responded. Oh. Take so, your time. Sure. Um, so in an earlier year, of the CIP, which no longer shows up in the version you have, there was also an allocation <laughs> for master plan and implementation, not plan implementation, because we're doing a master plan right now with that money. 
um, the allocation that exists in 2025 is also listed as master plan and implementation, but it's most likely going to be implementation because we're not going to use all of the 2022 money to complete the master plan. So once we complete the master plan, um, or park plan, if you will, there will be money left over in the 2022 allocation, and then also the entirety of the 25 allocation for implementation. Those projects that are listed as implementation are when we build things that come out of an overall park plan, and then we work with the community to determine exactly what those things are gonna be. So we do a prioritization effort, both internally and then also with community partners to figure out which of those things in the master plan with the budget that we have can be built right away. The play area and site improvements is sort of a different, in a way, a fund under NPP 20. And it's actually focused on rehabilitation of our oldest and worst playgrounds. So each year in the CIP, we put in three or four specific playgrounds in specific parks that we know are the oldest and poorest quality. Last year in the CIP process, we did a lot of work to try to, to, try to align those playground plot projects with implementation projects so that we could do a bigger project all at once and only inconvenience the public one time. And so in the case of East Phillips, we were able to align those things. So what it means is that with both 2022 and 2025 money, once the master plan is adopted by this board, we will implement a large project at East Phillips Field that will necessarily include the playground and will also include other elements of the master plan. Great, so when you say long range plan in the staff response, could I substitute master plan? Y you like could, that and probably we should, every time I said master plan, we should substitute long range plan or park okay. plan. So We're like working to move away from the term master plan. Um, master plan, long range plan, park plan should all be considered synonymous. It's the drawing that you adopt that is the vision for that particular park. Great, thanks. I think it's just the, the mismatch between the, the um, what's how the planning effort at East Phillips is, oh, is being described and how it's referenced in the CIP is what I was wondering. Um, okay, I am wondering about, um, could you talk to me about 51, question 51, how the dollar amounts get calculated for the CIP and could you, could you speak a little more about that? Yes, um, Chair Thompson, uh, Commissioner Alper, um, there's a couple of different ways that we standardize allocations within the CIP. So question 51 um, relates directly actually to the playground or the play area rehabilitation again. And so we have um, a, a baseline number that we know it generally takes to replace a playground. And each year we escalate that by a factor that's meant to keep up with inflation. So um, in uh, 2029, um, that number is $550,000 and each of the play area projects in 2029 get that dollar amount. In 2028, it's a little bit less. In 2027, it's a little bit less. Um, so that's the, those are the standard amounts we use each year for the play area projects. The plan implementation projects are a little bit more complicated. Um, we've uh, defined all of the parks in our system by tier. There are tier one, two, and three parks, which are based on the size of the park and the amount of amenities that they have. And those tiers are noted in your CIP for the new projects that come into the CIP. The tier has a baseline number that again is escalated each year. And then a park can get a bonus for whether it has a recreation center and or whether there's significant change envisioned in a park plan, which would cost more money to implement. So this was all part of a park funding normalization effort that took place probably before you came into office. Um, but it allowed us to invest essentially the same amount in the same types of parks though we escalate them each year to make sure that we're keeping up with inflation. 
that effort actually led to some secondary allocations to some parks that had been previously underfunded like east phillips which is why east phillips had a twenty twenty two and then a twenty twenty five to sort of make up what had been underfunded based on its standard allocation great i hope that rosetta stone of um, the cip could perhaps be be, be noted for us somewhere um, in writing uh, thank you for that i have very little time but i would note I have more than 30 seconds because of timer running on. Um, uh, just to, thank you very much. Um, I would like to say I'm really interested in the Eloise Butler 0.75 moving up, and I think this would be a great opportunity to partner with Minneapolis Public Schools um, on a position. They have so many open positions. Could they pay for the 0.25? And we pay for the 0.75, and they go one day a week during the school year to Bryn Mawr. I don't know. It's already happening. They're bringing second graders and third graders there, right? It sounds like so. Could be could be an easy easy in. Oh. There are a lot of anyway. So that's one last. And then I have one other thing, really quick, just to say that the neighborhood park amenity fund, which is on 50, that that's one. I just want to let you know that I'm very interested in shade structures. I've talked with you all about that before. I've mentioned that, and I'm working with staff to come up with um, a, a, an amendment. Um, to, that would allow that to happen and us to incrementally add shade structures in parks using park dedication fees or other funding. So look for that next week. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Elbert. Oh, although I appreciate your enthusiasm as an employee of Minneapolis Public Schools, I promise you they did not have money for any other new things. But I'm, it's nice ideas. Um, Commissioner Musich, you have been so patient. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Chair Thompson. I apologize for being distracted and not getting to speak when, <laughs> when you first started questions. Thank you for coming back to me. Um, I have a question for my colleagues. Largely, I am very excited about what's in the budget. I see us really on a trajectory of taking care of what we have and just being strategic about where we're making investments and really being thoughtful about how we change our policy. That is all very exciting to me. Um, the one deficiency I see is the continuation of the free programming as a status quo. Um, I think I heard from all of you when we discussed this at the board earlier this year that we really wanted to see that change. Um, and that didn't happen, and, I, and I'm not seeing in the budget something that makes that happen. So um, I'm going to be working with Commissioner Thompson on crafting a budget goal for REC. Uh, that we come up with a comprehensive strategy for providing free programming that replaces the status quo now. Um, so this evening, I would love to hear from you all um, what you'd like, what you think the goals of that budget goal should be. Um, are we looking at something that's citywide? Are we looking at something that is um, not age restricted? Are we looking at something that removes the barriers that people might encounter in trying to utilize the myriad op options we have right now, fee assistance, the f fun, the scholar, uh, scho <laughs> I forget what it is, some kind of fun scholarship. Um, the scholar, the yes, anyway. Um, we have so many different options, and I just feel like all the different options are creating confusion. And then we have free programs that we want, that we think are going to, that we thought were going to help solve a problem, but have have shown up um, with some not great results, which is that we've got, we're displacing the people that we know need it <laughs> from, from their own rec centers. So um, this evening, I'd love to hear from you what you'd like to see out of that so that um, when we're working on crafting this, I, I find a way to bring something forward that you all feel comfortable supporting at our next meeting. That, that's my ask of you. Um, and if you come up with something in the interim um, and you want to share that with me, please let me know. But I won't be able to discuss it with you. <laughs> so perhaps you'll have to, you'll have to push, it, put it, push it through with uh, commissioner questions um, or something like that so that it's not, oh, not violating open meeting law. And perhaps Secretary Ringgold can provide a suggestion on how that could happen. <laughs> <clears throat> You, are you reaching for the light, Secretary Ringgold? <laughs> Go for it. Um, <laughs> Chair Thompson and Commissioner Musich, let me just think on it for a second, and I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, thanks. 
Um, I know that uh, Coach Schaefer had her light on. I don't know if she's going to speak towards something independent, but I'll circle back to the question at hand. Please go ahead. I will address that in a minute, but I had a couple of more specific questions. I noticed that regional pavement rehab line item goes down significantly in 2027 and beyond. I know we allocated an ongoing 260 from our new regional monies towards pavement, and so it goes up to like a million two right away um, next year. But then you'll see around 2027, it drops down to like 760, I believe. So I'm just curious um, why pavement is going down in that section. And I, I don't, let me see if I find my. Uh, Chair Thompson, Mr. Shaver, give us a minute to try and figure this out. Um, it's on this, this one. And it's on the bottom. You give us a minute to come in, but we will come back to you with an answer. Okay, great. Um, can we have an, can I have a little bit more understanding of why the forestry pr preservation coordinator um, comes out of the new stormwise stormwater enterprise budget and um, <coughs> is that a carryover maybe I've heard from what the city used to give us um, and maybe we can have an explanation of what the thinking is around why stormwater is supporting the preservation coordinator Sorry. Chair Thompson, Commissioner Schaefer. So the thinking around it is that tree canopy captures stormwater. <laughs> and so the, the original agreement was public works would pay 50K a year towards the FTE of creating a full-time tree preservation coordinator. Um, and so yeah, this is back in like 2018, I believe, was when then we said, okay, how are we gonna execute the payment of that uh, FTE? And it was put into the uh, agreement, the stormwater agreement with, between the park board and the public works that that $50,000 would be paid through that agreement to fund the tree preservation coordinator based on tree canopy does help with stormwater. Yeah. I I. I I, I think that's understandable. Um, I also think they spend a lot of time on public works projects and our own parks, you know, trying to figure out where to save trees for our own planning projects. So I understand the, the split. Um, but thank you, that's helpful. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of excited about that Stormwise Enterprise budget. So when I see it's all mostly staff, I kind of feel like, oh, maybe the MEO operator, we can, we can shift that preservation coordinator all the way over into forestry. But I, I think it's something for us to think about um, because I do think um, we don't have a lot of contract money yet in that, in that area. And I do think there's a strong case for um, having that position being paid completely by forestry. Um, and then I will address in my last minute here, um, I guess I have another minute. <coughs> The, the free youth program, I really support looking at that. I guess I have two questions. Um, I do think that the decision made by the previous board has landed in our lap. Um, mm -hmm. And so I am all for putting our heads together to make a good solution. And we're all for free programming for those who really need it. I agree with your... Um, um, thoughts that we need to think about it holistically. I think youth are not the only ones that need our programming assistance, but also seniors and some young adults. I, I really think this should be more of a holistic look and not just youth category or family category. Um, I don't think there were a lot of clear objectives, goals, or measurements for success established with this program from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and we can see how that has played out. I also believe this work ignored the extensive work that staff had already begun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like to resurrect that work, and maybe this is staff work instead of commissioner work, um, but I would support um, putting a pause on free programming with the expectation um, a solution is coming that is sustainable. Thank you. Um, did you, sorry, you may please go ahead. 
uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Schaefer, I, I do kind of have a response. I can see the drop in regional amenity or regional pavement that you're referring to. Um, the additional funding that we received has been applied across the board, but that baseline um, does, does see a drop in 2027 um, and thereafter. And that means that, that that would have been a decision made in a previous CIP. So I need to go and look through some of the notes that would have been in the previous CIPs. So I will do that and I will report back to you. That's the best I can do tonight. Commissioner Menz. Thank you, Chair Thompson. A um, couple of questions, uh, Director Humphrey. I had a couple of golf questions. So I've heard a lot of feedback. Well, first of all, I've been on the golf courses a few times this year, and they look great. They're they're good. So, but what I'm wondering is, I'm, I'm confused about the players' card. Is that the rate that we charge for 18 holes? Chair Thompson, Commissioner Mentz, no. The Players Club is kind of a loyalty card that's purchased by players. We've sold about 3,500 of them this year. So what that does is it gives you one round of golf at any of our golf courses and then a discount throughout the year uh, at our courses as an incentive for repeat play. Okay. What is the rate for 18? Is it different at every course? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Mentz, Currently this year, there's different rates depending on the course, the time of day, what day of the week it is. Uh, in the 2024 budget, it's a little proposed, it's a little more streamlined um, with rates. There are different rates for twilight, um, for seniors, uh, for youth, uh, and nine holes versus 18 holes, obviously. And then there, there are different rates at different courses? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner yes, Mens, yes, currently there's different rates at different courses. And then um, are there different rates for carts at different courses? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Mens, there are different rates for carts depending on how many holes you play. So there's a nine hole cart rate and an 18 hole cart rate, but otherwise the rate for carts is the same. Uh, I take that back. I believe at the worth par three, the cart rate is slightly less than it is playing nine holes at. Uh, at our regulation course. Um, so th what, what I noticed in this piece was we eliminated, we, we recommended eliminating the senior all course season pass, which that means they can play anywhere, right? Uh, Chair Thompson and Commissioner Mentz, if you'll see in the uh, amendments provided by Finance Director yep. Wiseman, we are uh, uh, requesting to keep that instated and not to eliminate the season pass. I believe it's in your, uh, in your attachments. It's yep. here, yeah. Um, is there a re why did we why did we move that away? How, how much money do we receive from? I'm 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 really interested in like how much we're getting in because it seemed like golf made a lot of money this year, and yet we're still increasing fees and making it more expensive. And although I love playing our golf courses, and I think that other people do as well, I don't think that they're right sizely priced compared to what people can get outside of the city. Um, so I'm I'm wondering why we're increasing our fees fairly significantly um, on the public Minneapolis golfers. Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Mentz, a, a couple items. For the season passes, for example, we have not, we are still at 2014 levels for our season passes. We had not raised our season pass rates uh, in years. We actually dropped them pre-COVID when golf was not at its peak. Um, as far as daily rates of play, one thing that I would encourage you all to look at is our rates include sales tax. When you go look at rack rates at golf courses that are advertised online, most of them, if not all, do not include sales tax. So it's a slightly uh, deceptive. Uh, so where you're looking at us, where you're looking at a $46 round and $20 for a cart, $66. That's tax included. If you go to another course in you know, Brooklyn Park and it is $41 plus $19 cards at 60, but with tax, it's the same amount. Um, so that's a little bit uh, deceptive just because we include sales tax in our rates. Uh, we did study uh, course fees all throughout the metro area. Uh, we are in the market of course fees. Um, we're at what I would say in the middle third. Um, we are not at the bottom and we are not in the top third of comparable courses throughout the metro. There are some that are more expensive and there are some that are less expensive. And if you take advantage, for example, of our player's card, you're getting exceptional value throughout the season. Yeah, I hear that. But so, and I would also argue that it is a little deceptive because it's, it's 19 or $21 per player for the cart, even though there's two seats in the cart, correct? 
Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Renz, yes, it, that's per player. And that's standard throughout the industry to charge per player. Um, I'm wondering, I, I, it just feels like a little bit of, we're, we're, over, we're overpricing our golf services and we're making more money. The other question I have uh, is about the golf simulators. And I put this in the budget questionnaire. And thank you for the response. Because did we, we purchased golf simulators at Gross? years ago uh, chair Thompson Commissioner Mintz, uh roughly 10 years ago we purchased um, I was not involved with golf at the time okay. but the board purchased two residential grade simulators to use a gross for lessons only uh, in the off season that lasted for four or five years and there were issues with the simulators they were you know household grade not commercial grade um, and there was not a ambiance or set up in that location to facilitate any kind of large scale league play uh, or social function, which would be different than the proposal that's at Columbia. And had the technology has improved on those devices? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Mentz, yes. Technology has improved drastically uh, over the past 10 years and what's available through uh, with golf simulators. And is that similar to like a top golf type scenario? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Mentz, uh, it's a little different than Top Golf. Um, there's a couple. Uh, there's a place called X Golf in Champlin Park, um, and there are some restaurants in downtown Minneapolis that have simulators. So it's not hitting into open space. Top Golf is probably a what I would say a higher end or a more expensive option than what we'd be looking at uh, here. We'd be comparable to um, uh, X Golf. There's a couple places in Maple Grove and um, some other golf courses that do it during the winter. Um, albeit some on a larger scale, some on a smaller scale. We'd be looking at a four or five bay setup um, where previously a gross we were two, then down to one. Um, and, you know, Top Golf is, you know, hundreds of bays. And would these be available in the winter time? Yeah. Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner, it's primarily the winter. Our okay. busiest season would probably be November 1st through April 1st. Okay. And, um, I mean, it's a fairly large capital expenditure. And then do, I, I didn't really understand what, where the money, the pro, like where that, that's just revenue that we're trying to generate to put back into the re, to the enterprise fund. Like we're looking at this as a revenue generation yes. capital expenditure. Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Renz, yes. We'd be looking at, uh, uh, revenue coming back in that would not only fund the operations, but also pay back the capital investment that we're making into that site to purchase the simulators. And what would be the ongoing maintenance costs of something like, like those golf simulators? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Mentz, from the experts in the field that I've talked to, putting away ten to $15,000 per year for five machines is more than adequate for maintenance, updates, and anything else that has to be done. Okay. What would be the plan? for the extra money, for, for the income? Would it go to golf? Would, would, where, would, where, would that, where would that profit go? Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Mintz, I'd love it if it went back into golf, um, but I, it would go into the enterprise fund, um, assuming that this project is run through the enterprise fund and that is used to fund you know, capital projects or anything else that needs to be done within that area. That's my assumption. Director Wiseman would probably know more than me. Okay. And, and I could assume that that money could be directed to specific capital expenditures. Uh, Chair Thompson, Commissioner Mentz, I defer to uh, Director Wiseman if money can be directed specifically towards something. In the Enterprise Fund. Chair Thompson and Commissioner Mentz, if you remember the Enterprise Fund, yes. uh, we have a couple of micro enterprises that are within there that all, all the money stays within that function. The rest of the Enterprise Fund functions as a complete fund okay. and so it would we the board we rec the superintendent recommends a CIP annually for the enterprise fund and the board adopts the CIP annually for the enterprise fund so you know so that's currently how we're doing it w was this in that fund or this is that's part of the this this discussion we're recommending this as the capital expenditure Correct. out of the enterprise That's fund. one of them, yes. Were there other choices? <clears throat> I mean, I mean, I'm fine with it, but I'm, I'm just wondering, it's a large expense within the fund. Also, on the youth programming um, usage, yeah. I think that, 
I'm okay with everything not being free, but I, I, I think that registration should be free. I think we should eliminate the barrier of paying for the programming before you attend the program programming. That would be my only suggestion mm -hmm. for youth. That'd be interesting. Okay, uh, Commissioner Benny. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Thompson. I'm not on this committee, but we're all talking about this. Uh, so good news, Commissioner Menz asked all my golf questions. So I can move on to other, <laughs> I didn't have any golf questions. Um, and I got that. But I, and I had to step out for a minute, but was, were we given another, we have another date, another deadline for submitting the last round of questions, is that true? And I apologize if that's already been an, uh, stated. <coughs> Chair Thompson and uh, Vice President and Benny, uh, that hasn't been shared yet. I did share it through the email that I sent out today. Okay. Um, and I attached the blank Thank Excel you. spreadsheet yep. so that you can utilize that if you'd like to. Thank you. And then uh, a couple of questions. Um, oh, I want to first say too, I, um, a couple of people have said uh, how awesome this budget is. I love our strategic directions as a board. I love what we're doing here. Um, with some of the investment in the things we have, the natural areas, supporting our volunteers. It's just a, it's, it's a really exciting budget, I, I think. Um, one of the questions I had was specifically around some of the categories of spending on the capital side. There were, um, I think the new cat, one new category is boardwalks. Um, one new category is, um, I think it's shore wall or shoreline. I, if you could, yes, thank you so much, Mr. Arvidsson. If you could, um, clarify that and then specifically then if that whatever the shoreline one is called is is that where maybe the Lake Harriet wall is identified uh, chair Thompson commissioner of any um, uh, vice president of any the, these um, yes these new categories are meant to have places where a lot of the additional state funding that we receive can live yeah. based on the guidance that the board provided for what they wanted to spend it on. So the um, regional shoreline erosion control and That's stabilization it. That's it. specifically talks about Lake Harriet and Bidet Makaska. Yeah. So it does sort of limit, limit it to that in the, in the proposed, in the description of proposed park improvements, which we do consider to be um, the board also making policy. So that description is important and has in the past at times been amended. So if there are kind of improvements or even additional specificity that you would like, that is a place that you can amend. But the intent there was to address issues particularly at those lakes. I love it. I mean, I think it's really great to have those buckets is how I'd kind of think of them. But obviously we're gonna have, you know, we have deferred maintenance throughout the system. We'll have things on a, on a list that we would add. In my day job that we're moving more toward kind of a categorical strategy for certain types of major maintenance. Um, because if naming the project seems to be too detailed when it is some of the more major maintenance work is the thinking. Um, and I think that's also partly the, also the strategy with the legislature, which is a little bit, which is maybe somewhat relevant. The other thing is, um, I think the city does a lot of more categorical programming of dollars. So I love it. I'm, I'll take a good look at that. Wh which page was that on? I'm sorry. We have so much paper here. You have no idea. Chair Thompson, Commissioner Benny, it's in it's in the CIP yep, document, yep. Um, and it is the fourth, fourth page. and final page final of page? the big CIP okay. spreadsheet, and it's near the bottom. And I would just note quickly, because while I have the floor, um, though I don't want to eat your time, um, <laughs> is that um, when it comes to regional funding, um, we also have to strike a balance between kind of broader programmatic type projects and specific park projects, which when you're <coughs> writing grants with the Met Council, they prefer to know exactly what's happening in which park at a certain time. So we have to be judicious about those more programmatic ones. And I think in this case, it made sense to do so, but it won't always. So there are some direct allocations like up in the regional capital piece for some of that state money also, when we know it's going to a particular park and we'll write a standalone grant. I think that that makes perfect sense. I mean, and I, I wouldn't even anticipate that the, these categ categories of spending are 
um, like like there's that one on the budget now. It's something like fifty thousand dollars a year for underground infrastructure, and you don't know what's coming. You don't, but with this work, you you know what will be in in the plan each year. So we always have, we always can expand on what we're what we're requesting. So, um, and then I think my net my last comments might be around the free youth programming. I think there's, I think there is an opportunity to. Um, to course correct a little bit. Um, I also support some measure of free programming, um, but I, I think that it, it shouldn't uh, be focused on the location of the activity. I think it needs to be focused on the in individual person, circumstances, family. Um, and uh, that way we would also have, um, that would spread out throughout our, but I just wanna say one more thing. I think we also have to not be uh, overly uh, controlling about the process. You have to balance, I think, always the controls with the outcomes. You know, don't ask for things that we really don't need. What can we live with to make sure we're vetting, vetting the request? But that's it. Uh, Commissioner Olson. Uh, yeah, so this is gonna be on free youth programming. Um, yeah, you know, there's, you know, a lot of, I think, uh, derision sometimes well deserved of the past board and some decisions, but free pursuing free youth programming I think was one of the best ones and it was truly admirable. Uh, one of the greatest things that the legislator did this year was provide universal school meals for all kids across the state. There was debate about, oh, you know, do we means test it? You know, we don't want a rich kid in Wyzetta getting a free meal or whatever. That was a big argument on the other side of the aisle. And ultimately we decided that for these sorts of social programs, when kids are involved, universal has to be truly universal. And right now it's one of the most successful things that I think we did in that last session. Kids are getting meals. And so let's get kids activities. You know, we come up here and all the time we have parents and, and youth and, and community <coughs> members saying how important it is that kids get engaged. And, you know, the data we have so far on this program is really not enough to say that it's, it, it seemed like, okay, some, it was more, maybe some it was, you know, folks were, there, there were obviously some flaws, but like our staff is smart and they're working on it. And I'm gonna put it, it's in their own words here. Staff believe with structural changes made in the recommended 2024 budget and the implementation of features within ActiveNet 2.0, the imbalance within the general fund will be remedied. This is in reference to free youth programming. Our staff are saying they've got this and we can work with what we have. Now I think, yeah, maybe there are some things we need to, we need to change and for me, it needs to be full universal because when you have these different tests and whatever, this is where you create the issues. So what we need to do is have a clear, simple system, a good way for folks to have the means to contribute to their neighbors, to contribute to their community, so we can continue the programming. But if there's any amendment that in any way results in fewer kids getting free access to our programs, I cannot support it. Thank you. Um, I see you're like Commissioner Elper, but I'm going to go to committee member Commissioner Musich um, in light of the task still ahead of us tonight, just for timing. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Chair Thompson, so I, I appreciate the feedback that you've provided on um, the youth programming and it sounds like Commissioner Alper has some more things she wants to add. Um, I'm not in any way suggesting that we should change the status quo this year. I, I don't think we're ready for that, but what I am suggesting is that I want to craft a budget goal that we would add to the budget. There's several of them already for recreation. Um, but that would help direct staff to bring forward something as part of our 2025 budget process that addresses the deficiencies that have been identified in the current program. So I'm hearing from you guys that um, you don't think we should be focusing on location, but rather need. We shouldn't be increasing barriers to participation. We should be eliminating them if possible. Um, I'm hearing from some of you that there should be no fees charged at all um, for the youth in the city for any kind of programs. I, I, don't, I don't believe that there's probably support for that um, from what I've heard from the board as a whole. 
uh, so far this year, so I, I don't know that I would in include that specific item in what I'm crafting. Um, but I'm also hearing that we feel like um, we, we should be applying this to all residents, not just youth, because people's need doesn't stop when they turn 18. Um, and then uh, that we should be establishing metrics around whatever new solution comes forward uh, to ensure that it's achieving what, what we're hoping it will do. And if I've misunderstood y'all, uh, please let me know. And I'm happy to take some more notes so that we can try to get this as close to something we'll have consensus on as possible for our next meeting. Thanks. Commissioner Elper, may I request that you, are you wanting to speak toward the free situation? Then yes, please go ahead, thank you. Yes, that's the reason I've turned my light on. Thank you. Um, because there won't be another opportunity before our next meeting. So I uh, just want to say my, the feedback I've heard from the um, city council members that I know and legislat legislative members that I know is that they really like it. So I wholeheartedly think we should keep doing it. I just hope we can do it better. Um, I really feel we shouldn't be doing the means testing that we're doing right now with our current scholarship program. So if there's a way to set that as budget goal to, you know, balance this places where we don't charge anything with places where we charge, but ask a whole lot of questions and we, people have to go through a lot of hoops to get the free option. I, I would like to even, even the playing field out a little bit. Um, and then I'm really concerned that we're raising prices on Rec Plus and Jim Lupient, potentially to cover some of the free Rec Plus sites and Phillips Aquatic Center. So um, that's, that's really concerning to me. So I hope we can figure that out in the budget goal. And then I want us to see, I, I want to see us collect all the fees we currently supposedly charge. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Elper and Secretary Ringgold. Thank you, um, Commissioner Thompson. I had promised to think about it a minute and <laughs> <laughs> it's been a minute. Um, I think actually the best way, and it's not, great timing for you, Commissioner Musich. But the best way is for commissioners in the sequence of comments or questions that you would put forward to Director Wiseman for the 15th, to add in anything specific about this youth programming into that, spe specifically call it out youth programming advice, and then we will be able to post that with everything that we post prior to the next meeting. Thank you so much. Yep. Do you have a final? Yes, please, Commissioner Message. Thank you for that additional information. And um, I do hope that if people have additional ideas, they'll put them out there. And I do promise that I will submit this in advance so you have an opportunity to look it over before our meeting um, on, on Wednesday, November, whatever, 15th. <laughs> Thank you. Co-Chair Schaefer. Yeah, I'll just you... make one other comment in my second round here, but I just really feel like this is an important issue to address in light of our upcoming potential shortfall in 26-27 around youth. And so I appreciate um, really not kicking the can down the road, but have a strategy around that. And um, uh, what is our official overall budget number? I read 154 in the paper. Um, I'm kind of <laughs> wondering, because I looked through my whole pack and I'm like, where's the big dollar number? Can I get an official word from the finance department? <laughs> Chair Thompson, no. Commissioner Schaefer, I remember 156 million. And okay. that's when you add up the general fund, the enterprise fund, the capital projects, special revenue. And this was all of our one-time uh, regional gifts, including the shoreline and the, the beaches, that, those one-time. in 2024. The press release has the, the correct amount. I remember that. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I, I, I do think one more pie chart that would be really helpful for commissioners is, you know, a total mm -hmm. budget pie chart um, between the departments and you know, because we're kind of moving the beans here, um, but we'd like to keep the big perspective. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other lights, I would just like to take a moment to say thank you to the board for having an eye toward the future always. I, I've been doing deep dives in other organizations' budgets, and they have projections of massive loss, and then you go, ooh. So it's always good to, to be thinking several years ahead, and I appreciate the conversation. So with that, 
I am going to call this committee adjourned and go back to the full board at 8.47 p.m. And I believe we're going to or, planning. Are we going to planning? I apologize, President Forney. No, I'm, we're going wherever we're going. Planning. Yeah. So I'm noting the time is um, 8.47. I'd like to call the planning committee to order. Secretary, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Thompson. Here. Commissioner Schaefer. Here. Commissioner Olson. Here. Co-Chair Alper. Here. Co-Chair Benny. Uh, here. You, you have a quorum. Um, would someone like to move the agenda? So moved. Is there any discussion about the agenda? All those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 So we have an agenda. Um, we have a couple of minutes to move. I'll so move the minutes of September 20th and October 4th together. Great. Any discussion about the minutes? Okay. All those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 We have uh, two sets of approved minutes. Um, we have, I'm getting, okay. We have one item tonight. Um, would someone like to move the resolution uh, on our action items list? Yeah, I'll move resolution 2023-195, resolution approving the preferred concept plan for phase two improvements at Fallwell Park, a part of the north service area of Minneapolis without a public hearing. Great. Um, I personally would like a presentation on this. Um, so we have Crystal Passy here tonight. Um, so welcome. Thank you, President Farney, Co-Chair Abane, and uh, Co-Chair Alper for having me here. I'm gonna try to open this up. Okay. And then, okay. Um, I'm gonna be quick, if I can. Okay. Uh, so, Fallwell Park, uh, we are in the second phase of improvements at Fallwell Park, um, and we are now, um, we've uh, done a, a bunch of community engagement um, this spring and summer. Um, we have gone through kind of like schematic design level, um, a, a second round of community engagement to kind of like truth out um, kind of our concept plan, and now we're here um, at concept approval. Um, with the goal to construct something uh, next year. Um, our total budget for um, construction is 1.3 million, and we have about uh, 1 million for um, actual construction costs. <coughs> um, we have a wonderful design team. Um, our lead consultant is MEND, um, and we have a subconsultant with them uh, from Hunger Skate Parks. Hunger Skate Parks actually worked on the uh, juxtaposition arts uh, skate plaza. Um, so they are very familiar with, our, uh, with, the, with the community. Um, we also have a bunch of community involvement. Um, these are some of our partners that we've been working with on the community engagement um, and doing kind of stakeholder meetings. Um, so as I noted, uh, the first phase of improvements um, has been completed. That included like the tennis court, field lighting, path improvements, and a new playground at Fallwell. And we have been scoping out what is the next phase of improvements. Um, these are um, now going to be uh, focused on the all-wheel park, um, which I will get into a little bit more detail what that is. Um, I personally did not know until I started this project. Um, Stormwater management, um, improved picnic areas, and improved lighting and pathway and circulation improvements. Um, some just some existing conditions of the park. Um, just a couple pictures of the rec center, um, the, some pathways, a restroom building, um, and then sort of our area of focus is actually this area, just as a, a note, there's a playground, the existing waiting pool, and some picnicking and just kind of general open space. Um, I'll kind of breeze through this a little bit and I can go back if there are questions. Um, but our community engagement has been um, pretty extensive and we have done a lot of work with youth. Um, we worked with uh, juxtaposition arts um, to help kind of like scope out our, um, like a public art kind of vision for the project. Um, and we also had a community, um, our first open house involved a community meal where we just sat down and talked to people and had a meal together. Um, we took all of that feedback. Um, we also met with City of Skate and the Lopit Foundation and Minneapolis um, Bike Parks um, as part of a, a TAC that we put together to kind of talk about the all-wheel park, which is, um, and develop that kind of design and scope. 
Um, I will go through, so we had about 350 total participants in our community engagement, which I think was pretty good, and um, I really feel like we, we talked to a lot of people and got really good kind of direction. Um, we also looked at, in addition to kind of those other scope, we looked at kind of like, could we do more? What could we really do? And th this is sort of a representation of some of that, those conversations. And that is available on our project web, web page. Um, however, as we kind of got into the budget, we really realized that in order to build quality things, we would really have to kind of narrow it down to sort of community-based amenities, the stormwater and infrastructure and plantings, and the all-wheel park. Um, our project is focused um, in the center of the park. Um, we looked at, in, in the original kind of like vision for the plan of this park, uh, there, the all-wheel park is actually shown as kind of like a linear um, space that sort of spans uh, between Knox and the center of the park. Um, but we did a lot of exploration on the trees in that area, and that area just was not a very good spot for that feature. So we sort of focused it in, um, and this is the concept plan that we have come up with. We have an all-wheel park, which is suitable for bikes, scooters, um, skateboards, and um, BMX biking, obviously, um, and uh, also inline skating. Um, our focus uh, is sort of a two-tiered um, pr uh, project. Um, just for budgetary reasons, we looked at focusing on this kind of, I'll get into it a little bit more in the next um, the next slide, but we have a kind of right next to the waiting, um, the waiting pool, the current waiting pool. We have the um, the main lower deck, which is sort of like bowl features. It's very different. We don't have anything like this in our system. Um, and then we have a kind of upper deck area, which is more of like the street style skating that you see. Um, and then we also have a community kind of space that's like picnicking with a grill. Um, that was something that we identified. And then a future phase would be add a, um, a pavilion or something like that in this, in this space to create even more kind of picnicking community amenity. We do a lot of improvements to the existing pathways. Um, and then another big feature is um, to mitigate all the stormwater that, um, that might be um, falling on this paved area. We have a stormwater management system. It probably won't look just like this, but we are managing um, water from not only the first kind of phase of improvements, but the full kind of build out of this um, project. We are gonna size it for that. Um, this is sort of a little bit more detail of that. Um, we also have improved lighting. Um, we, we actually found that this area had pretty good light, um, but we were kind of adding to that and, and improving that even more. Um, in addition to one of the things that we're really thinking about with this concept plan that we'll keep developing further in the next phase is how to kind of make this space not just for um, skates and um, bikes and all of those people, but like for the rest of the community. So seating is really important. Um, and then kind of creating these like natural planting areas, which really fits the vision for the park, which is kind of more expansive um, naturalized areas. This is sort of a detail of the all-wheel park design. So our current phase priority is this kind of lower deck, as I mentioned before. Um, and then if we are able to, as the budget allows, we will build out this full um, kind of tiered system. So this is a good, this lower image is a good example of like kind of a tiered uh, skate park design. Um, this is a really good image of this kind of plaza space that has seating and kind of open space that can be used in a street, street style skating. And then the lower area has um, a couple of different types of bowls and can be used in a similar way to um, a pump track actually. There will be some elements that will work really well for that. Um, then we have some renderings which were also available in the packet of, um, from Hunger, just kind of giving you a little bit better three dimensional view of that space. Um, as part of this, this is that thing I noted about the trees and working with forestry to really think about where to place this. And as you'll note, we were kind of, we're working it into this space to avoid priority trees. There will be some removals or possibly relocation of some of these trees and we'll work with forestry to evaluate those 
and if there are um, removals, then we will be transplanting them or putting new trees in to replace those trees. Um, I think, and this final image, I'm really proud of um, the work that Jexta did on kind of coming up with a vision for this like public art vision, which will probably go on beyond this project. Um, and the idea is the wetland returns. And I think it really fits with the community vision and everything we heard and just heard really good feedback um, from everybody. So if there are any questions, I'll let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions, any comments? I see Commissioner Schaefer. I mean, sorry, Commissioner Thompson. Well, we are co-chairs, so yep. thank you. I don't have any questions. I just want to say how much I appreciate all the work you've done. I have heard from neighbors. Um, I just think this is an incredible park. For the, as the District 2 Commissioner, the lion's share of my energy since getting elected has largely gone, drum roll please, to North Commons. And um, Falwell Park is an incredible park, and I'm so grateful that we, as as an organization, are putting time to it. Um, and I thank you so much for the work that you've done in this. This plan just seems incredible. So I look forward to all the next steps. And I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I'll say just quickly before calling on uh, Commissioner Menz, thank you for the tree buffer map. Thank you for uh, modifying the design around the important and priority trees and just having that concept is great. I also really appreciate that um, you're planning for the build out with the stormwater system. I think that's uh, smart. And I think this is going to be one of these other cool attractions in the parks like the boulder wall and things like that that are starting to pop up. So uh, Commissioner Menz. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chair Benny, I'm not on this committee, but I did have some, some questions around the all-wheel park. So do we plan to, to do, I know I've mentioned this before, a design build where the designer is the builder of the park? Uh, thank you for the question, um, Commissioner Menz, Chair Alper, Chair Abene. Um, I don't think we can do that at this time, is from what I understand, but uh, perhaps we can... <laughs> In the future, I think that would be an interesting approach, but it, from what I understand, we aren't able to do that. But Vice President Benny, uh, Commissioner Menz, currently state law does not allow us to use uh, taxpayer dollars in a design build uh, way, right? To meet bidding requirements, we can't do that. Um, there could be an opportunity where and this is what we have encouraged some of our partners, that they uh, take raise funds and they do a design build, complete the project, and then give it to us. So that, that has been done before, uh, but again, we're not to, to, to meet uh, current purchasing state law and city ordinances, we're not able to do design build. So the designer is not able, it, it's illegal for the designer to build the project? Vice President Benny, uh, Com Commissioner Menz, you, two different things. I think you're saying is since design, if I, if I interpreted what you're saying, uh, skate park design is very special. And you're suggesting that there may be people that will help with the design and then will want to place a public bid. Is, is, is that what you're thinking? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of efficiency and I'm thinking of making sure that the design does not get um, for lack of a better word, bastardized by the implementation of the construction of the project. And I'm also wondering, is, are we, is this, in this project, are we designing the entire all-wheel park or only the section that we're planning to build? Thank you for the question, Commissioner Menz. Uh, we're designing the whole thing and then we can build it. Um, if we are able to build the whole thing, we will. Um, and as far as the um, ability for the designer, the design team, to bid on this project and build the work, they are able to do that. They can bid on the project. We will put it out for public bid. Um, there's, I don't think there's any restrictions on them building it, but yeah. It, it, I'll just add to what, what uh, uh, Crystal has just said. We have completed, or we're in the process of completing our second park where, where we had a design 
a skate park designer, put together documents for us, and we publicly bid those. And it, the Elliot was successful. Painter is going well. So I, I, I assume that that's the, you know, we, we've got a track record here, and we can proceed that way. And then what, what is the difference in cost to, I didn't see like a cost difference of, of what the extra additional space would be. Yeah, we have, um, thank you for the question, Commissioner Menz. We have cost estimating that we have had done that's pretty preliminary. Um, and I didn't share that and I'm happy to provide that to you um, at a future time. I don't have it on me right now. Um, but we are hoping we could do the whole thing with our full budget. Our, our total budget for the full build out is 700,000. Um, but with the construction climate right now, I don't know what it will be. That's why we're kind of safeguarding it um, and possibly phasing it. And then the 200,000 for the stormwater improvement, that's, that's for the stormwater improvements, but that's for the whole thing. Yes. And then, and we don't have a policy yet to cost out the trees that we're going to have to remove or anything like that. But those don't come into the cost. Our full budget includes um, plantings, trees, kind of a rough cost for that. Um, right, but not the loss of those tree, those trees, or how how much they might have value of carbon offset. Um, sorry, commissioners, I, I do wonder like what the difference is in cost and how, if it would be, I mean, if it's, sometimes it's not an extra $700,000, it might be an extra two or 300 to be efficient with that stuff, but maybe not. So I would like to see the cost estimates if that's possible of the difference and then, you know, figure it out from there. I, I just worry that it's, it doesn't get to that next phase all the time. So I'm trying to figure out how, and there, there are different opinions about how the other skate facilities are you know, meeting the needs of the community long term. Um, uh, Vice President Benny, Commissioner Menz, um, we want to make sure that we can award a contract to construct um, a significant portion of this all wheel facility. We will be very strategic in how. Crystal working with the design team to put that bid package together. Again, we're required by state law and city ordinance to do what we call design, bid, and build. Um, that precludes us from picking and choosing. We have to, in the bid documents ahead of time, we have to set a base bid and then our alternates at the time that, that the bids are submitted. Crystal has done this before in many projects where you prioritize kind of those uh, alternates. And hopefully if the bids come in in a, uh, uh, in a real acceptable manner, we can come back and say, we want the board to accept base bid plus alternate one, alternate two based on funding. The other thing to consider, and we've used this on, on many projects, we have a, um, a construction contingency fund. So if we, in order to award a base bid or to an accept uh, an alternate, we'll present to the board, hey, here's the funding we have, and here's some contingency funding that you have. Does the board want to use that in this case for this project to kind of complete the project? Does, does that help uh, mm -hmm. how we think about things? So. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Swenson and Ms. Passy. I appreciate it. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Okay. With that, I'll adjourn the planning. Vote. We didn't vote, vote we yet. We didn't vote on this. No. Gosh. I would really love to get okay, this approved well, from my constituents. I was just seeing if you guys were paying attention. We are. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, all those in favor of Resolution 2023-195, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? That resolution passes, and now I'll adjourn the planning committee. I will reconvene then the full board, and I've been told that I have, quote, unquote, the authority to do this, that we are going to go to, uh, first of all, um, bringing from admin and finance the item that would pass in committee. Um, if you would like to read yes. that. Thank you. Oh. We, have a, we have an active resolution on the floor. Oh. We're in, 
we're not required to resolve that before we move on? On a reconvening, I think not. Okay. All right. Okay, on behalf of Asmund Finance, then I will move to the full board resolution 2023-201, the resolution extending construction permit PB15 2023 originally issued administratively to the Met Council for a period of less than 180 days for work related to the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project. I think we know it as amended to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Any questions? Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 That action carries. I know I'm breaching a whole bunch of different things, but also in the interest to give everybody a chance to review what's been put in front of you, I am going to um, ask for the superintendent to do um, reports of officers. So review your assignments, everyone. All right. Thank you, President Forney and commissioners. It's always hard at this late to kind of get excited, really sure energy around this, but I hope this. Uh, really put some excitement in the work that we're doing across the organization. So thank you for the time. So as usual, we'll go through the report of officers specifically around the strategic directions. And we'll start off with, with the strategic direction A, act boldly uh, for our, our climate future. And this is the recreation citywide program that's called Walk, Bike, Play on the Watershed Day. So on October 8th, Say that quickly, right? Yeah. On October 8th, <laughs> staff from Citywide Recreation Program, Spark Studios, and Environmental Education Neighborhood Naturalists, isn't that cool? I mean, across the organization, these three got together uh, to provide community programming to 50 participants in the walk, bike, play on the watershed day. Activities encourage folks to participate in Bohemian Flats Park, Annie Young Meadows, and the Windchill Trailhead with opportunities to walk and bike between the destinations. Topics that were included during that time was art, weaving water with Sarah Nassif, water quality education, kayaking, river fishing, nature photography, storm drain cleaning and painting, seed bombs, guided walks, and watershed education. And that is really some cool stuff. Um, these were all curated to educate and, and engage participants in activities around the Mississippi watershed. Funding was provided in part through a grant from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. Thank you, thank you, thank you to them. They're just great partners. And this is the first in a series of three activities engaging participants in the Mississippi watershed. The next event will be in the winter at Loring Park. So more to come, and if you have a chance to get involved, please do. Really, really, really great program. Strategic Direction B, cultivate each community's place and honor cultural traditions in Minneapolis parks. This is the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement and Reconciliation. The MPRB is embarking in, uh, on an Indigenous Reconciliation Action Plan using the Parks for All Comprehensive Plan for guidance. Goal 1, strat Strategy 3, is to amplify Indigenous stories, histories, cultural practices, and connections to land through employment, partnership, reconciliation planning, programming, ceremony, foraging, land management, interpretation, and proactive uh, community engagement across projects and programs. Goal seven, strategy four, is to educate staff and the community on critical issues facing the city and region, including indigenous acknowledgement, history, rights, cultural, uh, culture, and perspectives. The action plan will provide guidance for staff and commissioners on issues relating to indigenous relationships and a host of related actions. The Park Board has encouraged, uh, has engaged Carrie Day Aspinwall, who is here today, obviously, that presented as in the uh, Indigenous Liaison Consultant. She is respected leader in local and statewide American Indian, Indian community. Topics to be addressed include mapping, acknowledgement, projects, agreements, design, interpretation, workforce, value-based priorities, financial, knowledge sharing, and policies. More information will be shared with the Board of Commissioners during November, followed by the formation of work groups and policy advisory team. Very, very excited work, so it's great to share that. Strategic Direction C, implement quality youth and intergenerational programs. This is around the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden and Bird Sanctuary. 
The Eloise Butler Wildfire Garden and Bird Sanctuary closed for the season this past Sunday. Uh, throughout 2023, thousands of people immersed themselves in the natural beauty of the garden. Seasonal garden uh, naturalists and volunteers logged nearly 50,000 visitor engagements. These were convers there, there were conversations about wildflowers, bird sightings, trail recommendations, and more. Volunteers gave an excess of 1,100 hours of time to greet and support visitors to the wildflower garden, and nearly 4,500 youth and adults participated in programs led by <coughs> seasonal garden naturalists and the garden curator. curator. It was an absolutely incredible year, and I spent time down there. It's just, what a beautiful place and amazing work that they're doing. It's just, it's, it's incredible. Just absolutely breathtaking down there, so. Uh, dock removal at Boom Island. <laughs> this is interesting. So due to the large amount of water in the spring and not enough water in the fall, along with the low water levels this year, the Boom Island docks were resting on the bottom and needed to be pulled to the landing. Staff with the assistance of a front and loader and using 200 feet of rope were able to pull the dock and transport them to our winter site for storage. We also had the city crane lift the stairs and brackets out. It was quite an endeavor. This year the docks were installed on May 24th, two weeks later than usual and removed on October 18th ending our season. The late install was due to high water levels, leaving us with very little assistance from the Great Mississippi this year. So if you could take a look at those pictures, this is the kind of work that's being done in, the, in, in our system. And this was just another example of uh, really the hard work. But uh, we wanted to share that with you all on uh, what our staff do almost every day. So great work by our staff, so thank you. And then the Forest Arborist interviews. Make sure I'm missing the actual header on this one. Yep, we're good. Uh, forest Arborist Interviews. The Forestry Department conducted interviews for the position of Arborist. This is a collective process that is held at McCray Park and involves 11 current Arborist and crew leaders. Each candidate participates in oral interview as well as scoring and practical skills. These include proper use of a chainsaw, safety climbing, and tree maneuvering a bucket truck. This particular group was well qualified and should result in a round of new hires. If you have a chance to ever go see this, it's pretty incredible. So with that, commissioners, that is the updated report of officers. If you have any questions, we are available to answer. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Superintendent. Always fun to hear these things um, and the good works that's going on. So gang, we are back to our um, uh, resolution amended uh, suspending rules we are at so I'm going to go for um, Commissioner Thompson first thank you president Forney I would like to after our discussion realizing that my amendment is currently on the table I believe as the phrase goes I would like to uh, pull my withdraw my amendment because people have crafted different things in the in the time sense so I would like to withdraw that in the effort of other things that have been spoken toward thank you thank you commissioner Musich. thank you president forney i'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules uh for the purpose of discussing a new uh a, a new amendment to the resolution that was initially proposed in the packet okay. all those in favor of suspending the rules signify by saying aye aye, aye. 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 roll call roll call vote oh sorry again <laughs> thank you secretary sorry sorry about the rigmarole everybody we're making it. Point of parliamentary procedure. Does that need a second? Yes. So. Okay. It does need a second. So if you didn't want to have this discussion, you could have killed it, but not seconding it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Commissioner Thompson. Yes. Commissioner Schaefer. Yes. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Menz. Aye. Commissioner Alper. Aye. Vice President Abeni. Aye. President Forney. Aye. You have eight votes. Thank you. That action moves forward. So, okay. On now I'd like to propose an amendment to the original resolution that Meg wrote up. Um, and I'm, I'm, what I'm moving to do is amending the re resolution as follows. And I would like to provide um, the logic that I employed in changing the due date of the application to Sunday from Monday, in that many of us work 
and I would, I would like us all to have at least 24 hours <laughs> in which to review the applications yeah. um, rather than just that one night. Um, so th that was the intention there. Okay, so uh, what I'm proposing is keeping everything from that original resolution, and then when you get to the part where it says, um, under number one, where it says completing an application by Monday, November 13th by 5 p.m., we would swap out that date with Sunday, November 12th by 5 p.m. And then we would add the language, the following questions will be incorporated into the application and the application shall include the optional demographic information option the MPRB uses for other appointment applications incorporated into the application by staff. And then the questions are, uh, number one, where do you currently live in Minneapolis and how long have you lived in the city? Number two, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing Minneapolis parks? Number three, what do you think is the greatest opportunity for Minneapolis parks? Number four, what unique skills and experiences from your life do you think would be helpful in your ability to be a good advocate for constituents? And I'm sorry, that's a, it's not supposed to be a period. It's supposed to be a question mark. Um, what unique skills and experiences from your life do you think would be helpful in your ability to work with fellow commissioners and staff? Number six, what is the role of a parks commissioner? Number seven, what service opportunities within the parks have you participated in and in what capacity? And then number seven, what is a recent board decision you agreed or disagreed with and why? Um, then <clears throat> I'm suggesting we add a new paragraph, number two. So strike the one that's in the original and replace it with this. All persons who apply for the vacancy are invited to meet each other and park commissioners on Tuesday, November 14th from 5 to 6 p.m. And then at 6 p.m., the Committee of the Whole will convene in the boardroom to discuss who they want to invite back for an interview on November 15th and adopt any other process or rules for filling the vacancy regarding the timeline for interviews and the voting process. Um, there would be no change to number three, and the resolve clause would stay the same. And to provide some context around, uh, oh, may I provide some context, uh, President Forney, or would you like me to turn my light back on? Um, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, to provide some context around um, why I'm not defining how we're going to conduct interviews or d determine that piece, um, I assume the rest of you were as shocked and surprised that we'd be doing this this week as I was yeah. and have really only, <laughs> like, I'm still processing that the Vice President Crudup is gone. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so, <sighs> I think we, we should see how many applicants we have before we decide how we're going to work that process. I mean, if it's 100 people, that's going to be a totally different approach than if we have 20. Mm -hmm. um, and so rather than trying to define that right now or craft that from the dais without really thinking about it, um, I'm giving us the option to use that meeting um, to, to make those choices. So. That, that's the logic I have there. So the rest of the stuff under that is if you guys are not on board with, with the idea of um, postponing that part of the decision-making process to when we've had time to process it a bit more and, and have a better feel for it. Um, but anyway, that, that's where I'm at. And I, do I need a second? I think I need a second still. Second. Oh, oh Secretary Ringel, sorry. Um, thank you, uh, President Forney. Um, Commissioner Musich, I have just two clarifying questions. One, um, in your second paragraph, you indicate people are invited, not yep. required. Mm -hmm. yep. I want to make sure that if somebody can't attend that meeting, we know if they're still viable to be considered for an interview or if not. Okay. Yeah, so, so I, my understanding is that, you know, these the people that are potentially putting their hats in the ring also... Uh, may have other life commitments <laughs> that would prevent them from attending. It, it's not, I do not want to dictate to anyone that they have to do that. I mean, obviously, I would like them to show up for the interview, that that is something that I think should be required, that you be interviewed by the body that's choosing you. Um, but if they can't make it to the optional meet and greet, that shouldn't be a disqualifying factor. Okay, so if I have that correct, then the meet and greet on the 14th would be optional? Yep, and here at headquarters, and, and I didn't specify that in this. 
Okay, at HQ. And then the um, interview, if they were selected to move to that round, would be required? Yes, the, and that would be on the 15th. On the 15th, yep, got it. So I'd also like to add, since you clarified that, um, Secretary Ringel is not only put headquarters, but put the address. So that would to me. Otherwise, and then this the question mark at the end of the sentence four. Otherwise, I think this is, it, to me, at least incorporates, you know, what I'm interested mm -hmm. in. Sorry, Commissioner um, Schaefer. I, I think that it would be difficult um, to vote for the new commissioner during the board meeting um, and potentially awkward for everyone else who doesn't get voted in. Um, to be present and then see the one person come forward and everybody else is left in the audience. I would prefer for that person to have at least 24 to 48 hours to prepare for the meeting. It's our budget meeting. They're gonna wanna meet with President Forney, figure out the rules, have at least some feeling of competency and not just be totally winging it from the dais that night. Mm -hmm. The other issue that I have with this format is I think we need to be clear about the process with the public now and not be deciding 48 hours before the vote whether we're going to have whatever the process might be. I think it would be better to be clear. We could do that. I mean, we could. But I think it would be better for us to determine now um, our way forward. Um, so I would prefer to have a half an hour meeting maybe Sunday night, where we all cast our votes. We all get the information on Friday. As soon as it's submitted, we can look it all over the weekend whenever we have time. Have a half an hour vote on Sunday. We all submit our votes. Jennifer tells us who's in the running. It might be five. It might be three. It might be whatever the limit is. We set according to these rules. And then they come back Monday night or Tuesday night for hour and a half, or we're, we're in an hour meeting. Uh, we're half an hour social, and or however we would want to do it. And then they, ha then they know, everybody knows, they have 24 hours to prepare for the meeting, read the agenda, read the amendments, and be ready to vote on our budget with us. Is my preference. Commissioner Menz. In hearing that, I'm also wondering if, and maybe legal counsel can help, if we, appoint or elect this person, do they have to be here for, like, do they have to sit in that seat on the November 15th, or should we make them eligible for the, the first December meeting when they can review the budget, um, accept our amendments? It's going to be almost impossible for them to participate like we do in the budget process. So I think it might be a good, maybe I can make a friendly amendment that we move that the, that the elected or appointed commissioner be placed in the first December meeting. May I ask a clarifying question, President Forney? Sure. Um, so are you suggesting that we would amend number three to note that we would vote on November 15th during the full board meeting to fill the vacancy and then the swearing in would occur at our first December meeting. December, so our first regular meeting in December, or our, our first meeting in December, that would be the meeting where we adopt the budget. The meeting where we adopt the budget. Okay. And I would include, and that could possibly be a step four, instead of amending step three. Okay. So if, if the board, so I'll move the, can I move the amendment? Can I suspend the rules? Um, I, I think I can accept a friendly amendment. Okay. So I, I would, I would accept the friendly amendment that we would swear the um, the appointee would be sworn in at the board's meeting on December 5th prior to the adoption of the budget. Uh, Madam President, I, th I think in the draft that's three, you'd say the board will vote on December, November 15th meeting during the full board to fill the vacancy at its December Sixth regular meeting or whatever the date you want to pick you could put that just that would be the only amendment you need instead of at its regular meeting that night you just say at its December whatever the date of the meeting is you want to pick to do it no, December 5th is what's being suggested by Commissioner Menz so that's what he wants to which do. is our most our least public of all meetings. 
I don't know if that's a conflict. Yeah. I feel like it is. I mean, he can make whatever amendment he wants. So I think that's, is that your intent? That's the friendly amendment. The friendly amendment is for the, for the, the budget, the December 5th meeting. Okay, so I'd like to hear from folks in your comments around the other components of this, also how you feel about when they should be sworn in. Because I'm, I'm happy to entertain friendly amendments. Okay, so I don't know who's speaking. I think that... Um, Can I finalize my, yeah. my thoughts? So I think that that is really important to, to consider. I, I personally feel uncomfortable with appointing someone, having them come and sit in that chair immediately. It doesn't feel... Gen it doesn't feel like it's going to be helpful. So, Commissioner Musage, I think you are next. Oh, I'm Have sorry. I meant to terminate. Okay. This. All right. So, Commissioner uh, Thompson. Thank you, President Forney. Um, I, I, I was just writing as we're talking. Like, we can either be timely or we can have a really deep vetting. And although I appreciate what Commissioner Schaefer's trying to say, the the reality is for many of us, myself at least, is that the the series of days at that particular time are just difficult, as this week has been difficult, um, to, to find the time in this sc scope to do it. So I, I, I know we're all trying to figure out how to, you know, build the ship where we're flying it. Um, I, I support this idea with the friendly amendment that we can vote somebody in and then not avoid the potential awkwardness of them coming up here. Also, just then it would give them two weeks to be sort of onboarded in a very truncated onboarding, but there'd be something where they don't have to be immediately shoved into the public eye. Um, that I think that, that's, that speaks to me in a positive way and they can at least understand the budget and we can try to do our best moving forward. I just wanted to speak toward that. Thank you. Commissioner Bene. Um, I, thank you. I agree, actually, with that. And, and also, you know, we would need also to have this person sworn in. That way we wouldn't have to have the person that does the swearing in hanging around this whole time while we're mm -hmm. figuring it out. So, um, and it's a little game showy. Oh, you won. Come on up. So <laughs> I, think, I think it's better to wait, wait till that December meeting. And, but I think, and I think the rest of this is fine. Um, Two nights, though, I'm hearing it's two nights, maybe. Okay. I'm yeah. going to go to uh, Secretary Ringo first. Um, thank you, President Forney. Um, Council Rice, are we able to do anything but the budget on the budget exactly. um, <laughs> adoption night at the board, at the at City Hall? We uh, renamed this building at that meeting. I, I, mean, I think swearing I just, in an officer is... Um, I think that would be allowed. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's, you have to uh, uh, convene the meeting, and the answer is yes. I think okay. A person could be sworn in. And then the second, I think the board rules gives the board secretary the ability to administer the oath of office. You are a notary, correct? Uh, secretary Ringel, you're a notary public? I am not. Oh. We've got others, though. Yeah. So could she speak? We'll have those questions answered uh, the next time the board meets. Okay, I think uh, Commissioner Elper. Okay, I prefer that we don't um, bring in this person at our least public meeting of the year. I, I have a new idea that goes off of this, which is great, thank you for putting that together, that we would move it from Tuesday, November 14th to be Monday, and at Monday, we would have um, this social time from 5 to 6. Then we'd meet as a committee of the whole, and we would scrap all the interview. The, our interview would be our social time. We, we're already going to have everybody fill out these questions. We're probably already going to know these people. You can talk to them and mingle on your own and ask them the questions you want during the social time. And then we'll go back as a board. And we'll deliberate. I don't know, can we vote in a committee of the whole? I can't rem no, we can't vote. Okay, but we would come to a consensus. That's the part I'm not sure of. Okay, but anyway, uh, <laughs> hadn't gotten that far, but it would be Monday, and then that would give us all day Tuesday for this person to prepare, 
all day Wednesday for them to get like trained in and then we would look smooth and together at our Wednesday board meeting which is a big day I just want to say that I've just learned about for our legislative committee so I would prefer not to tack on like a lot of stuff that day and I think that would be a way to have one meeting mm -hmm. one extra meeting if, if we're willing to scrap the quote-unquote like formal interview which we don't have questions for so that would eliminate the need for more questions that's that's my thought <laughs> I, I don't know if I've got the authority or not but I see a lot of administrative staff that's sitting out there that I feel that you guys could probably mm -hmm. go for the evening <laughs> unless you're really interested in what we're doing anyway I just want to give you permission as far as I'm concerned so uh, thank you all <laughs> Al gives you the thumbs up <laughs> yeah right oh good good anyway so um, you guys can listen to the tape tomorrow <laughs> anyway, sorry okay uh, Commissioner uh, Elper you finished yeah so okay. I guess I guess we've got a um, um, this on the floor and Billy proposed the December friendly 5th amendment. the friendly amendment and so I would say no to the friendly amendment because I think we could do it if we move it back one day to Monday and scrap the official interview okay before I, I'm gonna go for Commissioner Schaefer yeah I like that idea um, and I, I appreciate saving time on meetings <laughs> so yes I would support Monday um, I'm not sure how the voting would work um, we'd need some clarification maybe from Secretary Ringgold but um, again um, we may have if we have 85 applicants they would all be at this thing and we may need some narrowing down but I, I, I like this direction for 20 people Commissioner Muses. Oh, I'm on. I'm sorry. Thanks, President Forney. Um, so I don't know how we get to consensus on who we're going to select in a meeting with when we can't vote. Like that doesn't. I don't. I don't know how we operationalize that. Uh, Council Rice, you seem to have um, suggestions. The board could call a special meeting for that night on Monday the 13th. Yeah, and then that would be meeting. the meeting that you just right. do the whole thing. So you'd have a okay. meeting ahead of time or a social hour or interview and then go to the board meeting I, I think the if you go in that direction you could always adopt the process but the issue about the public should know what the voting procedure would be I think that if that's you could follow that path you probably want to specify the voting procedure is, is, is it is, to go off this so one of my thought is it possible that we just have a spreadsheet of each person who applied we do this social thing we just say everyone does yes or no it's released publicly what each commissioner did yes or no the, the the sheet and then we count it up if there are multiple six or plus people then we can go into a smaller discussion or whatever but then that's just a really quick way for us just to be like okay these five folks they they have you know seven six eight whatever we can go from there is that possible to do like kind of a sheet thing do it on paper rather than just vocally like all right Jim John number one Jim John number two Jim John number 85 you know I think madam president I think that would be possible but the ballot would have to be signed by each commissioner and the made part of the permanent record and disclosed to the public okay but we can use paper okay I think that's great and, and I think that you could use paper um, and then yes you, you could to make it more public the commissioners could each say I voted for a B D G and J or, or you could call a roll and rather than one just on the first round you say that for the first preliminary round you could say I'd like to vote for these people and the secretary could keep a roll that way speaking of secretary Ringel um, great so I what I would thank you president Forney what I would say then is that instead of it being a 6 p.m. committee of the whole we'd say it's a 6 p.m. special meeting and then you have the ability to vote in it okay so here's what I 
think we have consensus around so far because there's still pieces we clearly don't have consensus around. <laughs> um, I think we have consensus that we want to modify the first paragraph, number one, to amend the application submission date from Monday, November 13th by 5 p.m. to a different date. But I'm hearing multiple dates. So first item of business I'd like us to hammer out. What date do we want people to have um, completed that application for us by? Is it that Friday, Friday. prior to this week? I'm hearing yeah. lots of Fridays. Friday. Yeah. yeah, and I'm saying it because I, I, Midnight. we can do things online, but we also need some people will be sending them the post, so. Okay, so Friday. 10th. Thank you, November 10th. And we're not putting a time because some of them might come in the mail, or what time does our mail come? Does it come before 5 p.m.? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Let's say 5 p.m. Um, if we wanted, if we want to accommodate mail or, you know, when there would be staff available to receive it, I'm going to say 4.30 okay. at, the, at the visitor services desk. Good idea. Okay. Okay, so, all right. So oh, wait, the 10th is a holiday. Yes, it is. We'll is be it closed. Really? Yeah. We're closed. Oh, I thought Veterans Day was on Saturday. It, it is. Oh, we're observing, observing it on Friday? Yeah, okay. I'll just observe the Friday. I don't know. Friday. <laughs> oh, we need to start doing floating holidays. Okay. Um, so, do we want it to be then Thursday the 9th? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Thursday. Got to do it. Okay, so Thursday. Um, I'm going to say from a staff perspective, Friday's a push, and we're happy to make Friday work, but I think we would we would risk errors getting things out tomorrow. And I would like to not risk errors. Oh, but you, you're not saying that we can't suggest the due date be the 9th. I'm not saying that. I'm saying getting the application, application right online and everything yeah, tomorrow feels fine. like a push. OK, but, but by Friday, people should be able to apply for this. And we'll be sending stuff out. I, I will just in general <laughs> say to the a tight timeline on this is going to be scrutinized. When you have a very short time for people to be able to apply, it's going to look like you were trying to create barriers for people applying. So I just, I want, I want you to just have that in your senses that that could be a criticism that comes up. So by taking it, if we move it to, to the Thursday, ninth, we're still giving people a week. Right. Yeah. I just, just to be, just to have that as a, an awareness, I think is important. Are people comfortable with a week to fill out this application? I am, and I, I'm saying that because I've probably been notified of at least a half a dozen people who are interested, so. Okay. I feel the word is out. So I'm hearing consensus around the 9th being our due date by 4.30 p.m. Yes. And then, um, is that evens the playing field for people that want to deliver it by hand or by mail or by fax or online? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm hearing consensus around the questions. I, I would like to change service opportunities to engaged because I think people have played in leagues or they've done, you know, I run around, you know, the river or whatever. How have you engaged with parks? I, I really agree with that. Thank you for okay. saying that because I think just a user is fine as well. Uh, you know, right? Exactly. Um, and kind of on that, I will say so. In some ways, I almost don't want. I I like I you know I get eight. I get why we would ask that. You know, you're you're you know you're engaged. You're looking at it. You're you know we, you we kind of want to see where you go. But in some ways, what has made this board so well is even though we're a political institution, we're not very political about it. And I think if we get folks who are kind of like, I'm on this side of a thing or this side of a thing, yeah. we might kind of yep. Yep. tie onto that rather than who people are, I guess, and, and values and I, I agree with that, Commissioner Olson. And maybe, maybe we could shift it to um, what issues 
Okay. Have you heard of what what topics, recent board topics, have you enjoyed? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's another way. I, I don't know. I'm happy to scrap that one. If there's one thing you could do in our parks to change our parks, what would it be? Maybe? I don't know. I mean, aren't we saying that already, though? With yeah. the, what's the I biggest mean, we challenge? Could just, what's our greatest opportunity? We could just scrap it. Okay, and then if our individual stuff, we can yeah. say, you can ask, like, hey, how would you Sorry, vote President on Forney, I just let this go totally <laughs> off, <laughs> off of it. We're not controlled Oh, I know. Right Nobody's now. doing Are anything. Are you okay with that? I'm totally fine with it. Okay. Sweet. <laughs> I mean, we're being productive, goodness. gang, and I, I appreciate all of it. Okay, so I'm striking eight. Eight's gone. Can Seven, we want to update to something about engagement, but I don't know what because... How have, you how, how have you engaged with our Minneapolis parks? Okay. I like that. Six, I was wondering if we could put what values will you bring to your role as parks commissioner instead of what do you think about... I mean, like, I want to know what values the person... Once yeah. It's feels very like subjective, whereas I, the role, I think, is critical, in my opinion. I think it's important to, have the, to know that if, to, what level of people know what we actually do. I think it's just that was the nature of the purpose behind that question. I mean, if you tested me before... No, my knowledge. Like after, so yeah. that, that's kind of you know. I think no, like, that's my point. It's yeah. like what is it was sort of like a metric of okay, so like what is your yeah. working knowledge? It could be that's up all to it was. Each individual yeah, it's, it wasn't how a punitive is, idea, but yeah. I, it could go what skills, values, and experiences. I just think that the word values and like I want to know, I, I want to understand like what the person thinks are their values that they're bringing to this board. I think yeah, that that's need important. To expand number four. Good. To say what unique skills, values, and experiences from your life do you think would be helpful? I think just what skills. I, I mean, do they have to be unique? Okay, probably not, no. But also put values. What skills, values, and experiences? Yes. You can add values to those two questions? That would be great. Everyone's cool with that? Cool. Yep. Okay. Great. Values. Thanks. What values, skills, and experiences from your life? Yes? Yes. yes. Good. We want Perfect. skills first. Does it Values, matter? skills, experiences. <laughs> okay. Values, values. Okay, so questions are good. No additional changes at yeah. this time. Are we, are we cutting eight? Men's We're cutting finished? eight. Yeah. Eight's gone We're and finished. seven's been Light replaced okay. with how have you engaged with our Minneapolis parks? Great. Okay, then number two. This is where I don't think we have consensus yet. <laughs> Um, Monday or Tuesday, is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Okay. We have a toss-up right now between Monday or Tuesday. Um, and the thing I think we agree about is we want to have like a, a social hour preceding the special meeting, no matter what day it is. No disagreements. Okay. Um, so Monday, Tuesday. Oh, I have risk of outing. I would prefer sure. Monday. I have a conflict on Tuesday, um, and I could get out of it, but I, I would. I, I mean, I like the idea of Monday in the Anybody sense that people are to, to Monday. I don't. I, Monday's great. Monday's, Monday's okay. Okay, then we'll leave it up. We'll put it. We'll change this now to Monday, November thirteenth, from five to six p.m. Great. Um, um, to, so let's see, and I want to phrase it so that people don't think it's required. So all persons who apply for the vacancies are invited to meet. Um, a non-mandatory. Yes, are invited to an, uh, um, meet each other and park commissioners at 5, 6 p.m. This is not required. Encouraged. Are encouraged, okay. Encouraged to attend an, an, an optional social hour? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Meet and greet? Yeah. Meet and greet. Meet and greet. But but with uh, com commissioners and other candidates, like I think they need to know that they will be, um, we'll be there. Yeah. They're not coming yeah. for champagne. Yeah, <laughs> hang on, hang on. Whomever, I don't know. Shh, for a second, please. With park commissioners. Okay, so uh, this is what I think it's going to read now. It, just the first part. All persons who apply for the vacancies are encouraged to attend a meet and greet with other applicants and park commissioners on Monday, November 13th from 5 to 6 p.m. No, pub no public. 13th. Oh, Monday the 14th? Wait a minute. 
Monday. Monday the 13th. 13th. You said no 13th. public? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a, it has to be a public meeting, so the public, by default, can attend. I'm just not explicitly saying it in this okay. resolution. Um, with other applicants and park commissioners. The park commissioners and the public. Public meet and greet. We call it a public meet and greet. Yeah. Greet, but you could say meet each other, park commissioners, and the public. Somebody wants to come in and hmm. you did that with the superintendent. Mm -hmm. We had a reception downstairs. And anybody could come. I'm going to put meet and greet. I think it's approachable so for people. Walk, yeah, it's not a, so it's just you yes. get to meet them, and that's yes. the meeting can be whatever you want formal, informal, social. Meet and greet conveys the right. And I understand that it's a colloquialism, but I think it's going to make this as a, the most approachable you want. pitch to the public. Okay, so. So we like the meet and greet? Meet and greet, thumbs up. All persons who apply for the vacancy are encouraged to attend a public meet and greet with other applicants and park commissioners on Monday, November 13th from 5 to 6 p.m. So far, so good? Bingo. Okay. Um, at 6 p.m., a special meeting will convene in the boardroom to, this is where we don't have consensus. What's happening at that meeting? To deliberate and decide. Select. Deliberate and select? And select. And nominate. Or do we nominate? Deliberate, nominate, select. select to fill the vacancy. Yeah, I think to, to fill, fill the vacancy. The vacancy. Right. Okay. The vacancy. Exactly. At 6 p.m., a here. special meeting will convene in the boardroom to select I'd say fill the vacancy okay to fill the vacancy to fill the vacancy strike that will the nominations um, have an opportunity to speak at that space well we were saying no we no. were saying we were going to have conversations with them at the meeting at, at the, the earlier meet and greet and we're going to have read yes. their question responses. Okay. And we will have their demographic information as well. So if they're unable to attend, we know more about them. But all of the folks who attend the meet and greet or public will not be nominated. No. Because we will have to push. We're going to have to. We, we now need. Yes. If this is what we're agreeing to, we now need to define what that process is because we're not going to have another opportunity to do that. Could we deliberate in a closed? No. Oh, not a closed no. session. Oh, okay. There's no uh, closed session. No closed session. Right. here. Okay. We have to do it publicly. Yeah. As of six o'clock, we start. So it'd be like a regular out. meeting. Yeah. Just it's special because it's on a different day. Special. Okay, so we've got no place where we're agreeing that we are convening to fill the vacancy. Okay. Um, but now we need to determine what that process will be because. Mm -hmm. We're not giving ourselves the out of waiting to define it. So um, I have some suggestions for how to do that. And if you look at the bottom of what I passed out, um, we can cross out the bit about the interviews, but then instead we would vote um, on the appointment utilizing the same methodology we utilize for selecting the board president. Um, nominations would be made and seconded, and then the board would vote by saying the name of the nominee they support. I left it at that because I figure we need to also then <laughs> um, hash out together what our criteria is for continuing to advance right. nominees. Yeah. Like if, 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 if we don't reach consensus on that first vote, how do we handle then subsequent votes? Right. Um, with a board what? president vote, I don't know that, I think we just keep voting until we until someone reaches the threshold. Do we want to do the same thing here? Like, does, how do people feel about that? Or do you have some other way you want to do this? Well, what happened to the paper? Oh, do we want yeah, to I, So the paper? I, think, I think we just do like an Excel spreadsheet, yes. you know, whatever, uh, Y axis, whatever the one that goes down, it's all their names. And then on the top, it's, it's all of us. And it's just, we do yes or no. And somehow, whatever way we do it, we, then we'll see who has the most. Maybe we'll have a few eight you know, folks, right? And then we can go from there. I, you know, I just think we take the top, right? Like, like we, and in that way we can 
very quickly and we don't have to nominate because if we nominate then you have the first person and you're like well I kind of want to discuss this person too or whatever I don't know so but I think that's a good way for at least us to know who the very top of our choice is but if there's a better idea I, I'm sorry to cut cut in I, I, I like that idea could we take a 15 minute recess between the, mm -hmm. the social hour and our our special me our special meeting Such where special we meeting. where we do that activity on our own mm. um, and give it to our board secretary who compiles it we were already told we can't do that we can't okay. do I, that I think that would invite you having a bunch of private conversations that people mm -hmm. um, okay. suggest I, I do think what commissioner also is saying is that the first ballot would be a spreadsheet where all commissioners were given a ballot that they could mark, oh. and that you would uh, then just, it would be public, the commissioner would sign it, and the secretary would record it, and you could say, there might be 20 candidates, but each commissioner could get three votes, five votes, some number of votes, and you get to allocate them. You don't have up to three votes, let's say, like an RCV thing. I mean, I don't want to do that, but they, I, that idea, then you would get some, at least preliminary ranking. <sighs> You could share that amongst each other and say, well, it appears that there's a handful of candidates that might have enough to be seriously considered. And that's similar to what Thompson was putting forward. So I'm, so I'm kind of thinking we vote on every single one. We say yes or no for each one, and then we'll have whoever has the most yes votes in some pile of folks. Maybe it'll be one person. That'd be nice. Can I suggest, and, oh, sorry. And then, and then I'm just saying, and then in sub, subsequent, maybe it's something like, so let's say that's 10. Let's say in subsequent votes, each commissioner gets to vote, uh, gets a number of vote, a number of yes votes equal to half rounded down the remaining folks. So say it's, it's you know, we end up with 10 folks who are tied with the same amount of things. You only get five votes, and then we do five, and then we do two, and then we're down to two people, and then we can say, all right, John or Jane, or whatever. I think it's half rounded down each, including the first round. So we have a mathematician. May, may I suggest us. something? Just yeah. like, yeah. we're all really excited about, at the park board I've learned, we like our colored sticky dots. Oh, the dots. And we could put up, I'm totally serious, but we I can put up all the applications okay. on the wall. We only get five or ten or whatever we agree on, and we put up our sticky dots, and if, like it goes back to what I was saying about the threshold, if they meet the threshold of four, uh, on that Monday meeting, four or above, then they're the ones we discuss. And then after an hour, we put those people back up, we get less sticky dots, we get three this time, right? And we put those people up, and then, then whoever even gets close to the threshold of six, those are the ones that, those are the only people we're allowed to maybe present, and then we have two full days to digest it, and be like, okay, these are our leading candidates, and then we can talk like we do all the time, you know, when board meetings aren't happening, we're calling each other and all those fun, all those fun things, you know? I'm thinking. Um, so, when do we vote? No, right there. Well, okay, yeah. and I'm okay yeah. with that. I'm okay with that. I'm just throwing out the sticky dots is what I was excited about. I like the okay. sticky dots idea. Thank kind of you. It have to be that we, yeah. like, that almost like we're all here and yeah. no, one person thing. goes and does their sticky dots. Mm -hmm. and well, next, and we I mean, could all have our own color, color or yeah. you could print things with our names on it or something. Okay, this is not a no. So then the, the goal is then... That just seems like to do rounds of voting via that methodology with the intention of selecting that night. a person that night that we would then uh, vote on filling the vacancy with. Do we then want to have that person be sworn in at our meeting on the 15th? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, because I think we talked about how the meeting in December is like the least public meeting. Yeah. That's, yep. I think, well, how we move the dates a little bit more aggressively mm -hmm. closer to now. I mean, do we feel like that's asking someone to step into a role they've gotten no preparation for? I mean, all of you had weeks of training. I, I don't like that idea. But I'm, do we want I'm okay to say to the, first, the first recorded meeting, which is our first regular meeting in December, which is the 6th, is when they get sworn in? I would I that too. 
think that's uh, I think it's essential that they be able to weigh in on the budget, and that's why I think the 15th to me has been an important thing for us to be able to have. And I appreciate but that. But I have a question. Yeah, why? Why are they going to? How are they going to get up to speed on what's in the budget to be able to make an educated decision at that time? I mean, I've been digesting it for over a week, and I feel like I'm still finding things in it. And we're asking them to do that in two days. They don't have to, but I, I, I mean, they don't have to weigh in. But I'm just saying, I think they should have that opportunity. Why? I mean, why? Why? I don't understand. Because the community, which we say our, our voters want representation. Okay. That's, could, that to me has been the whole thing. Could we just go back to the the dots? Yeah, I love sorry. that idea. Just mm -hmm. and then hold yep. hold on the date no, for agree. right now. And um, I wanted to ask the mathematician here: Is it could we do something like because we don't know if we're going to get twenty applicants or eighty, but could we say we get the first in round one we get X number of dots or twenty five percent of the I think that's great yes, number percentage. of applicants. Yes. Good. I think and then a, once we get to like five or fewer or three or fewer, could we have a discussion about it? Because I, I, I would, it, I think that would be, it would be nice to have a little bit of discussion, but not like 20 people worth of discussion. Yeah. Like yeah. the top two or three applicants. Also, do, do the... Do the sticky note the stickies have to be different colors, or can they just be our each? names? Yeah, no. or even our names. Does it have to be? Do we have to have a public? I'll go with I'll go with the sticky notes, but I do think for just the visual of the camera, et cetera, the spreadsheet might be easier. Uh, yeah. And we all pass it to Jennifer, and Jennifer tallies them, and then she goes to the camera and announces the next round, and then we go. Around My only critique with that is that there's a let so. We all know I usually have Otherwise, to vote first. Otherwise, we're going to have 80 people. But no, I recognize that. But like, if we're passing it along, we're seeing each other's votes. Yep. And it's no, no, no. It's it's individual. Individual. It's individual. Oh, individually. Individual. Oh, this right. goes back to my original idea. OK, fine. Sorry. Individual I'm, ballots, yeah, we have to I sign. Really, and then the. You know, there will be cameras. I mean, I think that the chance of a, if, you, if the commissioners are voting and just say, oh, you're voting for X, and there's a, I, I just don't see for a public meeting and something that's important. I, I think the written ballot with uh, each commissioner signing is much more preferred okay. Yep. Okay. than that's putting names nice. on the board with different uh, colors. Jennifer? The sticky notes would Go be a bit it. more on brand for us, but Jennifer? spreadsheets are so okay. What are you saying? Jennifer, please. I just want to make sure I understand <clears throat> what, it, what it would be. Is So each, if we do 25% of applicants, yep. yes, okay, so let's just say we get 12 applicants. So you each get... <laughs> Three. <laughs> <Here's the laughs> optimism. You each, you each get three ballots. Three votes. Three votes. Three votes on the first ballot. You'd have a ballot that would have all the names, and uh, the com you, you could do a spreadsheet format so that Commissioner Olson has. Maybe we should just instead of making it complicated with percentages, maybe we should just say on the first round we get five. Okay, but I, I'm just trying to logistically or figure out. Or 20% less. How I'm counting it, <laughs> right? So, so you each give me an individual piece of paper with five. I think with five. And then names I'm tallying. Yeah. I'm tallying that. Yes. Yes. And okay. you have the spreadsheet. So and that's I'm, probably easier rather than each commissioner getting a spreadsheet. They get a ballot. First ballot, five votes. Let's right. say. Yep. So, I, so initially I give you a five three one. Initially I give you each your own customize. It says your name on it, and then all of the applicants on it. And you do whatever we agree upon. You vote for a certain number of them. Yes. And then I take those and I tally them and I tell you, look, looks like you all voted for one person once. No, I'm not saying that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then there is this piece of what, at what point do they, do they drop off? Right, in that first ballot, your votes could be really... Scattered? Scattered. Mm -hmm. there was and, well, well, that, that, that's why I think that's we fine. get more votes rather yes. than just a few mm -hmm. because if we have just a few then it's scattered whereas if we start off first ballot we get to vote yes or no on every single one we will get a group of people who all have eight or all have seven the, or something like I that don't, I don't uh, know let's that's let's just we all and know we people we might want uh, I let's, think you'd say that if we have five and they're all different we can't we get let's say we get a hundred people come in and we all get five okay then we've immediately narrowed it down to 40 because we each get five and now there's 40 and now we can go with percentages but like even if they're all different if my five are 
completely, there's zero overlap, we still are already immediately down to 40. So like, I don't see that okay. being but an issue. Um, how are we down to 40 if that? Because there's eight of us with five and names. No, I know we have 40 Even votes. Even if they're all different. I'm saying if we have 100 names and we, we would immediately put it down to 40 names, even if there's no overlap, um, and that's max. okay. 40 names max. Yes, that'd if be we the were maximum. all to put five different people from each other. 40 names max. Oh, 40 individuals. Starting place to say, okay, all of us at least vet, we, we like these people, and then we start making the case for it. Yeah. What if we let the um, staff determine know the rounds people. of voting once we see the number of people we get applicants for? I've spoken. No, I think it's better <laughs> before decide at least some <laughs> process. I, mean, okay, I think right. the idea that you take a, a, for a preliminary ballot rather than a nomination, you won't elect anyone in the first ballot. You'll take basically the first ballot will be a poll. or a, yep. And then you could um, say that you'll, um, so if you have that at that point, somebody then could be nominated or something like that after the first ballot, or maybe you do a second ballot where you'd all get three votes, and then at some point after that second ballot, you could any the floor would be open for a nomination for somebody to fill the vacancy. Okay, so what I think I'm hearing from all of you, <laughs> as uh, I don't know, I don't know why I volunteered myself for this job. I know, thank I you so much. I appreciate all of you are so. <laughs> So anyone who gets a sticker vote would move on to the next round. Okay, so the, the first one, the first ballot, we're going to say is each commissioner may select up to five people to move to the next round. Okay? Okay. Five selection, five votes per commissioner. Then round two. If, okay, then I, wait, hang on. Okay. I'm going to say if if someone reaches the threshold of six. six votes, their name can be placed into nomination, or do we want to then have a discussion around anyone who's reached six or higher? Uh, I'm wondering the next round of balloting. If, if we have the five, we've all got these candidates, and then Secretary Ringel gives us what's left. Then if we get three, we could say only after that round, only people who received at least three stickers would move on. And then, I don't know what we do in the last round, we get one sticker. I, 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 I think each subsequent, I think the first one we can do an arbitrary five or whatever. But I think after that, doing it a proportional like 50% or whatever, mm -hmm. and we cut the lowest tier, and then the number drops, and we do another 50% and cut the lowest tier, and then we do another 50% and cut the lowest tier. There's going to be a problem making the ballots, too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the names that drop off, now what is... What It'll take mean? a while. It will take a while to produce the second round ballot, the third round ballot. And that's just something we have to do. And at some point, do we want to... Put a, put a name into nomination? I, I think, should we say, how many do we, how many people can we actually be up here and discuss between? Three? Three. I would say should we three say is max. If we get, then, so at some point, if we cut out half right, we're going to get to three or two or whatever, or four. And so we can say at that point, that balloting system will stop and the board will discuss openly. Maybe. What about? <laughs> I think it's a matter of discussion. At some point, if you can narrow the field, then the floor is open to the commission to make a nomination and see if there's eight votes or six votes for a, for a nomination. That's what it takes, six votes. So the first round with five votes, say, would work, and maybe you say there'll be a second round with, of those who receive votes in the first round, there'll be a second round vote uh, with three. But at any time, if the commissioner wants to make a motion to yeah. select someone, they can. Or, I mean, you could do five and then two, and then those two, whoever have the most, are also a ballot. And then we nominate the winner. So two rounds. Two rounds. Okay. So... I mean, it'll put it'll relieve a little bit of pressure. We might have four, 
three good people. And then it's a race to who nominates who first. I, I think you, know, you want I don't to be know. careful not to yeah. constrain your discretion based on some rules that you haven't applied yet. I mean, it, oh, at true. one point it, they did a system similar to this. One person had three votes, and then when for some reason on the next vote the person had none. So well. somebody might be, you know. It's, yeah. it's just tough because as we narrow it, who we think we want will change probably yeah yeah and and so yeah so one one thing when we when we do for example the vote of the president and there's maybe more than one nomination we don't vote on one nomination and then vote on the next nomination right. no i have all of the names there a b and c and when i call your name you tell me which one you want a b or c so there isn't like a race to who gets voted on mm. first. You end up voting essentially on a ballot that is all three as I call your name. And okay. then some of them drop off if you don't get to the, to the number you well, need. What if we did two rounds of five? The initial round is five. I mean, that seems to be consensus. And then the second round we get two stickers? I don't think they're going to be stickers, Billy. Whatever they are. Whatever. Two votes. And then... We open it up to the board <coughs> for nominations. How about for discussion and then or just a call or just a <laughs> roll call vote, like she says. You know, we deputy mm -hmm. secretary says that. You know, we have Thompson and we have okay, whomever. Well, I mean, that first. could be sixteen people, though, well, right? Like, so so the way that it works when we're doing the president is we can have multiple people in nomination and then we take a vote and the vote is not up or down on each one of those people, it's who's your selection of that cohort of people. And do we have six? Yeah, and do we have six? Right. And if not, then we need some further winnowing or discussion or something to get us there. Because at some point we have to get to six. We could get six on the first one. That'd be nice. Let's do that. Uh, I think the question would be, you could have two <laughs> nominations or you could just try to put the name forward and is it acceptable to six? I mean, you nominate candidate A and you have four votes. Okay, they don't get it, well then we're gonna nominate candidate B. Well, candidate B has three votes and then, I don't know, it's like you well, can that, But that's, that's not how we do the president role. I mean, that is, a, that is a methodology, but in here what she has is do it the way we do the president. And that, that was just a place to start, and, right. right? I mean. Yeah, I think. I like the consistency. I, I think it's, well. You're gonna to have to get to six, which is an extraordinary number. You elect presidents on a majority vote. You know, yeah. it's like either you have a choice, you have A or B. I, I so like the five. So that, I like the five votes to start out with. I think that's good. Do you yeah. want? Can we I've recap what we've got? Okay, so recapping. And then, what about if the last? I mean, I'm oh, sorry. No. Go for it. Five Steph. votes. Okay, so the initial piece we have is. Um, this is blah, blah blah blah. We will convene in the boardroom. To fill the vacancy. Uh, selection will occur at in this via this methodology. If yes, the preliminary ballot will allow for five votes per commissioner. Wait, five votes for. I'm going to start over because I want everyone to make sure that they're listening. So we're. We're getting no place to be all agree. Yeah. Um, we will have a balloting. Billy, the preliminary ballot please. will provide five votes per, per commissioner. Um, of applicants, those not receiving votes are removed from consideration for the next round of balloting. Mm -hmm. That's where we're at. <laughs> for the five votes. We're at the five votes. Yes. Yes. So we're on the first round of balloting. We get five votes. Anyone who didn't receive a vote in that initial ballot is removed from consideration at that point. I think we need to say any, any candidates receiving six votes or any group of candidates are just immediately put forward nomination. for nomination, right? Okay, so... Or do we do a second round? Is everyone okay with that? Are eligible for nomination. So I'm, I'm wondering if we do the five votes, we do the second round, and then we open it up to nominations. We don't all have to nominate a candidate. We're going to read the writing on the wall, most likely, right? Yeah, and, and 
what and then Tom, that becomes the president process. Yeah, what Tom is saying is that we may have people at the six vote threshold already on that first ballot. So they just skipped round two and are eligible for nomination? Right, yeah, so then we would put those names in nomination and then we vote. And if we don't, if we don't have six of the, that person or persons, then, then we have to another round. Right. Like, another like round. can you right. imagine a situation where you vote for someone, you find out that they have six other votes, and then you're like, nah, I want to actually vote for the, all these other people? Right. Because that, that's what not immediately putting someone who gets six forward like would mean. Yeah, I, agreed. I, I don't like the idea of voting five pe uh, from five people and it possibly being that one candidate gets six votes out of our 40. I don't think that well, that's... If we're, all, if we're all saying it, we're it, all it's saying, unlikely, I, I, I already want to vote for this person, and six of us say we'd be willing to vote for them. That, to me, should, in a sense, as Tom is saying, like just, okay, then let's talk about these people, but however if, many there are. But what if there's only one? Then easy peasy, let's go home. Well, maybe, but <laughs> I, I don't think that that's equitable or fair. Yeah, it might be my fifth choice. Yeah. And you might say, okay, fair. Wow. So then, yeah. that's know, why I, mean, I went four at the first good, time. But there's a difference between your first choice and your fifth choice. Okay. But so, they could be automatically eligible to be nominated by a commissioner. What we want to prevent is and like randomly nominating people at the end, right? We don't, we don't. But there's not a true election here. We're still going through the nomination process. Okay. So do so do we want then to say? Um, balloting will continue until one or more candidates reach a threshold of six votes, and at that point, any commissioner is eligible to put the names into consideration for a vote. I'm getting shaking heads from uh, Brian. I, I mean, you'll be very careful about constraining your ability to make a decision. Saying that somebody's got to get six votes, you might get to the point where it's uh, four and four, and then your rules. Are, you can always change your rules, but then if you're going to actually point. Mm -hmm. make it a rule, never I mean, had to think about changing things the before. rules. He's like, a, <laughs> a we, there's a rule on that. That's part of the yes. problem. <laughs> and we know we're going to get we're something. making the rules up as you go, yeah. or the vote. Um, so after the first round of five, let's say we have twenty people. Yep. What happens next? We That's get a new ballot okay. with 20 people. I, I think, I think, and half. we get two votes, or are all 20 of those people eligible for one of us to nominate? I don't want to, I mean, that's too many, right? That's too many. That's too many. How, how about that? I'm, you know, I've never <laughs> had to figure out a voting scenario before, but what if we only had two choices and we just saw if. Because it's a good point about your number five choice mm. and your number one choice, right? Mm. So I wonder if we only pick our top two, even if it's 80 people, and we just see, do we have six on anybody? Mm. Not a bad idea. Oh, yeah. So we're scrapping the Ooh. preliminary ballot five votes? Well, but if we don't, then we might have to go that route. Okay, is this, is this just too much because we're in the weeds? But if we kept the five and we just literally, like, if and it's... You know, we can choose, we could put, like, if you want to add that that's your first choice versus, like, oh, rank choice. yeah, we're ranking choice, okay? We're doing that. But, like, because. I don't think anybody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Okay, shot down. Shot through the heart. <laughs> okay. Um, All right, so. <laughs> so. I mean, the, the two, I mean, really, the five or the two, whatever, it's really arbitrary because in that first round, we're eliminating. Anyone who doesn't get a vote. Anyone who doesn't have support, enough yeah. support right, to get right, considered. Yeah, anywhere. exactly. I agree. And okay. so, and so I think one. two is okay. That makes things faster. And then we want that means there's going to be five. 16 people, right? Yes. Yes. Oh. That's, or there will be, be less. that means automatic. There could be less, there's a but lot at of most, right. True. Yeah. there will be 16 people. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And then we each get one vote. After that? Okay. After that, and... And then we can put people into, we can nominate people, and we vote? Yeah. And then we each yeah. get one, and then from then on, we each get one vote, and we just eliminate the lowest people. This makes me happy. Each time until we're down to... Th 
Three. We'll just say three. Okay. Or so I'll just say um, balloting continues until the pool of candidates has been reduced to three. Yes. Yes. So it's five, one, one. No, two. Oh, two, 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 two votes. Two, one. Oh, yeah, one, one. One, 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 oh, one. You're for the rest. Yeah. Two, one, one, one. Two, one yeah, so for everything, everything else. Three. Yeah. Until we reach three. Yeah. Okay. Then they have to sing a song. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll and we'll and then and we'll, we'll play just, kickball. Yeah. What? No. <gasps> this could just be solved with a pickleball tournament. <laughs> and then um. Definitely no. Winner, you're in. Definitely no. Okay. One. Sorry. So preliminary ballot is two votes per commissioner of applicants. Not rec those not receiving votes are removed from consideration for the next round of balloting. Subsequent rounds of balloting. Commissioners each get one each vote. Get one vote. Mm -hmm. Until the candidates with Until the lowest tally vote total in each round will be eliminated. Until oh, right. so so we have two candidates or until we vote. have three? Three. And three. Okay. three. Now there could be a situation though where we're we all like our own person or whatever. Right. Yep. And we get kind of stuck, but I think people will move. People are gonna have to be smart enough people to realize will like yeah. I can't get enough votes for this. Yes. Yep. I and and, and at, at some point I'll just be kind of quick, right? And I'll just be like, ah da 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 da. Um and we we can maybe change it on the fly. Yeah. If if we reach some Um do like we that. wanna say Okay, so subsequent, we're, we're good with the preliminary ballot. We're all in agreement on that. The two votes, yes. winnowing. Okay, great. Then subsequent rounds of balloting. Each commissioner gets one vote. And candidates not reaching a threshold of something are eliminated, or candidates not receiving votes are eliminated? Those candidates with the lowest amount are eliminated because there could be someone who's voting. He doesn't, yeah. Oh, I thought zero. Well, because there could be a situation where sometimes no one gets zero, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have, we kind of have to drop it off where there's like, we have to have a bit of a drop system. Okay. So even Could we if you say a threshold based on uh, like a percentage or to be determined at the board meeting? I mean, we we That's make the thing about it. If it's when we're talking about each getting one vote, if we only if we have seven candidates left, right? When we're all just giving one vote, that can be dispersed in perpetuity, right? Because yeah. there's no. Right? You could say, oh, the person that got two, they had their leading vote getter, right? So it, at some point we may have to, depending on, how, and I know this is where commission research had started, it, depending on how many people want this, we may have to amend all of this just for volume, or it's really simple, one person applied. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. you know, but yes, commission event. I'm sorry I took over. <laughs> what if after that one vote, then it's commissioners get one nomination, up to one nomination. So like if one person has that one person, if they're like, I'm gonna put this person forward no matter what, they've, they've reached this final round, they nominate them, they get one vote, they're out. And then one nomination has to be from those who are still, who haven't been eliminated in the mm -hmm. first two rounds, essentially. Right, because it will be vote two, then vote one, then one it's nomination. only from the eligible, yeah, only from the people who made it to that. One vote, right? All right. Maybe we, so we're going to have. We can only do two rounds yeah. of voting, v balloting. Of yeah. balloting to yeah. win yeah. And then people right. can make nominations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I feel like the voting okay. is really us informing like what candidates are viable mm -hmm. yeah. or what message yeah. do we want to send with our nominations or, you know, so it still gives us that individual okay. direction of the commissioner. Oh. But yeah. Yeah. it allows so us to come good. to a consensus. Yeah. In a what if after that second one? We are then able to vote. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know, I'm sorry. But what if we're able to vote yes or no on each person and we just see who has the most? Because then we have 
But then if you have, right. if, if you're hell bent on one candidate, you're going to vote no on all mm -hmm. the others. Yeah. So I think mm. it has to be. I think it has to be by oh. nomination, and yeah. then that changes us from this balloting exercise right. into then. Yeah, does someone feel strong enough about the other people, people that are right. out there the to be able to nominate them? You need a second for the nomination. Yes, you so have to you have go. a second so for if the nomination. If somebody puts forward Donald Trump, you know, because he made it to the last round, if nobody else seconds that, that person doesn't You just then, vote through. Well, if everyone gets to vote on everything, that means, and you're, and you're saying no for everything. <sighs> And no other <laughs> candidate, that means no one else would. It's happened before. Okay, I, th I think we got it. I think got we're going to be down to, right. down so to eight. People, you're watching. All right. I text Alicia. I'm trying to write this down this? for us, oh, and I don't quite understand what happens after the preliminary two vote per commissioner ballot, other than anyone who didn't get one of those two votes is now eliminated from consideration. What happens next? You can always reserve your nomination. right to make the rule at the election. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So. Nothing that requires you to, all that requires you to get a consensus of six votes, and that will be, that's an extraordinary number when you have, that's. Mm -hmm. You have eight people? Really? Yeah. Right. Okay, so we will do that. We will winnow. And then from there, we will discuss yeah. what approach we want to take. They'll say either we're, we're going to take another ballot or we want to not place nominations. Does that work for everybody? We made a lot of progress tonight. It might be when you start the meeting on the 6th when the president, or the, uh, uh, for the, the president could ask, you know, maybe somebody's got another idea on how to proceed with the rules before you even take a vote. Jennifer, go ahead. I want, I, this is more about, sorry, this is more about when the expectation is that the commissioners will receive information, so finish that part first. I just didn't. Okay. All right. So what I'm putting then is for number two. All persons who apply for the vacancy are encouraged to attend a public meet and greet with other applicants and park commissioners on Monday, November 13th from 5 to 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., a special meeting will convene in the boardroom to to fill the vacancy. To narrow the field. Of applicants. Up for consideration. Applicants being considered. A balloting process will take place. Should be typing this, sorry. Um, will take place. Each commissioner um, has two votes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has two votes. Um, staff will compile vote results. Mm -hmm. And candidates, uh, applicants not receiving votes are eliminated from consideration. Or you can use a positive. Candidates receiving the most votes. votes. Not the most, but Any. candidates zero, receiving zero votes. knocks you out. Okay, so yeah. candidates receiving votes. Uh, we'll move forward in the selection process. Okay. Um, commissioners will discuss and decide a process for additional steps in the selection process on the night of the meeting. Do we want to say that, or do we want to say? I, I kind of feel like we're here. Get it done. Let's yeah. just create the process that'll get us to a certain. And end. then, if it's not working for us, we suspend the rules and change it that night. Yes. Okay. We have that ability. Yeah. 
it, you can, but I would be hesitate to categorize this as a rule because then you'd have to ask somebody on the I'm sorry. side to consider the rule. Yeah. yeah, not a rule. My bad. Yeah. Uh, what I, what I mean is uh, process. We would reconsider the phases of the process if we decide what we did tonight is not working for us that night. We would suspend the rules, yeah, and we would modify it. I would say as part of this resolution that a, um, a rules change would be in order at any time, or the, the board may. I think we got it. Well, be careful about that. I mean, so I think we can do one more round. Yep. We can at least okay. do one more round where we all get one vote, because that will still mean that there will be people who receive zero because that will have fewer votes available. Well, oh, technically we don't know oh, that because there can be doubling votes. But right, yeah. I think we can say if necessary, we will do a round three. If, can we phrase okay, it that way? Okay, but we're going to definitely have a second round. Yes, I think we should. I'm saying definitely if a round of balloting will take place. If necessary, we'll have a third round. If the results are deadlocked, commissioners will move into discussion. Okay, so one more round of balloting will take place with commissioners <laughs> receiving one vote. If you need more paper. I just really should switch to typing. Um, with one vote. There's that no discussion after round one, right? No discussion after round one. But after round two, I think if we're gonna proceed with balloting, we should probably have some discussion mm -hmm. where so, people can advocate for the person that they're pushing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or allow yeah. the candidates that are left to advocate for themselves. Well, now you're requiring mm -hmm. that they be here. Well, that's yeah. Right. I think no, I we wouldn't. keep it to us. No. <laughs> it's us. Um, okay. I didn't even think they would be there, but yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's try this one more time and and see where we want to go next because i just want to make sure like up to what i have now we're in agreement and i'm sorry this is exhausting but it's really it's exhausting. i want us to get it right doing this now okay so um all persons who apply for the vacancy are encouraged to attend a public meet and greet with other appointees and park i'm sorry applicants my writing is real sloppy <laughs> Um, applicants and park commissioners on Monday, November 13th from 5 to 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., a special meeting will convene in the boardroom to fill the vacancy. To narrow the field of applicants being considered, a balloting process will take place. Each commissioner has two votes. Staff will compile vote results and uh, <coughs> applicants. Okay. Secretary will compile vote results and applicants receiving votes will move forward in the selection process. One more round of balloting will take place with commissioners receiving one vote. The secretary will compile <coughs> vote results. And if no consensus, if no consensus, I, I think, we yeah. would discuss. I, if I would, it appears we have consensus, commissioners may. Right. word consensus is that difficult. After right. the second ballot, the board will uh, determine how to proceed with the bill. If, if, if there are applicants with zero votes, I think they get eliminated after that second round. Okay. There could be none. But should we say, commissioners, um, the floor will then be open for discussion yeah. for the nomination of specific yes. because applicants. We could have a eligible applicants. Eligible applicants. Uh, if well. if no consensus can be reached, yeah. a third ballot will be done, rinse and repeat. We're, and, and it could be a while, but and just, after each ballot, there has to be discussion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Discussion. Okay. Vote. Discussion. Discussion. Possible nomination. If not, vote. Discussion. Okay, so possible nomination. Consensus. 
After the second ballot, commissioners will discuss. We'll be able to and discuss and nominate. And or nominate yeah. candidates um, for yeah. the at-large board vacancy. Commissioners, okay, so what I have is secretary will compile vote results. Ladies. Oh, sorry. Secretary will compile vote results and applicants will be removed if they receive no votes. Commissioners, following that second ballot, <laughs> commissioners will discuss. I just have one question on the nomination. And uh, I'm, I, I'm, not I'm, I'm uncertain how there might, how we're gonna nominate. Is it just gonna be kind of a race to the button? You know, I mean, I think if, if we were to follow more of the president mm -hmm. um, role, basically all three candidates would be nominated at the same time. Yep. yep. And then we could do a roll call vote and say the last name of the person and see if there are six yep. common names. So, so commissioners could call for a vote? In, instead of nominating, maybe all, all final candidates will be nominated. Or um, and roll call vote will determine if we have six votes. I, I'm not saying okay, so very well, but following I, the second be, ballot, it, it might be less awkward than trying to <coughs> nominate. I'm not sure. I, I don't. It's hard to predict what could happen. Yeah. So how about this? Following the second ballot, commissioners will discuss and be provided an opportunity to place. Applicants names into nomination yes. nominations require a second <coughs> yeah. Okay, yes, yes, so commissioners will discuss and we can nominate one or we can nominate all three Anyone can not you five could nominate years. five different people and it could be second and five Different times or whatever and then so I and forgot then Jennifer you use the says, word nominate that would be appropriate rather than a motion so the, Okay, so the commissioners candidate. will discuss and May nominate. And may nominate. Remaining candidates. Nominate a applicant from the remaining candidates. Um, nominations must be seconded to be voted on. What if at the end we don't get anyone to six? We have to. We, we have, have to keep to. balloting. That's like we or, can't. Yeah. You have to keep nominating at that point. No, but if we're locked five three on the same person and everybody else has been eliminated, then one of the three has to be like, it's not. You know, I mean, we can't pretend that we're gonna. No, but if a nomination. Go that if you're at five and three and some person can't get six, you may have to call back to somebody that is. Yep. Right, which is why we're yep. not eliminating anyone okay. at this point. Yep. Right, so nominations okay. must be seconded. Could be everyone seconded. So, so we'll end up with a right. candidate pool of at least maybe eight at the end, right? That, at the end of the second ballot. Yeah. I think that that's how the math that's, works. That's the most that could be. Yeah, that's the most because we all only get one vote. Yeah. Okay, so nominations must be seconded. Um, if a candidate, and then this, then we would vote. It, it, yeah, I think it's Realizing. like if no consensus, if no candidate reaches six votes, proceed to a third ballot. Um, okay, so how about this? The secretary, so nominations must be seconded. The secretary will conduct a roll call vote. You see them do it. Um, or is that, that's not the right term. Is it? Okay. Okay, roll call vote where commissioners vote their top choice. Vote their top choice by voting with that individual's name. Right? Yep. 
So. But then we're still not going to get the six. Well, we have to keep. I'm, too, I'm confident we're going to get the first six. And sec, like that last round was, we get to that point, it shouldn't have the first and the second choice, and then we just do it over. Like, so this is, that's why we're doing the nominations, right? So like at the end of that second balloting, we'll have eight, okay? And then if there's not some consensus that we're seeing amongst those eight, <coughs> it's gonna be weird when we all nominate one person and we can't get a second, right? I, I, I <laughs> but think I don't people, think we're I think gonna get there. Move, I think we can go to a, a third round of balloting then because I don't think people will just stick with their votes. I think people will be flexible. And then we'll be at a lower amount and we'll say, I want, okay, let's discuss now with a slightly lower amount. And I think we kind of repeat that process. And... I, okay. I, I think we're doing pretty good here. Yeah, and we're, we're I'm losing my mental yeah. capacity. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're down to eight people, just, Max. Can, you can we just... Us? Send yep, us the. Oh, we have to vote. We have, we have to, to vote, vote on this. Right. Tonight. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think. Well, yeah. One yeah. Other thought, one other I thought. I call the question. Oh, wait. The second round, we have eight people. We have no rules right now. I thought we were going to nominate all eight really and then the go bing, 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 bing. Right? Oh, we, we have six. Like no, we don't have six. And then we do a third round of balloting. We nominate them all. That's not how we're. No. 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 Okay. I like what Commissioner okay. Musich has so, so far. So we just pick. So if I feel like I want Jim, I'll try to nominate him as soon as I can. And if I don't get a second, then I cry. Yeah, so at the, after the second ballot, there will be eight votes. Most. I'm going to guess after that second ballot, if there wasn't already on the first ballot, we're going to be getting close to six, if not already <coughs> at six. Yes. Yeah. At which point... Someone should be placing into nomination the person they think is going to get this position, and we will vote on it. If somebody wants to have a, a protest vote or we're not really at six already, that's when you can nominate someone else. Yep. Yeah, or you can vote no and then nominate your person. Yeah. Okay. Right? And mm -hmm. then we have this vote where we say the name of the person that we're supporting for the position, and if we're not at six then we need to determine what our path forward is. And if, if more the first person in right? nomination doesn't win, yeah. win the, on the, you know, they, that doesn't mean that they can't be reconsidered right. subsequently. That yep. feels important to yep. say. Yep. Okay, so by voting that candidate individual's name, okay? If a nominee does not reach the six vote threshold, They still may be su considered the, in subsequent rounds. The torture will continue until old morale rounds. improves. Right. The third round is like the eligibility is the second. Can can we the third the part three or whatever the last part about swearing someone in on the fifteenth that hasn't changed right we've all agreed to that yes can we vote on this with those details which are in, in, incredibly detailed and I appreciate because we're set on step one we're set on step three and we're. 99.99% .99 set on set two, uh, step two, and we still have the ability to okay. change it. So are we so good to So here's where we're at. All right. Okay. I'm going to go from, oh, sorry. So on, um, my question is, is are you expecting to get the candidate information on Thursday? Or are you expecting to get the candidate information on Monday? Friday. Friday. Friday, Friday is, is, a, is holiday. a holiday. Oh, right. So what I what, the reason why I'm asking we're gonna get it Monday is or you could move your your deadline up and I know I just spoke against um, I can't these I can't. these applications we're getting can't we allow them to be submitted in something that's public Yes can't I, that's what I was I was with the demographic the information yeah, like not being just, public we and we get that later it. So you want like I would love for like a web form where they fill in the question answer information, or staff does, and then, because they've sent it in by mail or whatever, um, and then that, that's publicly viewable. 
like the moment yes. we get it uh, with yes. the demographic data potentially not being right it's sort of like an endorsement yeah. sort of like an endorsement yeah. process might be or something like where you can see it's that, so something like a fine. link on your website where yes. the whole public can view it yeah. yes yeah. Mm. I don't know for mm. sure. I can look into it. I don't know for sure, but there would there would still be administrative time of of typing in the information of individuals who dropped it off at the desk. Yeah, or could we just scan those? But then you got to black and out the certain things. Or, yeah, oh. or I mean, can if we someone put that on a separate page. My in my my the reason why I asked this is that I would say is if you want them available by the end of the day, essentially on Thursday. We should move the deadline up to say noon, or be accepting of Monday receipt. Well, yeah. So, I mean, but it, it sound. I mean, when you moved it off of Sunday, what I recognize is that there was also conversation that people wanted to be able to look at them over the weekend. Yeah. And so, I just want to set staff up for success and not have people working late into the night on Thursday. Yeah. Okay. So the ninth by noon. Noon. Okay. By 12 p.m. Yep. Cool. Do All right, so I'm going to read. Right I'm going to read through it one last time, and then we're going to vote on this. Okay. And I appreciate everyone's patience with me. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, at the end of paragraph one, we're amending the date to November 9th by 12 p.m. And then we are adding the following questions will be incorporated into the application, and the application shall include the optional demographic information option the MPRB uses for other appointment applications incorporated in the application by staff. Questions? We already agreed to those. I'm not reading them again. Um, I hope that's okay with all of you. All persons who apply for the vacancy are encouraged to attend a public meet and greet with the other applicants and park commissioners on Monday, November 13th from 5 to 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., a special meeting will convene in the boardroom to fill the vacancy. To narrow the field of applicants being considered, a balloting process will take place. Each commissioner has two votes. The secretary will compile the vote results and Applicants receiving votes will move forward in the selection process. One more round of balloting will take place with commissioners receiving one vote. The secretary will compile vote results and applicants will be removed from, the pro from consideration if they receive no votes. <laughs> Following the second ballot, Commissioners will discuss and may nominate an applicant from the remaining candidates. Nominations must be seconded. The secretary will conduct a roll call vote or commissioners vote their top choice by voting with that individual's name. If a nominee does not reach the six vote threshold, that nominee is still eligible in subsequent rounds of nominations. That sounds great. Leaving it at that? Per that's well, amazing. That we can yes. Discuss. Jennifer can discuss, yeah. Yes. Okay, and then, and oh. then there's one more piece. Sorry. Um, oh. The vacancy will be filled uh, by or the the app uh, the Sworn the new commissioner. Yeah. Right. The or the at large yeah. the, the selected at large commissioner. Right. <laughs> will be sworn in at our November fifteenth meeting. Correct. At the beginning of it. I would suggest. Can I also have a review of the rules of discussion amongst ourselves? Because we may get excited about a particular candidate or whatever, and and I really want to be open to everybody that puts their name in. Um, is it the same talk to two people that are not on the same committee? How how can can we review what the rules are around? So this is someone we may be excited about. This is the full board. Yep. Right. So full board. you can talk to three people. Right. Yeah. Four would be quorum. Right. Well, the quorum now will be oh, five. Oh shit, that's right. Yeah. And so a majority of quorum. Okay, so we three. can so so, so we can only talk we to can two. Only talk to two. Ah, good point. Two. Three, including yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Just okay. don't talk to yourself. So we can Jennifer, only, we can did you have something more? Um, Director uh, Summers just brought to my attention that it takes us two days to get something into the Star Tribune. Oh boy. So I won't be able to 
Except that for it doesn't take Susan do that long. I know, but it's going to be a public announcement spot. So if we, we will still put it in the Star Tribune, but if we could strike that part that says in the Star Tribune um, in item <coughs> one from the original resolution. Uh, good, good point. Okay. Because I, I can't commit to that until probably Saturday. Good call, good call. Uh, With those strikes, are we basically all on the same page? We need to vote. Yep, we have to vote. Okay. Are we? I'm sorry, where is it that I'm striking the... Uh, in the uh, no. in the in the original resolution, right. the um, item one. I saw it. Yeah, that's it oh yes, about. right. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Gov delivery okay. and social. Um, we'll get this Some typed up and out to everybody. But um, oh, so from what everybody's out. hearing, I'm going to take a vote. All those in favor of this amended resolution? Is that right? Yes. Amended Signify resolution. by saying aye. I oppose that action carries then to the main I was gonna say nay actually but then to only the main. because of the time but what? I'm, I'm a nay because of the November 15th so up to the main motion uh, amended um, resolution all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye oppose that action carries as far as the P and C's if anybody's got something really important otherwise I just want to say, and I think we all concur, um, thank you to Officer Zabinski. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, I, I would like to say that this was hard, and it's going to remain hard, because Alicia Crudup was a very, very special person, and she really did a good job on this board, and I'm very, and I've been sort of having this sadness in this space, because it's hard. I, I think that this is going to be hard. And thank you for your service, Commissioner Crudup and Smith. It was great to serve the time that I did with you. Um, there's, there's a void. I, I feel like there is a big void. And we didn't get enough time to acknowledge her. I hope that at some point we can, we can do that. Thanks. Is there anything, anybody else needing to say anything? No. I just all want to thank you. I'm totally humbled by this. Even Elmer signed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I declare the meeting adjourned at 1049. And just for you all to know, the secretary is not jumping. We already know that. <laughs> yep. No jumping. No jumping. Okay. All right. Jumping jack.